So the goals of this stream are, are going to be relatively interesting. So what we're going to do is we're going to end up, uh, we want to take a snapshot of an application. So we want to somehow get the entire register state and all of memory out of an application such that we have perfect knowledge of where everything is, what everything that is being done is being done, and, and enumerate all that stuff. Now, there are a couple different ways that you can do this of varying levels of difficulty. One is you can use a debugger to get a mini dump. Two is you can inject something into the process to dump out that memory. And three, uh, you can use another process to kind of try to snoop that information out using things like uh, um, read process memory and stuff. We're going to go about it through the injection route. Um, and the reason for that is relatively interesting, but mainly because when you attach a debugger to something, it changes the behavior and the state of what you're debugging. And I do not like that. I, I am very uncomfortable with taking a snapshot and fuzzing an application that is in a debugged state that might change how the heaps behave. For example, Windows will change how you actually, um, how the heaps are, uh, what kind of allocations are used for the heap. Uh, so things like that are really, really spooky. So that's something I really don't want to do. Um, the other one is using another process to kind of suspend and leak that information out. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, you can suspend process virtual query, read process memory. That works, uh, but doing that from another process can be really difficult, especially if you want to dump a system service. So what I want to be able to do is I want to be able to dump a even a system level process. And to do that, I'll actually need to inject code to dump the process from a debugger, from a kernel debugger. So what I want to do is I want to write shell code that when run in the program will write out a file containing all of its memory states and all of its register states for all its threads. Yeah. Do you need to build the injected code yourself? Uh, will it need to build the standard dump format? No, we can we can we can have this dump whatever format we want. In fact, we're we're doing this as another part to skip having a standardized dump format because standardized dump formats kind of suck. Uh, core dumps are actually not too bad, but um, mini dumps are a little bit messy. It would probably take us a day to write a mini dump parser. It'd take us like an hour to write a core dump parser, but it'll take us 20 seconds to write a parser for what we're gonna do. Um, so, what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna write everything in handwritten assembly for x86-64. We're also gonna directly use syscalls in there just for fun. Um, but this way we can inject, uh, we can inject this, it's hopefully gonna be under a page. So you'll be able to literally just jam these bytes somewhere into memory and then jump to them and it will dump the process. So that's effectively the gold goal here. And Godling saying that it worked from SSH on your stuff. Yeah, I have no idea why it's different on mine. I've used it before. I actively use it. That is my debugging environment. I don't know what is broken. Maybe it's something in this specific SSH version because I grabbed the latest. So who fucking knows? So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a development environment and we're gonna do our development on Linux and we're going to ship it to Windows to build it and run it. So let's try that. We're gonna make a, um, uh, we need a name for this project. Uh, uh, mm, um, uh, I'm bad at names for these things. I've, I've used so many names for these already. Sausage Factory, that's fantastic. Thank you for that. That is a, uh, that is a brilliant name. There's actually nothing that can go wrong with that name. <laughs> um, so we're going to SSH into 192.168. SSH 192.168, 12221. And we're going to make Sausage Factory, which is a brilliant name. Thank you so much, Desu. Fantastic fucking name. This is where the sausage is made. We're going to make a make file, and what we're going to do to make this is we're going to scoop over the contents of the uh, uh, shellcode.assembly, 
and we'll just scoop this over into one and two one six eight one twenty two twenty one. You know what? We'll make a we'll make a name for this. Server is uh one two one six eight one twenty two twenty one. So we will have a server. We'll scoop over to the server colon sausage factory. Honestly, until we have issues. We're just gonna scoop over ourselves uh, over to the server, and that should work. Make. Okay. All right. Until until we actually have large files in here where we can't just copy over the entire folder, we'll just copy over the entire folder. So then we're going to make. Uh, we're gonna have it make some stuff over on the server side of things. It will It'll build it nasm f bin Nasm f win 64 That's the file format. So 64-bit windows we will take in an input which is the shell code and we'll output shell code and that should work make Yep, file doesn't exist. And then we'll also, uh, we want to link that. And to link that, I need to figure out these paths. So the problem is starting, oops, I don't want that one. Starting these shells takes a long time. Like that, that like second there is pretty brutal. And I'd really like to avoid that. And I don't know if there's a better way. Hmm. Yeah, let me see. Um... How have I done this before? I can probably go directly to the compiler, but I need some of the arguments set up. I might have to do this, which sucks. Because VC Varzal is it, it just takes forever. Hmm. I'll just type make over here. You can up path and restore it. It's it's more than um it's more than just path. Yeah, like um some of these things pre init path, SDK directories, library paths, install directories, versions for things. Uh it's a it's a lot of shit. Dump those bars. Is there a way that I can just commit these as the current set? Oops. Can I just do that? Is there a way to like set all of these? I don't think there is. That would be really nice if I could just say like solidify these arguments, but I don't think there is a way In a, in a simple way. Anyways, uh, we'll just, we'll, we'll work with this for now and then we'll, we'll polish this as we figure out what we're actually gonna be doing. But we'll just run make for, for a while, which will be fine. So we'll go into uh, users pleb sausage factory and we should be able to end make here. And then at this point, yeah, but that's gonna, hmm, fuck. Um, how do I invoke that? SSH. I have this string somewhere. It's kind of a pain to run VC vars all remotely. I forget. I'm trying to think what project I've done where I have that. I'm, I'm looking through my projects on another screen. Trying to find which one does it. I, I, I have to have like the quotes and the delimiters between the commands just right. And it's a fucking pain. Um, so for Rust, I don't have to worry about it because Rust figures all this shit out for me. But I have a non-Rust project that I'm pretty sure I've used. But I might have deleted it if it were just testing. Um, nope. Fuck, what would I have named that project? The downside of having shitty project names. Mm. Ooh, that is a make file. 
Nope. That's for graphing. God damn it. Yeah, I, I want to basically invoke that command and then run a command afterwards, and I always forget how I do it. Isn't it just SSH command semi? I don't think so. Um, let me try it. Um, we need this file name, so SSH um, server oops Wasn't it descriptively, was it as descriptively named as Sausage Factory? No, Sausage Factory is a top tier one. So this should work, right? This should, um, if we type make, we should pop into that shell. Well, it's not gonna be able to build that. But this will give us that shell, which is great. But what I wanna do is I actually wanna run a command in that environment, and I don't think I can do that, right? Because this, yeah. And I, I forgot, it was, it's some weird ass combination of quotes. Like maybe it was internal quotes. It was some weird shit to get it to work. Uh, see that didn't actually run the command. Um, uh, I, I fucking forget what it is. There are like a million ways to do this and there's like one of them that worked and I, trying to figure out where that would be um let's see if my my server at works down shit i think i would have deleted it because it's probably a test project where i just tested it out maybe i used vc vars all and that behaved differently um God damn it. Uses and and. I know it's doable from the one liner. There it tried to run CL, but that was not inside of that environment. Um, let me do VC vars all. I think that's the problem. I think I have to do VC. Oh, that's a link. Um, program files, Visual Studio, I think, 2019, build tools, VC, tools, MSV, where's VC vars all? Where the fuck is it? Was it in this? VC vars all twenty build tools VC auxiliary VC auxiliary VS Nope build there it is <laughs> There it is All right, let's try this This VC vars all bat. And then we need to tell it what we want. We'll just say x64, and that one we might not need the quotes for. Yeah. There we go. That works. All right. So I think the problem is that link actually spawns a new shell and thus you can't actually send the command into the shell through there. But VC, var, VC vars all does it in place. So, but yeah. All right, so now we can make and build things in that environment, which is great. So we'll move this down to here and this will be part of the command. Um, here we'll just do and make f make file dot win and then we'll make this all and that will actually build it oh does vc vars all fuck up the directory 
I think it does. I think it CDs you by force. Oh, we have to we have to CD. CD sausage factory. There we go. All right. So we we can we can make sausage now. We we got there. All right. So we're going to make a uh, two different programs. We're going to make a program that's just a C program that this will run in that will just execute that shell code. Um, I guess it's not it's not going to start off as shell code. I don't think. Do we want it to start off as shell code? No, we're just going to get it working and then we'll convert it to shell code because converting to shell code doesn't really require any work. So we're going to do um, test.c include standard lib dot h standard io dot h int main void uh int shell code i guess it's void shell code and then we will uh, shell code so that will call it and then return zero make i have make on the other screen all right shell code assembly section Code. I think on Windows they call it code, not uh, text. And then global shell code. This isn't quite right yet. Um, and then we'll split makefile.win. We will build test.c and we'll link with shell code.object. God damn, we're good. <laughs> Fucking really? And then we're gonna execute that. And we'll mark this uh, debug. Yeah, build it with debug symbols and then we'll run it. Oh, it's called test.exe in this case. All right, now this will Assemble our thing and it will call it and run it and everything sweet and that looks like that worked if I do an int 3 here this should uh, crash And there we go crash with the debug exception Nice, and we can make this more seamless. We can do cdb dash gg I think All right, so that will break into the debugger and run it in this debugger environment and we should have symbols. Nice. And we do. So we have symbols. We're in our shell code. We can see that we're executing this int3. We can then execute it. We ret back and we're back in. OK, so now we have a good development environment for writing, building, testing, assembly written things on uh, Windows. Um, CMD. Semi is equivalent to a in passage uh, and echo high. Let's see. Oh, things I didn't know. CMD equivalent of semi and bash is a single ampersand. Doesn't simple a single ampersand background? Does semicolon on Windows background? I always use and and. I didn't know that. That's pretty. That's pretty interesting. Okay, so we're gonna do a syscall, and what syscall uh, are we gonna do? I think. Let's see if we can. See if we can print to the console. I think the syscall. To the console is kind of a pain in the ass. We want the NTOS kernel. Shout out to Juru for uh, maintaining this fucking amazing stuff here. Um, and what are we on? We're on 1909. Uh, console. Yeah, I think the console... I actually don't know how to write to the console. I think we're just going to create a file. We're going to create a file because we're going to do that anyways. Um... So we're going to call ntcreatefile to create a file. If you've never used ntcreatefile, it is a, a treat to work with. And when I say a treat to work with, I mean an absolute fucking pain. 
<laughs> so here are the here's what you need to pass in to create a file on Windows. <laughs> here's your minimum subset of arguments to create a file. <laughs> Fucking um, and uh, object attributes is a structure. So we have to pass in all these arguments, and then we also have to pass in a structure. No using kernel 32? Nah, no, fuck doing that. We'd have to resolve uh, the symbols, which is hard. <laughs> so yeah. So this is what we're going to embark on. First, um, let me see if I have NT create file here. If I do, we can write it in C first. Oops. I'm so, I'm so used to Rust, man. Um, C is ZW create file might be present. I might need to use, yeah, let's try this. Um, uh, make file windows and then we'll do uh, kernel 32.lib. Maybe it's ntdll.lib. There we go. So we can do ZW create file, which is the same thing as NT create file. We can probably NT create file here as well. Get proc address too hard for me? How do you get the address of proc address? <laughs> Why write this in assembly directly instead of something that compiles to assembly? Because we're going to want to be able to inject it as a page into a process. You just apply it to the shell code when you inject it. Uh, I might be doing it from a debugger, and I would prefer to not have parameters if I don't need them. It's just extra work. I'm going to I'm going to write this tool once. I'm going to use it thousands of times. So if I can save if if it takes me an hour to save myself 15 seconds of work every time I inject it, I will spend that hour. <laughs> That's basically what I'm going to do. <laughs> All right. So I don't know, maybe we'll just go directly to the syscall. Fuck it, we don't need to write it in C. We can we can get this right first try. Uh, so we're gonna do a syscall, and we'll move the syscall number on Windows. I think they use RCX for that, um, but we can check. We can debug this just to check. Uh, we'll put an int three in here just so we can uh, break into the debugger, and we're gonna use this to, we will do, uh, disassemble nt uh, create file and that jumps to this and no that's a that's an address oh can I not use an I can't fucking arrow I can't use an arrow I can't arrow up anyways the um, syscall number is an eax Um, DefCon Qualls 2019 had an intro challenge that involved compiling shell code from C using uh, Google's Linux syscall wrapper in nolibc and then pulled out text so you could get it, uh, the machine code to inject. Yeah, you can do that with um, objcopy, and that's a pretty common technique people use is they'll use objcopy to copy out the text section. Uh, and then as long as you write, you know, like uh, pick code effectively, which is really easy. It's really easy to write pick code for a uh, 64-bit because you can relocate basically anything on a 64-bit. Nevertheless, all of these things aside, we're doing this because it's fucking entertaining and fun, <laughs> right? There are so many ways that we could do this. We could have C write out to a file and then we could strip out the text section from there and make sure we don't have any relocations in that section and then have a tool that checks all these things and then uses that as shell code. Or we can just write the fucking shell code because it's fun. <laughs> and it's one step, one failure point, and a lot easier. So we're gonna do this. And then I think the uh, first parameter goes into R10 on Windows. So we'll pass in the file handle which will, this will be the output. So we're gonna um, 
we're gonna make some space on the stack. So we'll just sub RSP 100 for now. So we're making room on the stack for our locals. And then we're going to mention what our locals are. In fact, we could maybe make a structure for our stack locals, and then we could access via a structure. Um, yeah, that might be the cleanest way to do this. Uh, we're gonna do a structure, uh, locals, and I don't know if, I think it's struck, and I, I'll quit this, and I don't want that to launch it in debugger right now. We'll just do test.exe, just run it raw. Okay. So this will do the syscall, and we should be able to get the error code back, and we'll return that. That'll be in racks, so we can do uh, uint64t, include standard in dot h, and then we'll print the result of this, and this will be for, this is how we're gonna debug it. Uh, percent i64u shellcode, make. And we have to put the pound here. Okay, so that's the result, and we'll print that as hex in this case. So this is the return code from that syscall. Obviously, we have an error. Um, which one is that? Uh, that is invalid parameter, I'm pretty sure. Um, uh, NT status codes. We're going to want this open. Yeah, invalid parameter. OK. So I have an invalid parameter. No surprise, because we don't pass it shit. Now, I actually want to see if these are I want to see if these locals are actually local to the function. Even though we're going to write everything in this one function, I just want to see if this gets mad at me, in which case I want to probably have a unique name for that. OK, that seems to work. What if I have this outside? Or maybe Nasm doesn't care? Um, yeah, maybe Nasm just uses the most recent version. Okay, whatever it is, we can use this to define our locals. So we're gonna say uh, handle res q. Uh, this is the this is the output handle, uh, and we need to use these comments. Output handle from nt create file, and then we can pass in into r10. nt create file takes a pointer to a handle, so it's outputting a pointer to a, a hand, or it's outputting the handle, so we give it a pointer to a memory location where the kernel will place the pointer, which is a 64-bit value or a machine word size. Um, so I'll do this by leaing into r10 from rsp plus locals.handle. And that's going to um, uh, locals.handle. Error.exe is a command line tool to look up the error codes. Interesting. Does that come with the debugging kits or whatever? We actually have an internal page for that at Microsoft that's just really easily accessible in the browser. Um, so that's what I'm used to. But I haven't been doing much. Uh, I'm not used to doing dev without my standard, standard tools at this point. OK. So the calling convention, if you're not familiar with calling conventions in assembly, calling conventions are basically the concept of um, how the thing that you're invoking, how what you're calling uh, actually um, gets its argument. So we have these arguments here. Uh, OK, how many, how many people here are familiar with um, writing code in C in the first place? <laughs> Like, writing code in C, the concept of, like, arguments, the concept of, like, stack and heap. Will you put Sausage Factory on GitHub? This will eventually end up inside of, um, uh, this will end, end up in the Chocolate Milk pro Project. All right, so a lot of people got it. All right, so no one, no one here is uncomfortable with this yet. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to assume people here know that you have parameters that you pass to a function. We're not going to go through that level. Uh, anyways, the calling convention is basically how you know um, 
which argument, uh, where each argument is passed. And on Windows, on 64-bit calling conventions, the arguments are passed in the following registers. They're passed in RCX for the first argument, RDX, RCX RDX uh, for the second arg, R8 for the third argument, R9 for the fourth argument, and then all the subsequent arguments are passed onto the stack, starting at RSP plus OX20. Plus, right? So those are where all the arguments go on x86. And now you might be, one, uh, this is on 64-bit uh, Windows. Now you might be wondering, why is this RSP plus 20? Well, it's actually required that you provide homing space, room for the caller or the call E to place the arguments. So technically, this is RSP plus zero. This is RSP plus eight. This is RSP plus 10. And then this is RSP plus 18, leaving this at RSP plus 20. So that is how the calling conventions work on uh, Windows which is kind of interesting. It also means that you have to actually make homing space. It's required that you give at least 20 hex bytes of space uh, for the call the call E to store this shit on the stack. Since we're doing a syscall, uh, I think it might be a little bit different. Uh, I still think it's the same calling convention, so I think we're gonna have to subtract 20 extra. Um, so I think what we'll probably do is we might just... Um, is there an easier syscall that we can use as an oracle? Uh, NT um, exit, uh, uh, what's the exit process? NT um, close, uh, uh, pro uh, terminate process. NT terminate process. And I think this takes the current process, or a PID, a process handle, so let's try this. Let's see if we can cause our process to exit, and then we pass it an exit status, which is what will actually get printed if we return an error. So before we do any of this stuff, we're going to look up in the syscall table by Juru, uh, NT terminate process. We see it's at OX2C. So that's the syscall number. So the syscall number is basically identifying what we want to invoke. So if we do this, this will fail because we're giving it a uh, a handle zero. So it's failing. This is, um, I think, access denied, actually. Uh, invalid SID. OK. So we can pass into. Now, let's go on a tangent of how syscalls work. Syscalls on x86. Uh, uh, let's talk about the syscall instruction and what that actually looks like. The syscall instruction. Uh, basically is a very fast interrupt, and it transfers execution back to the kernel. Now, interrupts traditionally push a lot of things onto the stack. It pushes information about what you're executing. It pushes information about your current flag state. It pushes information about your stack and all these different things. So, yes, I thought on Linux, at least, syscalls had a completely different convention. Um, so the syscalls actually use the same convention. On Windows, they use the same convention with a twist. And that twist is entirely from the, um, it's due to the way syscall actually works. And let's, let's talk about that. So when you invoke the syscall instruction, what actually happens? So the kernel sets up kind of this landing point of where execution will be transferred during a syscall. Now, the way that works is, the syscall instruction will get invoked. And when that happens, this MSR, this uh, model specific register that the kernel loads will have the RIP value in the kernel of where execution will start. So it basically, when you invoke syscall, uh, execution is transferred to a specific location controlled by the kernel. Now, it saves the address of the instruction following the syscall into RCX it doesn't even push a return address onto the stack, which is the common thing that is done. It actually directly puts the return address into RCX. And that's why you'll find that you can't actually pass RCX, this first argument, into syscalls. Because syscalls came out after the MSVC64-bit x86 calling convention was created. 
So that means they had to figure out what to do in post when that happened. And if I still have this, um, here is the code that gets executed when you do an NT create file from C. What happens is it moves RCX into R10. And the reason for that is RCX is going to get clobbered by the processor before the syscall handler even gets execution in the kernel side of things. And that's why when we do syscalls, this is actually an R10 because RCX gets clobbered. Now, there's more stuff that gets clobbered. R flags is stored into R11, so you'll never see a calling convention that passes R11 into a syscall because, once again, R11 will get clobbered. And then this will be used to mask off certain flags in that MSR, and that's it. That is a syscall. It basically sets RIP in the kernel to this the L star MSR. It writes over RCX with the current the return address of the syscall, and then it writes over R11 with the R flags. But it doesn't actually save anything to memory or even require a working stack. Really fucking cool. There's also a um, there's a star MSR that has the RSP that will get loaded. Um, yep, doesn't save RSP. And it's up to the kernel to kind of figure all these out. But here's what basically happens. RCX gets trampled with the next instruction. RIP gets loaded with L star. R11 is written to with the flags. R flags is then anded with this flag mask. That allows the operating system to kind of control some things about the operating environment um, when that happens. And what else? It, it sets some permissions by force to make sure it actually goes into kernel mode. And that's about it. That's a syscall, and that's why syscalls are faster than interrupts, because they are fast calls, fast ways to invoke the kernel. So, to perform this NT uh, terminate process, we need to pass a handle into the first argument, and we see that the first argument goes into register R10. So we're going to move into R10, all Fs. And all Fs on Windows is a shortcut for when you're using a process handle, all Fs is actually the current process. So that allows you to not have to do uh, NT uh, get current process. Actually, get current process, I think, literally just returns all Fs. But we can look at that. Um, I got to manage my Tibia characters quick because I'm out of runes. But yeah, is everyone following that so far? Let me know if anything's weird about that. I can try and answer any questions. This stuff is often very confusing to people when they're getting started. Um, and I'm relatively comfortable with uh, questions and answering how this stuff works. Oh, I might be running out of runes. Ooh, I'm going to have to make a rune run soon. Yeah, it's just hard-coded negative one. Ah, that sounds about right. Are we, terminate, are we calling terminate uh, proc to test if the syscall is working? Yes, we are. Uh, it just doesn't take any things on the stack. The stack is where things can get difficult because we have to make sure that we actually are passing the, the arguments in the right slots. And if we did any of our math wrong, uh, all of that stuff will be broken. What does clobbering represent? Clobbering means that the value is written over without uh, saving the original value. So that basically means the original value is written over and the old value, the original one, is lost. It's it's no longer found anywhere. It's basically been written over uh, without saving it. So here we will pass in to R10 a zero and to RDX we will pass in the exit status code that we want. And in this case we'll say leet leet because we know that that'll get echoed back to us. So this will cause the process to exit and here we see the process exited with an error and the error was leet leet. We directly called that syscall here, and this caused the process to terminate. Does clobbering mean that it's callee saved? Um, clobbering, it really depends on the environment, but typically clobbering means that it's caller saved because that indicates that the callee, what's ever executing, whatever it gets called, writes over the value and returns back. Clobbering typically is not necessarily the act of writing over it. It's the act of giving back execution to someone else with it in a clobbered state, if that makes sense. So it's, it's not really referring to the fact that you write over the value. It's referring to the fact that you write over the value and do not restore it when you give it back. 
So anyways, there we have a syscall. Does the kernel move R10 to RCX so it can call the syscall implementation as a normal function? It likely does. It doesn't have to, but it likely does. So once it gets to the C side of things, it will use those conventions. Uh, in the kernel side on Windows, it, it does that. Now, we don't have a kernel debugger set up for this. So we can't really look into that side of things. Uh, we don't really have a need to set up a kernel debugger right now. So, But we will if, if we need to. Now, we can take a look at other... I'm trying to think what other good syscalls there would be that would maybe take a couple more args. I think we're just going to go directly to NT create file. So NT create file, uh, and there's our exit process. We'll keep that in there. So this will be um, exit process, or NT uh, ZW terminate process um, get current process ox leet leet so you can see what that's actually doing and we don't have to return at this point because that syscall will never actually return <laughs> so that's the end so once we execute in here there's no return and we can use this as an oracle for getting the error code and, and whatever so we can print that out anyways so this is here we're going to want to make a call to nt create file and to do this we need to pass in a fuck ton of arguments <laughs> we need to pass in a reference to a location in memory which can receive a handle when the kernel has a handle ready for us in which case it'll write the handle into here if it succeeds we have another argument which is the access mask this is the permissions that we want uh on that process and i'm pretty sure um Let's see. Um, they can use one of these or combinations. File generic write, file traverse. I think we'll just, honestly, we're probably fine with the zero. I think that might be enough to let us create the file. So we'll pass in a zero. So that's the second argument. And we're gonna write that to edx instead of rdx. And we got to pass in some more stuff. We just, it's, it's just like anything else. We're just figuring out what we need to pass in. We need to pass in the object attributes. And object attributes is actually where the file name is present. This will go into R8. And this is going to be the address of locals.object attributes. And we might put that in, a, in actual data next to this code such that we can uh, pre-populate that. Because that's going to have strings and stuff. We have an IO status block, which, if I'm not mistaken, can be null. Um, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure we can just have that be null. So we're going to XOR R9 with R9, or R9D for the D word value. And then at this point, we will start passing things in on the stack. So we're going to pass in the file attributes. This will go into RSP plus 20. And I don't know if we have to add an extra, an additional eight here. Um, I don't know if this, so typically there's a return address. So everything's shifted by eight. And I don't know if I'm going to have to do that in this case. I don't think so. When you pass a non-null buffer argument, does it write that buffer to the file as part of create? Um, when you pass a non-null buffer argument, does it write that buffer to the file as part of creating it. Uh, I don't necessarily know what you mean by that. When you pass like the like the actual argument that you pass, it will use that as a pointer to get the contents of the, like the kernel will use that as a pointer to the contents of the file. So we will pass it a pointer to data that will write into that file. And here we'll say this is a quad word. So let's, I'm just gonna get all of the, uh, slots filled in here. These, this is everything afterwards. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then I'm just gonna label all these, just so we have this labeled. Um, uh, create disposition. This is the create. Options, EA buffer, 
EA length. And then here we have the IO status block, object attributes. We might need to give it an IO status block, block desired access, and file handle. Okay. And we'll, we'll rearrange these as we populate them. And then these, we will just update where they go on the stack. 20, 20, 30, 30, 40, 40, and 50. So these are all the arguments. File attributes. So now we just go down the list and we fill these things in. Um, IO status block is... Um, yeah, I think that's just the status. And we can look at the shape of that. A pointer to a large integer for the allocation size. Um, an initial allocation size for the file. A non-zero value has no effect unless it's being created. So I'm guessing we can set zero. Now that's actually a pointer to a large integer, which is a quad word. Um, but we're going to actually pass that zero as a, basically a null. File attributes. This is going to determine the attributes when it's created. Um, by default, it's a attribute normal, which can be overwritten by an ORD combination of these. So I think we can do zero in that case. Share access, we can do zero. Create disposition. We want to say file create if it does not create the given file. So to do this, I'm going to figure out what value corresponds to that define. And I'm going to do that by literally just printing it here because it's it's just easier it's just easier to do this so this will tell me what value i should use and locals and uh locals oh object attributes yeah we'll just fill this in for now res key one. So the problem is we don't get much information out of the kernel when these things fail. Um, file create. Um, really? Is it not file create then? Create options. File create. Um, pretty sure you just need windows.h for that. I should have file generic read, stuff like this. Let me make sure, let me make sure. I'm just trying to extract the value from the header to figure out what it should be. But yeah, I have things like file create read. Um, why did that not print it? Did it not flush? It's class time. Hell yeah. What class are you in right now? Uh, why am I not seeing that print? Let's see, let's see if it's a flushing problem. It is. Okay, so that's file generic read. Um, and we're going to want to write to it. So we'll say we want file generic write. And that's what we'll actually pass in for desired access. So 120116. Um, so we'll say file generic write. Um, so we use file generic write. Okay, file handle, just a pointer to a handle. Object attributes, we got to fill that in, which is uh, really annoying. The IO status block, um, yeah, we'll have IOSB res q1. So we'll LEA into the IO status block. We'll LEA. So we'll give it a pointer to the stack at a location where it can find this IO status block. So it will write that out to there. And what is the type on that? I'm going to figure out the type. So we'll pop into CDB here. We'll put an int 3 in here just so we have a, cr a crash. 
And then we'll use our symbols to determine what that shape of the structure is supposed to be for an IO status block. And I think it's uh, two D words. Um, DT, oops. Uh, come on. IO status block. Reload. DT IO status block. Okay, we've got a status, a pointer, and a union, and then an information. So that has to hold two fields. So this will have resq2. So that's two uh, quad words worth of storage, and we can check that by saying size of IO status block, and it should be 10 hex. So that tells me that I need two quad words of storage uh, to hold that value. So I give a pointer to two quad words of storage that I can output to. We have the allocation size, which I think I can have a null pointer, but I'm not 100% sure. File attributes. This will say file attribute normal. I think that might literally be zero, so we'll see. And we can get rid of that int three for now. Um, make... Who writes malware in Perl? Oh, that's technically 80 hex. Uh, allocation file attributes, 80. And we will say this is uh, file attributes normal. Share access is zero. That's no sharing. Create disposition, file create. And I think this is what we were looking at. And this wasn't there. And I don't know why. Hmm. I don't know what that value is. Let me let me look this up quick. I'm just gonna look in the header where we can find this value. This file creates is, hmm. Who doesn't is the real question, especially if the target is a Debian server. You can't hack Debian, it's stable. It's the stablest. All right, file create. Yeah, I don't think file create is actually a thing. Um, I see hex 10, hex two. Let's see if I have NTDDK here. That's the uh, driver kit. Come on, please, 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 fuck. Um, let me find where that is. I'm gonna wanna pull that in. Um, Cargo install rip grep. <laughs> We're gonna get rip grep so we can RG for these things. What window manager this? This is, um, this is, uh, DWM. Try including Winternal. If I'm not mistaken, that is included by, um, that should be included by Windows.h, but we'll try it. So we'll go into, uh, whatever we called this thing. Sausage Factory. Make. This thing's kind of horked until this is complete because it's using it's using that core up. Oh, that did work. Oh, huh, okay, cool. Totally right. Hell yeah. I just kind of assumed incorrectly. All right, so we have winternal file create, and we can see that file create is a two. All right, that was my guess. Uh, this is the create disposition. Yes. So this is file create. If it already exists, fail the request, which is exactly what we want. We could do overwrite, but I'm fine with that. Create options. Um, and we'll do this. Uh, 
It's not a directory. I think for this one we can do no flags. Yeah, I think we can do no flags on that one. And then EA buffer, it's just the buffer. And, uh, those are the extended attributes buffers. So EA buffer and EA length, we can just do null for both of those. Okay, so buffer and length are null. And this is probably relatively close. Um... Looking at your GitHub makes me in extremely self-conscious about my productivity. Ah, you shouldn't you shouldn't feel like that, man. All your projects are food related. I just realized, yes, they are. <laughs> That's why I like Sausage Factory. That was a suggestion, but someone knew my naming scheme. <laughs> someone knew what I like. Okay, we're like probably relatively close to this working. Technically, we probably should sub off space for these arguments. I think the kernel might restore the stack. We, there are a couple things. I, I don't remember if the kernel actually restores the stack uh, for me. So I don't know if I should be doing a sub OX50 here. 58. Let's, let's see what happens. I'll put an int3 here and then an int3 at the end. And we'll see if the stack is restored. You know, I think we don't need that. Let's try this. So first, let's just see what this returns. Uh, the int3 there is perfect. Okay. Make. We need a collab between Gamozo and Squishable so we can get some Gamozo plushies and emotes? Absolutely. I think that's going to be the plan. Register. Ooh! This returned an access violation. So the result of the syscall was an access violation. So it ex something that we passed it was null, and it was not happy about that. Now we pass it, well, we don't know it's null, but we know that it's not happy about something that we passed it, and it tried to access something. So EA buffer potentially needs to not be null, but it's probably this allocation size. We probably need to pass it a valid allocation size. And to do that, we'll pass allocation size which is a large integer, which is just a res key one. So we're going to move onto that location, onto rsp plus locals dot allocation size. And we're actually fucking up all these locals. So I, I will want to, I will want to sub rsp ox um, 58. Eight, which is the size of this frame and then I'm just gonna move RBP RSP So we'll use a frame pointer here because we can and now we use RBP is off the original RSP that access Accesses these locals and then RSP is actually referring to the arguments. So that should be good and We will into the allocation size We'll write a zero and now we will into allocation size here, we're gonna LEA into racks, RBP plus locals dot allocation size. So we'll get the address of the allocation size buffer that we just wrote to on the stack, and then we'll pass this in as an argument, and then we'll see if that gets rid of our access violation. And um, 23, oh, we need to say this is a quad word, otherwise it doesn't know. Do you need to pass in a file name? Yes, I do, and we don't pass that in at all. In fact, that's probably where we're getting the access violation. But we're just kind of going down the list here. I'm pretty sure allocation size is um, option is optionable. Op optionable? <laughs> um, so we want to pass in these object attributes. And these object attributes actually define a relatively complex structure um, of this shape. Uh, reload f. dt object attributes. What? Well, they're defined down here anyways. Why do we have a quadrant for ulong parameters? Uh, for like which ones? 
for like all these parameters where we just write in a, a quad root zero. So everything, everything on, uh, everything is padded to the size of a machine word. So all of the arguments are eight bytes apart on a 64 bit uh, x86. So even if they're a U long, they're still a 64 bit value. Okay, object attributes. Why don't I have this? Um, object attrib. Why don't I have, why don't I have, uh, anything that tells me the layout of this? Length, handle, object name, attributes, security descriptor, and security quality of service. So, object attributes, there's a link, okay. Yeah, all right, so now we're gonna make a structure that is that. This is gonna be struct object attributes and struct. This will have a length, which is a U long, uh, res D one. Then there's padding. Then there is a root directory, which is a res key one. Then there is an object name, which is a pointer to a Unicode string. We have attributes, which is a res D one. We then have padding another resd1 then we have a security descriptor and a security quality of service resq1 so that should be the shape of that structure and i'm basically just typing that out so the length it's a u long which is uh 32 bits the root directory is a handle, which is 64 bits, which needs to be aligned to a 64 bit boundary, which means this gets padded to make sure that this is quadroid aligned. Then we have quadroids. Same thing for attributes that gets padded, so on and so forth. Um, can you repeat the padding member like that? Probably not. So we'll just call it padding two, but I was gonna try it just in case it worked. All right, so now we have these object attributes. Now, these are relatively easy. So the length is the size of an object attribute. And let's print that. Let's print that. Um, 30 hex. And what did we do? 8, 10, 18, 20. 28, 30, we did it. So it is the correct shape, no surprise there. And then there's a way that we can get the length of that in NASM and I forget. So the object attributes, this will actually be um, res b object attributes, I think length, if we do that. Um, is it under len? Maybe it's size. I think it's one of these. It's size. Nice. Fuck yeah. So we're going to allocate bytes for that amount of space to hold the object attributes. So what we'll do is into quadroid of RSP plus locals, and then we'll split this so we can reference. Uh, we don't really need that open. Okay. So we have a length and this is on object attributes plus object attributes dot length. Um, object adder just to, just to shorten that up a bit. <laughs> Into here, we will write the length, which will be object attributes len size. Um, shit, what's the best way to do this? 
Okay, we'll do. We'll figure it out at the end. Allocation size will be zero. Then we'll write to the. I could make an alias for that potentially. Then we have the padding, which doesn't matter. The root directory, which will be a zero. We have the um, attributes, which are. I think we can pass zero. Yeah, we can just pass zero for those object attributes. And, oh, that's technically a D word. Then object name, we have to fill that one in. That one's hard. Uh, security descriptor. And the security quality of service. And that should be initializing that structure such that... This now, this is still probably going to fail when it's looking at a file name. So we're still going to get probably a, a, a C05, an access violation, because now we need to set up a file name, and that is a Unicode string. And if we look at a Unicode string, it's just uh, it's two U's, U shorts and a pointer. So it's a U short, a U short, and a, a pointer. So it's the lengths the length of the actual string in characters, the maximum length of the string in characters, and then a pointer to a buffer. So we'll do uh, struct unicode string and struct. Length is a D word too, thank you. I knew there was another field in there. Um, length, not that it really mattered because there's stuff afterwards, but yeah, totally right. Uh, res D or res W, we have a max length, which is a res W1, and then we have to pad this. I might be able to do this, I'm not sure if I can. Um, I don't know if I can align in a structure. No, um. Uh, padding res b6 4 and then we can do inside of here we will have the um, uh, what's this going to have this is going to have a pointer to the actual string uh, res q1 so now we need to set up a unicode string and I actually might do that in the data area such that we can use, eh, fuck it. We'll, we'll initialize all this stuff in the shell code itself, um, just for fun. So we'll move quadward, RSP plus locals, and then we have to make another structure here. This is gonna be the um, file name, RESB for Unicode string size. And that's the file name Unicode string structure. So I'll populate that by doing move uh, word, RSP plus locals dot File name plus Unicode string dot length, and we'll set this to ten bytes, and the max length or ten characters. I think it's characters. Maybe it's bytes. Um, Unicode string. What OS is this? This is um, this is uh, Debian Linux. Length in bytes. Never mind. Okay, so we want to do. We'll do four bytes. So two, two characters. And then we'll move the pointer, which is a quad word. And the pointer is going to be, we'll put it in racks. Mm. Um, yeah. We'll LEA into racks, the rip relative to uh, foop which is gonna be a db41041 So that is a, um, this is file name AA, right? So we will read into racks, we'll get the pointer to foop. All right. And we got some parsing errors, 56. 
Okay, so then this, we want to LEA this into racks. LEA into racks the RSP plus locals dot file name. And then we're going to pass that file name into uh, one of these fields. Object name, which is here. Move quad word. Uh, we'll just yoink that. And then this is the file. Uh, this is the object name. And then we'll pass in a pointer to the file name structure that we created on the stack. And we're probably pretty close to being correct here. And that returned an access violation, which is interesting. Max length should be plus two. Uh, it, it shouldn't. Uh, it shouldn't matter. So it's just the maximum length of the buffer in bytes. Um, if it's null terminated, length does not include the trailing null character. It's completely optional to have it null terminated and not for this. Um, so let's see. Length, max length, we pass in allocation size. I'm going to set this to zero because I don't think it's required. Um, you need to provide a fully qualified path if you're not passing a handle to the directory and the object attributes. Uh, yeah, I just want this to give a different error. Um... Uh, what do I want to do? This potentially means that I'm off on my parameters here. Potentially, I need to subtract 60. Um, subtract 58. So here's where like all the tiny things are required for the calling conventions. Um, here's where I might be fucking something up. Pass these things on the stack. We invoke this as call. Um, file generic write, blah, blah, blah. What are we doing here? EA buffer, unless extended attributes. I don't think that's required. Some may not support this. And we're passing at length zero. So I, I think we're off on our arguments for some reason. Like one of these structures, we have the structure shape wrong. Um, this one looks fine. We pass in that. The root directory is null, object name, attributes. All the security things can be null, I'm pretty sure. If it's null, if it's null. So we should be fine for that. Um, yeah, it's weird. It's it's kind of strange. I'm gonna pass RSP to this just to just to see if this works. Um, Am I reserving too much space? Am I writing to the wrong location on the stack? Let me sub RSP eight. I bet that's what it is. It expects, it expects the, I think that expects a return address. Yeah, okay, sweet. I'm gonna uh, go get my food quick, but I'll be right back.
All right. So, got all those things passed in. We have a new air, which is perfect. That's exactly what I want. Uh, that allocation size is actually bunk. So let's put that to zero. But yeah, so the calling convention actually expects that there's a return uh, address on the stack. So we make room for the we make room on the stack for all the arguments that we pass, and then we fake a return address um, such that the stack is lined up in the way that it expects. Because the caller expects to access this via RSP plus twenty eight, not at RSP plus twenty. So. Now let's see how good this food is. Oh yeah. Oh, it's good. Fuck yeah. All right. Oh, that's really good. Object path syntax bad. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty useful error. Hi. I would hazard that our object path syntax is bad. What's the fully qualified path? I don't think I can do C colon slash. I think I have to do um, like this. Is that what I have to do here? And I'm pretty sure there's a way. So you can do like DB ASDF, I think, in NASM. You can do db. Can you do dw? Will that make a Unicode string? I have no idea what it's making. It's making something. Um, UB rip L50. Let's just see what address that's storing. It's the address of this. I want to see what that memory looks like. Mm, nope, that's actually just the string. Yeah, UNC paths. Hell yeah. Oh my god. That was all good. Holy shit. DWU? Is that NASM syntax? Doesn't like it. Oh, do you have to put a comma? Hmm, single ticks. I mean, this is literally what you have. Yeah, it doesn't like it. Um, well, well. What food do you have? I made a Japanese curry with elk meat. Oh, I see. All right, I should be fine with this then. Noise. Noise. EB rip L50. This is the address of the thing db this all right asdf beautiful thank you for that that is nice uh foop len uh uh is equal to um current location minus foop and then we can put foop len into the max len and then we can just type whatever the fuck we want in here C colon slash ASDF. Let's see if that works first. We might not have perms there. Let's see what we got. Mm. Invalid. Okay. I don't think it'll, I don't think this is escaping slashes. If it is, then I need to fix that. Hey, we got new error. I bet this is eperm. Object name invalid? Wait. The object name is invalid. But the path is fine? So the other one was path invalid? So 
So that name is bad? What? Hmm. Fancy eating? Because <laughs> I live in the, out in the woods? Yeah. Hell yeah. I gotta live that, uh... I gotta live that rural lifestyle. It's fucking delicious, though. This is so good. I actually just have it in my crock pot, so I can just add more to my plate as I'm hungry. Mmm. Fuck yeah. Object name invalid. Hmm. Isn't it? Whack, whack, slash. Isn't that what I'm doing? Or do you literally mean the question mark afterwards? I don't I don't think so, right? Oh, the dot. It kind of varies. I always forget which one is for which. But let's see. Nope. But I'm pretty sure. Yeah, that's for escaping in C. And I'm guessing I don't have escaping. I should check that. Uh, disassemble that. And then this is the address. Print the bytes. Oh! It is getting escaped. Wait, is it? No, it's not. Never mind. I, I saw the dots. Yeah, it's not getting escaped. Uh, 2E, 5C. Yeah. Yeah, if I did a... Uh, Disassemble Unicode, or not, display Unicode at this address. Yeah, that looks fine. One question mark instead of two? I don't think so. Um... And then let's see what that's sent for the lengths. 16 hex. Yeah, that should be correct. Huh. I'm doing something stupid here. But what could it be? The, the length is in bytes. I mean, I can try a Null Terminator, but it shouldn't matter. It shouldn't, but maybe it will. And technically, the length isn't supposed to include that Null Terminator, but I can do this. Uh, add a Null Terminator, subtract 2 from the length. Keep the max length. But the, the Null Terminator should not be required at all here. Um... Okay, am I doing something else dumb? Racks, LEA foop. That's the address of that. That's good. Root directory, attributes, allocation size. Um. Hmm. Did it say foop blend was 16? I think I think so. Well, in this in this specific instance, it is 18. It's hex. Um allocation size. I mean, we can, we can just, um, we can just, uh, isn't it just one question mark? I thought we tried that. I'm pretty sure we tried that. Yeah. Still problems.
And one backslash, the starting one. That's back to the invalid path. Right? So that made it worse again. Object. Oh, object path not found. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it's two. All right, I'll just do this then. 122.21, CDB into a process, which will be notepad 5696. Uh, BAE1 NT, NT create file, go. Okay, open, okay. Uh, U rip DPS RSP. Um, all right. L5. L8. All right. So we have 80, which is the file attributes allocation, uh, share access, read and write, creation disposition, creation options, EA buffer, EA length. And then this is the, um, I guess the second one is the object attribute, so it's just this. Eighty zero. Oh, it's uh, it's still in it's still in the register. So this is just at uh, DPS R eight are the constants of that. There is here's the object attributes. Um, the root directory is zero. Here's the object name. Uh, as a Unicode string here, which apparently we don't have that symbol, but it's uh, 22, 24, and then the pointer. Oh, it did work. Yeah, yeah. Oh, single and two. All right. <laughs> uh, we've never tried that combination. Single and two. Users pleb. All right. Hey, that worked. Did we actually create a file called ASDF in here? Uh, we did. <laughs> Woo! We did it. We created a file. Wow. Impressive. PogChamp. <laughs> right into the file is easy now. That's quite impressive. Ooh. How long is the shell code at this stage? I'm not optimizing for size. This will be quite massive. Um, I don't have a great way to see the size right now. We'll get to that at the end. Um, I could literally just have start and then size is equal to... This minus this, this. I don't need this. And then I can move that into a register just to cheat. <laughs> we'll just do that. Move racks size. It'll be off by the size of that and a bunch of other shit that we don't need in here. <clears throat> F4. It's massive, right? We're not, we're not trying to make this condensed. Would have made a rush shell code. I feel like shell code and rust would be pretty, pretty awful. You'd basically have to just do everything unsafe with raw pointers. It's 
basically C at that point. I guess you get like some of the structure syntax of Rust, but everything else is just going to be raw pointers, isn't it? All right. So now, now that we've done this, and oh, we can say local size if we really want to be super squeezing out every little bit of perf that we can get. Um, and then I'm going to switch these. <clears throat> yeah, kind of like this readability more. Not really that awful. You already do 90% of that awful stuff in the kernel. Yeah. But what do you gain over C at that point? Hmm. All right, now we write to the file. NT write file is easy. It's just a buffer and a length. And some other shit you don't have to pass. Um... Yeah, we pass in a, a buffer and a length and then offset into the file where we want to write it. I have a status block we can reuse. I think we can... Oh, yeah, we can't do... Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Adequate type system, nice syntax, nice compiler error, borrow checker. But you can't... I guess you can use references. Just barely. I like how those are all like rose sun C. <laughs> That's pretty good. Oh yeah. Food is delicious. NT write file. Looks like it's just eight hex. <clears throat> Move EAX 8 Same thing that we did up here. How many arguments we have? Fuck ton. Because it's a Windows API, so there there have to be a lot of arguments. And then I think we have to restore the stack. Um, add RSP OX60. And that gets the stack back to the stack frame. All right, let's test that. Let's make sure. Let's make sure that RSP is equal to RBP at that point, which it should be. RSP, RBP are equal. True. All right, good. So we need to pass in a handle. At this point, it's actually a handle. So we're going to move from there. That'll be the handle. Then we're going to have the event, which is zero. Um, this is the event. I'll clear all these comments for now. I don't know if it's this many args yet either. Uh, I'm just kind of guessing. APC routine, APC context. Pretty sure those can both be null. IO status block, buffer, length, byte, offset, and key. Okay, so now we only need 40. So this is a much simpler call. We have the event. We have the APC routine, the R90, R90. This is the APC context. So null for both of those. Then we have the IO status block, which will use the same IOSB we used before. Um, you know what? I was off there. This is the IO status block here. Okay, and then we have the buffer, now I'm off on all these, 30, 38, 40, this becomes 48 again, this is 50. So we have the IO status block, we have the buffer, we have the length, uh, buffer will just do RSP, we'll just write 
some shit from the stack, doesn't really matter. Byte offset will be null, the key will be uh, null as well. And I think that's actually everything that we need. Um, do we have an int3 in here still? We'll put an int3 here. We're probably hitting that due to padding, but there's our int3. Um, okay, we failed. Shouldn't the first stack parameter be racks instead of zero? The handle? Oh, this one. Yeah, this should be zero. For stack pram. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yep, totally right. And still not quite it yet. Um, let's check out what that is. NT status codes, and we'll see what we got. C08. Uh, invalid handle. Huh. Huh. Put an int3 in here, make sure that's actually succeeding. Oh, it's uh, it's failing. It's failing because the um because the file already exists. Also, why is that getting created as admin in this context? Um C O D invalid parameter, okay. Why is that getting created as an admin file? I was actually curious why I was able to write to that location. Owners, admins. Users can read it. Owners, admins. Um, what? <laughs> Is that creating it in the context of the SSH server process? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 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 All right, all right, guys, thoughts, thoughts, thoughts? Uh, Windows System 32? Uh, sh shouldn't, uh, hello world. Okay, <laughs> thoughts guys? Thoughts? What the fuck? <laughs> oh, why? That succeeded. There it is. <laughs> what the fuck? What? What? Need admin to delete it. So you're running a debugger on it? I mean, the debugger is an admin. Why would that let me create it? it the, the debugger doesn't have admin privs, but we can do it without the debugger. It will still work, right? The debugger doesn't run as admin. If you could, if you could debug yourself so that you get admin, I think that would be a, a big issue. But there it is again, without running it through the debugger. <laughs> what the fuck? All right, before we run it, we'll do a who am I? I'm pleb. <laughs> okay, what if I, what if I remove myself from the admin group? Because currently I'm admin. Um, how the fuck? How do I do it through the new shit? Just give me control panel. Uh, change my account type. Uh, let me enable the admin so I don't f lock myself out. Um, shit. Uh, oh, I forget the command. I forget the command. Um, 
I mean, we could, we could just make an admin account, but uh, net user administrator active, yes. Okay, so now there's an admin account. Okay, change my account type to pleb. Right, now I'm standard. And that means if I, we'll just do a full reboot. God damn it. <laughs> um, so I'm pleb. Now if I want to do an admin thing, like if I want to create a file in Windows System 32, I'm going to make new folder. And I have to actually auth as an admin. It's not a normal UAC. I have to actually enter a password. I am absolutely a pleb. All right, let's see if this still works. Oh my fucking God. I think it failed. I think it failed. Yeah, it, it, it failed. Uh, let's run it in the debugger so we can see. Still a UAC bypass. 22. Access denied. Yeah. Um, still a UAC bypass. Which is not a security boundary. But interesting. I'm surprised that's the, the default. <laughs> that's weird. I wonder if SSH doesn't have its tokens set correctly. We're hacking though. We're hacking now. I was wondering why I was able to write to uh, system32, uh, to C colon slash. Users pleb, hello. This should work. Ah, uh, make. And that succeeded. And that will be in my user directory. Hello. Cool. All right. So now we want to be able to write to files. Um, and we need to figure out what we're fucking up there. And I might change this to overwrite. But... Um, actually, was this succeeding? Uh, C O O D D invalid parameter. Okay, we're, we're we gotta we gotta give this the better. Windows has given us the D here, and we need to make sure that we we uh, put it in its place and give it the D. Let's see. Uh, sub RSP eight forty eight. Is this correct? File handle R ten. RCX, RDX, R8, R9, 20, 28, 30, 38, 40. Is that buffered not good? Not, does it not like my stack as the buffer? There should be 80 hex bytes available on the stack. Um, I have status block. All right, start off with the file handle. We give it an event which is null, an APC routine and an APC context, which are both null. All right, R9. We give an IO status block at 20 on the stack, which is a ref to the local IOSB, which is at RBP. I don't know if I'm getting clobbered by that. I don't know if my RBP is getting clobbered. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be. I actually don't know what the syscall can clobber. 
It shouldn't be able to do anything, because if it clobbered anything, that would be a leak. Um, IOSB, a buffer. <laughs> no admin wants to walk, uh, no admin wants to have to walk over to the server to set up a local terminal and click yes before they remember to enable UAC bypass for SSH. 26-year-old hacker, fuck me. Hey, we can, we can all be hackers at all ages. Everyone, everyone's a hacker. As long as you, as long as you poke the right bits, everyone's a hacker. Damn, that got spicy for a second. Yeah, it, it did get spicy. That is what we call the VR roller coaster, the vulnerability research roller coaster. It's what happens when you like, maybe you're looking at a function and you think that you have a buffer overflow, but you didn't realize that like 19 functions away, they did a length check that just happens to make sure it's in bounds. So the VR roller coaster kind of refers to like that emotional high that you get when you're getting like closer and you're like, oh shit, I think I have a bug. I think this is going to work. And then poosh, you get smacked in the face where it's like, nope, nope, it's not a thing or it's just barely a thing or it would be a bug, but they got lucky due to like, uh, um, like type, uh, type promotion <laughs> in, in C, which is brutal. Like when you see people computing things based on like U8s that are the lengths and it's like, holy shit, it overflows. And it's like, fuck, it got promoted to an int because everything gets promoted to an int. So annoying. All right, I have stats back, a uh, pointer to a buffer, a length. Maybe we don't have that much on our stack. We, we legitimately might not have that much on our stack. I will need to remove this file every time we do this, unfortunately. I uh, will just do this, del, Ignore the result, delete users, pleb, whatever file name we're creating. Hello, I think. Hello? Hello? There we go. So annoying that they optimized the comp uh, processor word size. Damn those compiler engineers. I mean, but you're not doing, you're not doing that operation. <laughs> you're not adding to two ints together. The compiler just assumes that you are and you get just different results. I'd say it's wrong. I like Rust view more. Point offset. Can this be null? Um, yeah, I think null. All right, what am I doing here? I don't think I need an event or like any of these things. Uh, to an event object, yep, when it completes, reserved, reserved, okay, we pass null, put it to an IOSB, which we do in the same way that we do up here, we LEA that, and then we pass that into 20, passing a buffer, a length, a byte offset, um, automatically extends it, blah, blah, blah. I'm pretty sure if you pass it with zero, well, um, what do I need here? File generic, right? Then we 20, 28, 30, 30, 40. I feel like I, I feel like I have this right. Event, APC routine, APC context. Unless I'm, unless I'm using the wrong syscall number. Nope, it should be eight. Unless it literally just changed. Yeah, syscall, sub RSP. Invalid parameter. Let's let's try giving this some garbage. I want to see if this is going to give me a uh, access violation error. Invalid parameter. And let's make sure that this is still succeeding. It should be. Should be creating that file. I think. Um, we're just kind of we're kind of YOLO guessing here. Okay, that succeeds, and then that fails. Sub RSP 48, 
an RSP 50. That's 48 bytes. I'm doing, I'm doing something stupid here. I don't think I need an event. ISS block buffer length byte offset key. Do I need to zero out the IO status block? I don't think so. And what is that? It's a pointer to an IO status block. Yeah, I think that just gets the output. Uh, Z ZW write. I want to see if we can get different documentation. I want this one. Nope, that doesn't describe. All right. And this is the same. These are the same docs, it looks like. Um, the end of a file by doing that. OK, key. We set that to 0. Hmm. What? What am I doing here? I'm doing something silly. Uh, make. CLD, valid parameter, pass in the handle. And if I pass in this, this will say invalid handle, right? This will be a different error. Correct. So the handle should be good. Unless I have these permissions wrong. But I don't think so. Um. Unless I need to give it a bite out. If I do five for there, this should fail. Pass in pointer to the IOSB. Oh, that's a fun one. I don't actually know 2C5. Data type misalignment error. Oh, interesting. It requires a alignment on that. I didn't know that. And then this with buffer one, two, three is not failing with a. That's failing invalid parameter. Byte offset is a pointer. Yeah, it is. I don't think I need it. I'm pretty sure I can pass null and that will write to the end. Now, maybe one of these permissions is not right. We do file generic write, which is, I think, good enough to write. It's creating the file. Maybe, maybe I do need to zero out that IOSB. Um, I'll do a move racks plus zero of a zero as a quad word and eight. So that will, that'll zero out the IOSB because it's two quad words in size. We'll see if that does the trick. Nope. And that would make sense. On the first syscall, you LEA racks for the allocation size, but don't use it. Yeah, it, it shouldn't be needed. The allocation size just pre-populates the size of the file. I don't think that's needed. Um, create options. Let's see if there's anything I'm missing here. We're going to create. Create options. Um, no, I shouldn't need any of these. Um, must not be a directory file. Overwrite, open if. Uh, Allocation size. All of these we set up in a reasonable manner. File generic write. 
And these are a mix of all these. We don't set any extended attributes. Like, it almost feels like that's not the actual syscall number. We're going to take a look at nt-write file. Okay, it is 8. And we pass an 8 as the syscall. Uh, hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I feel like maybe these parameters are not in the right spot then. 48. Make room for all the args. Sub p 8. Move ex is call. Huh. Huh. Unless I need that byte offset, but I don't think so. Um. If it's one of these, the IO manager maintains the position. Maybe we do have to do byte offset. Okay, let's try it. Let's try byte offset. Let's let's pass that in. Um, we have to pass in a pointer to a. Uh, we'll call this a uh, byte offset. I will just call this a large integer. We'll just use this for generic shit. Use Notepad again to see the args. Yeah. Let me, let's, let's just try this. We'll YOLO try this first. Move racks, uh, move rbp plus locals dot, uh, actually we can do this. Move, move DRF racks zero as quad word. So write in a zero and then we use byte offset zero and we'll see if that does the trick. Um, oh, not allocation size. This is a uh, large integer. Okay, there we go. So, 103. I think that means it did it. Okay, so we need we needed that, and that just wrote, that wrote random stack shit. Oops, don't want to scan it with Defender. Um, that wrote random contents of the stack to here. Uh, permission denied, because I don't have sharing allowed. And then... The contents of this are, yeah, it's just random shit that was on the stack. So I needed byte offset. I'm kind of surprised, um, but neat, neat. I guess we'll just do that there. It's kind of gross, kind of gross there. I kind of want to do, I don't know. I don't know a good way to reformat that. Anyways, now we can write the contents of shit to a file. So we can start working on extracting the information. So to do that, um, what we could do, we, we need to figure out what regions are being used in the virtual address space of this application. So we're, we're doing this not to just write assembly, right? We're not doing this to just write assembly. We're doing this to actually do something meaningful, which is dump the entire memory state of a process. And to do that, I need to know what memory regions are present uh, and usable um, in this file. So, uh, or in this program. So we can do that. On a 32-bit application, you can literally just write every page and like try it. Um, but in 64-bit, we can't really do that. So there's, um, uh, Capty Randy, thank you so much for the sub. How have you been doing? Thank you so much. Seen your name up in there. Glad you're enjoying the content. We're going to take a squiz at... Um, what is the... Uh, uh, Windows gets uh, program memory map. I forget the function for this. Just cat proc self maps. You know what? Proc self maps would actually be more annoying than what we're going to do. 
uh, Windows API. Uh, we'll look at reprocess memory for now. Let's take a look. So I'm just using read process memory as an oracle to hopefully get like nearby to what you use to query the um, the memory, query virtual memory information. Okay, that sounds really good. Um, information about a page or a set of pages. And I think this gives you all of the regions. Allocation base, allocation protect, and then all the shit about it. So this is what we care about. But we want the syscall version. So let's take a look at syscalls. Query information. Um, so this is query virtual memory. Yep, there's an empty query virtual memory. That sounds really good. <laughs> That's probably ballpark what we want to do. I've actually written this in MIPS assembly for uh, Windows before. That was one of my favorite things. One of my favorite things is working on this in MIPS assembly. Okay, we pass in a process handle, a base address, the memory information class, the memory information, the memory information length, and then a return length. And it will fill it in with the, so we pick a class and we say that I want basic information. And then this will burp, this will literally burp into my process uh, where I tell it to, which will be the stack probably. So let's sub RSP 1000. We'll make some room on the stack and then we'll move RBX RSP. That's the pointer to the like space where we're gonna store a bunch of shit. We still have RBP pointing to our parameters, so we're fine. So we're gonna do an NT query virtual memory. This is actually really easy. This is 23 hex. Uh, syscall move EAX OX23. And this takes how many arguments? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we need this. Uh, we'll yoink this. We'll paste it here. And we'll. Uh, this is 30. Then we'll sub RSP8. And then add RSP OX38. And now this is move R10. This is the process handle. And we'll write in negative one. Then we have the base address. I think that's base address of the region of pages to be queried. Oh, yeah, I think we have to do this in a loop. Can you make your mouse pointer bigger? I I don't know how to make it bigger. I wish I could. I want it to be like half my screen so I can find it when I get lost. <laughs> um, there's actually probably a way to do that pretty easily. Uh, move RDX. This is the base address of what we want to query. We'll query at zero. So we query at zero. And then this is going to give us the size of the mapping at zero, which is going to be not present. It's going to basically say there's a not present region at zero. The memory information class is basic memory information, which is the zeroth element of an enum of this enum, R eight D zero, and we can say EDX in this case. Um, and then we'll move R nine D. This is the pointer to the memory information. This is just RSP. Okay, and then we have the memory information length, which is the size of a memory information structure, which is this memory basic information. So we'll, we'll write this structure, memory basic information and struct. And what we got here, we got the base res q1, we've got the allocation base, we got the allocation protect, res d1. We've got the region size, which is a res q1, which means that this has to be padding. We have the state, which is a res d1. We have the protect, which is a res d1. And we have the type, which is a res d1. 
All right, so that should be the trick. Okay, region size. And then this is actually all we need to make room for. So we'll do this right here. Um, memory info res b for this size. Oh yeah, we're making this clean now. Memory info means we don't need this sub. And process handle negative one edx. We can XOR these. Not that it really matters. Um, R9D. This is the region size. Oh, that's the... Sorry. <laughs> About to say. Memory information class. This is the memory information. This is the pointer. So this is LEA into R9. We will get the address of the base pointer plus the locals memory info. So the address of the memory info structure on the stack. Then we will pass in the length, which is technically a D word, but we'll pass in a quad word because it doesn't matter. And this will be the, um, whatever the structure name is. Uh, we'll, we'll split this again so we can ref that. So this will be memory basic information. Oops. Memory basic information size. So we're telling it how big that buffer is, and then it will return a return length, an optional pointer. You know what we do with optional pointers? We pass zero. <laughs> what keyboard? This is a DOS keyboard. It's relatively old at this stage. Okay, let me get rid of this first int three, but this probably is gonna work like first try-ish. I think we did everything right there. CO4. Info length mismatch. Oh, okay. So we probably did the structure wrong then. Res Q. Res Q. Res D padding. Res Q. Oh, there's more padding here. We have to quadward align the whole structure. That will quadward align the whole structure. And then this will get us past that since the structures are padded out to the size. And there we go, error, uh, return code zero. And now we can do a DT, memory basic information, on wherever that was on the stack. So let's take a look at where we put that. Um, it is RBP plus 60. So we can do a, and it should still be at R9. So we can do a DT, memory basic information of R9. Ooh. Ah, I can't fucking use up arrows in this for some reason. Um R DB uh, DT memory basic information reload basic information. Oh, um, yeah, I actually don't know why I don't have that structure. Anyways, we'll take a look at what's at R9. Here we have a uh, UB rip L20, DPS RBP plus 60. Okay, so this is telling me, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the structure. Here's the base address. Here's the allocation base. Here's the protections, zero. Here's the size of the region. Here's the state of the region, which I think is free. The protections of the region and the type of the region. Oh, um, this is the, that's the size. This is the state. This is the protection. And then this is the type. Um, just do the way that I'm displaying this. So page no access. Uh, when it was initially allocated. I care about the current state. So the state is currently mem free. So that's telling me that this region is free from zero to this location is free. 
So now we're going to make a loop to go through all the regions in the program and dump all of them out. But if we take a look, we can actually take a look at the uh, memory layout um, by doing bang address. And this will show me the memory ranges. And here we see from zero to end address for this size, it is free. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're actually going through and we're dumping all of this information out. So we're going to make a loop here. And I think, I don't know when the loop stops, to be honest. I'm not sure yet where the loop stops. But in the loop, we'll do an int 3. And we want to provide a different base address. So every time we go through here, we're going to start with the base address. We'll put the... The base address will put an R15. So this is the base address to scan. And we'll move the base address into uh, this base address here, which is this parameter, RDX. We'll move the base address from R15 into there. The memory information class is 0, meaning we want the basic info. And then we pass a pointer to the basic info structure. Now, every time we do the syscall, we'll get a result. And what we'll do is we'll test. We'll test EAX, EAX. If it's non-zero, if this returned an error, then go to error. And error will do a UD2, which is an undefined opcode. That will cause it to crash, but in a unique way other than the int3s we're using. So this is uh, make sure the syscall succeeded. Now, what we're going to do is we'll update the base address by adding the RBP plus locals.memoryinfo plus memory basic information dot whatever we called it. This is the region size. So every time we find a region, we will add this. So this will update the base of the scan to reflect the size of the region we just uh, observed. And I don't know what happens when we get to the last region, to be honest. I think it might just fail at the end, but we'll see. So then here, we will int 3, and then we'll jump back to loop. So we'll loop forever, adding that base and performing a new syscall every time. So what we should be able to see, um, DPS R9. It seems like R9 is getting clobbered. Um, DPS RBP plus whatever it was. EB rip L20. DPS RBP plus 60. And so that's the size. And we actually know R15, that contains the base, right? So now if I go again, Succeeded, and that says that there's some region there, some region there, some region there, all the way until I'm guessing eventually it fails. There are a lot of regions. EB rip uh, 90, replace it with an op. Okay, we hit a UD2, and that happened due to a COD. When we asked for this address, see, and that's invalid parameter. OK. So when we finally get to the end there, it yells at us and gets mad at us. Does this end up a bit like uh, walking the free blocks that a malloc implementation would track? Not necessarily, because this is not like a heap walker. This is a virtual memory walker, so it is to that regard, yes. Okay, so I don't know. I think I don't know how I know when it's at the end. Obviously, that's what we requested. We requested at this address, and it got mad, which is very close to the highest address that we can use in user space, but it's not exactly at the end. And I don't know if there's any indicator. Um, is that the end? Yeah, end address plus one. 
And I don't think there's really any way to know that that's the end. So I think that's just going to be the when we bail out. So I think that's what we'll do. Let's look at the base address. We'll do all this shit. And then we'll int three. And what we want to do is we actually want to write out this information. So we want to write out the, um, if, if and only if it is not free. Uh, we want commit. I guess we care about the permissions. Anything that is commit we care about. Reserve we don't really care about. Ah, we do. Yeah, we want to touch all of those. Uh, page no access. Let me just do this so it's more readable. Address. So we're using the debugger to see all of all of this stuff, and we'll send this to five. Okay. So this is basically the memory map of this program. And no access on this, read only. I'm pretty sure anything that is marked commit and readable, I'll want to dump. You know what? Maybe I just want to write these whole structures. Well, I need to know what I can probe. And I can only read things that are readable, of course. Um, hmm. Hmm. Um, what assembly book do you recommend to start with? I'm not familiar with really good books for assembly stuff. Um, what programs are best fit for starting reverse engineering? Um, let's see. You're getting some answers here. Start with Hello World and write it yourself to learn. I, I think that's a actually a really good way to go about it. Um, I think like game hacking can be a good introduction to reverse engineering for sure. Yeah, Desu posted some good things there. Hell yeah. Um, I'm learning SRE ATM and uh, by making mods for a game. The binary is big, but has uh, unstripped symbols, so it's not too bad. Oh, that's super nice. What are you using to do that? Are you using Ghidra for that? Are you using Ida? <laughs> or R2, you never know, Binja. There are actually a lot of tools for reverse, enge reverse engineering now, which is fucking bizarre. Um. So I might make this into a macro because this is self-contained. I could make a function. <laughs> yeah, I think I'll make a function. Uh, well, I won't have the stack there. Um, let's see. I think... I always forget the syntax for this, uh, make, but I think that's actually correct. It is. And then I will pass a buffer and a length, and I think they're percents for those. Maybe they're dollar signs. Okay, I think they're dollar signs then. So I want this to yell at me. Uh, now's a macro. Let's see what Nathan has to say. Uh, macro, macro, macro. Uh, percent macro, this percent, okay, it is percents. Percent one buffer and length. So this will take two arguments, write file. And now what I can do is I can do a write file. Um, oh, that doesn't know what offset to write to. Ooh. ooh. We're gonna write. The byte offsets 
Just racks, which is large int in integer. We'll do byte offset. And then I'll do this. Uh, move byte offset quad word zero. Uh, offset to write into the file. And now we have this macro, and I should be able to write file. And I think every time I write, I'll just update the offset. Add racks. Uh, add quad word rbp plus locals bytes offset. Um... Uh, percent two. And then as long as these values are high enough in memory, I should be fine. So I'm going to LEA into R10, or high enough in registers so they're not clobbered. Uh, let's do like R13. This is going to be the pointer to the memory info. RBP plus locals dot memory info. And then we'll move into R14, the size that we want to use. So we'll use, for the size of this, it is a memory basic information size. And then we'll write info using R13, R14. So this should hopefully, uh, we don't want that in three. Move that, point offset, loop. Um. Byte offset undefined. Oh yeah, we didn't. We never changed the name of this. Byte offset. Okay, so now this should theoretically dump all of those regions to a file. Yep, we hit the sigil. That's fine. So now this file, this hello file, should contain all of those address ranges. And let's grab a hex editor. What's the best hex editor on Windows? Or do we just pull it over and XXD this? Actually, we have XXD with Vim, don't we? Fuck. Uh, program files, Vim. Oh. Dir. Vim82. Should have XXD in here. Yeah, we do. All right, so we can look at the files here, we're gonna do G8 little Indian dump of hello. All right, so these have all of the ranges and all the permissions for all the regions in this file. Isn't that fucking cool? <laughs> we have every single little bit of information about all the ranges, and this is the final range, starting from here, and if we add those two together, that would get us, um, if we add these two together in this mode, plus this, this puts us basically at the end of the address space. Yep. So, now what we need to do is we need to probably just run through that again. Um, probably just re-invoke that syscall again in that same loop. And in this case, we're going to want to... Um, Hmm. I think when we go through it again, then we need to parse off the permissions because some of the regions we're, we we want to any region that we can read, we want to dump. And what I might do there, I'm. Do I just invoke write file on every region, regardless of the permissions, and just let the kernel handle the failures? Maybe. Maybe. I could maybe open another file and do two files kind of at the same time. One's the memory and one's the these. And every time we do a write, we'll, we'll query the region. And then if that region exists, then we'd write the information out. Yeah, I've got an idea here. And it requires that we open another file. So I think it's time to make some functions. <laughs> what are you, what are y'all's thoughts? Is it time to make some functions? Let's make let's make some fucking functions. Uh, we're gonna make a function called uh, open file. 
This is going to open a file based on the file name in uh, file name in mm, based on the UTF sixteen file name in honestly I'm gonna say the Unicode string. Uh, open a file. And this will take an input in RCX, which will be the uh, pointer to Unicode string. And this will return a handle. <laughs> Structured programming too high level for my taste. <laughs> All right. So open a file. That'll return a handle. Um... Uh, and then we can have like an error here. Oh, we'll figure out how we want to handle errors. That's that's uh, that's not very important. We can figure that out. So then here we'll do if zero and if. So this is basically uh, commenting out this entire uh, program. Okay, because we're gonna have some issues here because we won't have locals. So we'll grab locals. We'll whack it up here. And what do we need? We have the handle, which is the return value. Ah. All right, so we need the ISB. We don't need the byte offset. We need the object attributes. We don't need the memory info. Um, I do wanna retain this here. Now we can start fucking this up. So the only things that we need are, well, we already have a Unicode string, so we don't even need that. So we're gonna pass in a Unicode string to this function, and then we'll return the handle out into here, which has to be a location in memory. So we'll sub off of the stack locals size. So this is make room on the stack for the locals, uh, locals, and then we'll um, push RBP. So this is save registers. We're going to make sure nothing gets clobbered. That's going to be our calling convention, is literally nothing will get clobbered. Uh, except for this. So racks will be the only thing that gets clobbered. I like that calling convention a lot, because it's just, you don't have to think about it. So we're going to push off RBP. We're going to save the frame pointer. So that's setting up a frame pointer. Then here we're going to set up the... That's setting up the Unicode string, which we'll do statically. So this will be um, initialize the object attributes. And for this, we can do a... We only care about that. Uh, and I don't think I can do multi-line in NASM. I think. Let's do a if zero, end if. See if uh, NASM is okay with multi-line, because that would be nice so we can format this code a little bit better. And it looks like it's complaining at 56. Let's uh, put a slash here. Sometimes. Ooh, nice. So in this case, this can be racks. I've actually never done that. I've never done this multi-line. Initialize the object attributes. We're gonna have the file name. I might just zero initialize all the locals. Uh, zero initialize all the locals. Move into the destination. This is RBP move uh, XOR x x move RCX locals size technically ECX is fine here rep stows B um, 
So that will zero out all the locals. And now we only have to fill in the things that we actually use. Uh, Stow's B, uh, basically Stow's B is this. While ECX is greater than zero, or rep Stow's B is this. While ECX is greater than zero, deref byte at RDI and assign that to the value in AL, which is the byte value in EAX. Then RDI plus plus, ECX minus minus. So that's effectively what that does. But yeah, so that's basically memset. Now, I think it's part of the ABI that the direction flag is always zero. But I'm just going to I'm just going to clear the direction flag to make sure that that goes in the correct direction. So I'm pretty sure it's always clear, but we'll just clear it just so we can be just so we can be careful there. So we make room on the stack for the locals and then here we want to save some more registers. We want to push uh, RDI, push racks, push um, RCX. So we're going to save off RBP because we clobber it. We're going to save off RDI because we clobber it. RAX we clobber. RCX is we clobber. So we're saving all those things off. Um, then we initialize these object attributes. We get the address of the file name. Um, oh, and that is just RCX. That's what's passed in as the file name. And we'll put it in R10 because it's more convenient. <laughs> so we're going to take the... We set up the length to the object attribute size. We set the object name to the a pointer to R10, which we pass in. And then we are going to sub 60. And then these are going to be shifted by 8. So 28, 30, 38, 40, 48, 50, 58. And then at the end, we sub RSP 60. So this is make room for the um, arguments on the stack. This is set up the arguments. Arguments. And this is uh, invoke nt create file. And this is uh, free the arguments from the stack. And then we can add, uh, we can just pop those registers off. And to follow that calling convention, I might just do like a push all or something like that. Pop racks, pop RDI, pop RBP ret. That's not correct yet. And then this is um, free the arguments from the stack as well as the locals. So we'll add the size of the locals. And then we can return out. So now we have a function that we can call. And let's see, that has a file handle. All right. So at this stage, we'll put an int three. We'll call open file. Oh, and we're not returning out the handle. And since we're returning out the handle in racks, we don't want to save and restore that. Uh, this is restore, restore registers. And then this is uh, return back. Okay, now I think we'll start cleaning these up too, make these look nice. That looks pretty good. Can I get all these to line up? Yes, I can. Instead of the multiple deletes, you can delete multiple spaces with DW until a word. Oh, yeah. I, shit. <laughs> I thought... I'm learning so much shit in Vim, man. Okay. Make room for the locals. 
Now, technically, I wouldn't have to do this, right? I could include that 60 in here, and then I'd put all the arguments on this, and... But this is just a little bit easier, in my opinion. Okay. So, make... This should now work. Well, we don't pass in an argument. Uh, C3B, perfect. And that's just the return from create file. Um... And I think the calling convention I'm going to use here is I will have error ud2 uh, invoked on an error. Uh, and then on error uh, jumps to error. Right? Pretty easy. And then we'll say test uh, eax eax if it's non zero. So if the return is not zero, which is status, status success, then it'll jump to error. And this is uh, uh, jump to error on errors. OK, so we check the return result. And then if we have an error, we jump here, which is just going to it's just going to crash, which is exactly what we want it to do. Set up all of these things. Save off the addresses for all those. I actually like to stylize like this, but it's just personal preference. Okay, so we hit the UD2, and that's because we don't pass in a file name. And to do this, we're going to pass in... Um, I don't know if there's a way for me to create a structure. Uh... NASM struct. I don't know if I can create one. Because if there is a way to create a structure, that would actually be pretty nifty. Here we go. So we can make one. And we can use that to set up frames. Ooh, declaring instances of structures. I struck. Aha! Well, that's fucking cool. I've literally never done this before. So this is the... Um, we're going to call this the memory info. I struck. I've, I've never done this. This is new to me. We're going to create an instance of a Unicode string. And then we're at... <laughs> Object oriented O P assembly. Yeah, pretty much. Now this is gorgeous actually. We're gonna say at length define a word which is a which is the size of the string. And How do I do that? Um, so I guess we make, this will be the memory info stir. And then this is the memory info len. Is that minus memory info stir? And at this, memory info stir len for the length and the max length and then at the pa uh, at the pointer we will have a quad word which is the memory info stir well that's fucking cool um and then i end problem is we can't actually use this Unless we always load this at a fixed location, which we don't. So, yeah. Yep, so we can't actually use this. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. That was the dream, though. Sad day. 
sad day. So this is the memory info stir. Okay, sub RSP. And here we'll do the same thing, struct locals and struct. This is a, we'll have a Unicode string here. This is the file name, um, which is a DB for Unicode string size. Sub RSP locals size, add RSP locals size. Okay, and then we int three at the end, and then here we'll set up the locals. This will be RSP plus locals dot file name plus unicode string dot length. And we're gonna write in a word, which is the memory info len. And we have the max length here. We just barely go over. So we'll tab that in there. That one fits. And then move quad word RSP plus locals dot file name plus Unicode string dot pointer. And we have to load in the address of it, which we'll get from, we'll have to LEA that, LEA racks rel. So this will be rip relative addressing. So it will determine the distance between this instruction and this, uh, this label. And that allows us to not actually have to directly know where this is in memory. All I have to know is that it's relative to this location. Um, and that prevents there being relocations. And it means that we can move this program to anywhere in memory because it will execute anywhere because it doesn't rely on where it is, um, which is one of the key properties of a lot of shell code. So we'll set up that pointer. And then we'll LEA and R15 for open file, RSP plus locals dot file name. So we'll pass it that a pointer to that file name structure. Um, and I guess we'll say locals. This is shellcode locals. I'm I'm okay with this. SC locals, SC locals. Unless I can scope those structures, but I don't think I can. Can I actually do? Um, 109. Oh, uh, res B. Okay, we're getting a sigil. Um, now we have to figure out what we broke. Object name is R10. Oh, it's R10, not R15. Haha. -ha. Oof. I was wondering. And yeah, we hit our int three. And since we hit our int three, we know that we opened that file. Sweet. So now we can actually make this return. Um, this is a uh, return the handle. Move racks rbp plus locals dot handle. So now this is the handle. So we actually got access to that handle. Beautiful. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna look at the MSVC x64 calling convention, and I want to see what potentially might get clobbered. Um, here we go. So this, these are the registers that are, they're volatile and they must be considered destroyed on function calls. AVX512, ZMM. Wow. All of those are volatile. Huh. So I guess we will just adhere to that. RBP are, is non-volatile. RCX, volatile. Okay, so basically anything that we clobber that is marked as volatile, um, we don't have to worry about because with this calling convention, we're fine. R10, 
Yeah, R10 is volatile. Okay. So we do all this stuff. We do the syscall. And this should work. And we get that handle. And we do. So this means we can now open another handle in our code down here. So uh, we'll make a... Um, this is... Uh, create the file name for the... We're going to have two different files. We're going to open two different files. One file is going to be the... Um, the memory and register information. So this is a memory and register state. Uh, memory layout and register state. And then this will be open the file. Okay. And this will be... Um, uh, we'll call this a folk dump. And this will be the... Metadata is what we'll call that for now. Okay, now this will fail because we don't remove that file. Nice, and it does. So we are checking those. And then here we'll remove folk dump star. Okay, so now this should work every time we run it. And... We'll open that file, and this will be um, metadata file, res q1. And then this will be the, we'll have the metadata file and the memory file. Or we'll have info. We'll call this the info file. I like that. I actually like that more. So then we'll make another version of this. Instead of memory info, this will be memory memory. <laughs> and this will just be called memory. Info file, memory file. Memory info. And then this uh, for the create the file name for the memory dump. And this is just called memory and that just barely fits and that's memory and then we open that file so now uh, we'll save these files off and both succeeded which is great so here we'll um, save to RSP plus sclocals.info file, we'll save the racks. And then down here, this will be for the memory file. And we'll basically, now we're saving the handles for those two files that we create. And let's take a look at what we have here. We should have two files that got created. Yep, we have the info. Man, I've got a lot of things here. We have the info file and the memory file. Now, nothing is currently present in those yet because we don't write anything. So we want to move. Now we want to move our write file. And we want to make a write file function. So this is going to be uh, write file. And what does this take? This will take RCX, which will be a handle. Um, so this will be RCX. We need an IO status block. And what else do we need here? IO status block and a byte offset. So we'll take RDX will be a byte offset uh, in the file to write to. And it'll return the status. Uh, the, it'll return the NT status code. Okay. So we have to make a local structure here. Make. Okay. And maybe we don't have to call these SC locals. We 
we'll just call those locals. And then here, we'll comment all this out temporarily. If zero and if, and we'll see. Okay, yep, it does not like that. So this will be uh, everything up here that says locals. We will convert to open file locals. Just for some clarity. Making a, unique, a more unique name for those locals. Because apparently they sh share the same namespace. Maybe there's a way to prevent that with some prefix, but I'm not sure. And these will be the right file locals. And we just have the IO status bytes and the byte offset. So we will subtract off from the stack. We will make room. Oh, that's just for the call. So we're going to subtract off from the stack RSP WF locals size. And then down here, we're going to add that size back. And then we'll return out. And anything that we clobber in here, we need to fix as well. But we don't clobber anything, I don't think. We don't have to initialize these locals. So, all right, we have the file handle here. We have the RDX we have to store. We have to store RDX right now. RSP plus locals dot, ooh. Yeah, I wanna make a stack frame again. Cause otherwise I'm clobbering, otherwise I can't use RBP down here like I'm using. So we'll write to wf the right file locals. So to the right file locals, we're going to write the bytes offset, and this is the RDX. So this is uh, set up the bytes offset to write to as requested by the caller. Here we'll uh, allocate local space on the stack, and then RBP has to be preserved. So yeah, we wanna actually save that based on the calling convention. So we'll save RBP and then at the end we'll pop RBP. This is uh, restore the stack. This is gonna be doing the call. How do I wanna, I really wanna clean this up. This looks like shit. This will hopefully get more clear. Man, it must be fun having this much knowledge. Hey, I, I, I make sacrifices in other areas of my life for this knowledge. <laughs> I, I think uh, fun is very subjective. I do have a lot of fun doing this stuff, though. <laughs> but I think a lot of people would be quite bored by this. So this is uh, allocate room for the stack locals. This is uh, create, or not the stack locals, the arguments. This is populate the arguments. The arguments, and we're gonna do the same thing here that we're gonna adjust these. This will be 30, 38, 40, and then 48. Get rid of that sub, because we don't need it anymore. And this will be subtract 50. And this will be um, restore argument space. Oh, restore the stack, OX 50. And I think I had a good description up here. Free the arguments from the stack and as well as the right file locals. And that's not open file, that's create file. Uh, percent s of locals, cf locals g. We call this create file. Create a file uh, if it does not already exist. On error, jumps to error. Same thing here. This is going to be, oh, this will return the actual error. So this will uh, write to a file based on the handle in RCX to an offset into the file at RDX, and then we'll need the buffer and the length. So save the registers. 
Make room on the stack for the locals. Save that off as the base pointer. Then we'll just say RBP. It's the same thing here, but for clarity, we'll say RBP. So set up the byte offset as requested. Make room for the arguments. Set up the handle. Return, uh, give a pointer to the IO status block, then the buffer and the length. So this will be R8, R9. So I'm actually going to do these last in this case. Um, on the stack. That means I don't have to worry about these getting trampled when I set this up. So this will be uh, pass the... Uh, pass the um, register-based arguments, uh, the first four. And then this will uh, call nt write file. Okay. This is unhappy because it's not open file. It's now create file. Uh, create the file. So we're going to create those two files and okay now we got some problems do I call these local yeah I call them locals with an s locals done all right ah shit okay why did that fail Um, oh, do I have one of those files open? No, those files are deleted. Um, create file, create file. We're not calling the right file yet, so I don't know what I broke. Eight o two. What is that one? Data type misalignment. Ooh, it's these are not aligned because they're inlined with that function. There we go. So we had to align these strings. The strings have to be two byte aligned. Sweet. So now that creates those two files and we should be able to write to one of these files by taking, let's take the, create the file, that saves the file. So here we're gonna load up into RCX. This is gonna be the file, RCX. RDX is the offset into the file. R8 is the, what we wanna write to it and R9 is the length of what we want to write. So we'll write 256 bytes and then we'll call write file. So this has made it a lot easier to now invoke these things. Uh, ooh. Clearly, I fucked up the stack here. Oh, I really fucked up the stack. Write file with local size. What's up, brains man? How's it going? Oh, add instead of stub. You're totally right. Thank you. Thank you. I was like, what the fuck? All right, still broken. Well, we know that this one works. Sub that. Sub room there. 50 and WF local size. Let me, it is due to the right file, isn't it? Okay. Um, okay, what did I break? What did I break? Subtract room on the stack, RBP, set up the byte offset, subtract more space, LEA the arguments, Set up the buffer and the length, 28, 30, 38, 40, 48. 
set up the byte offset, a pointer to the byte offset, pass the register based arguments. Oh, does that byte offset get updated? That's another thing I probably should check. I bet it does. I highly suspect that does. Um, blah, blah, blah. It updates the current file position by adding the number of bytes written when it updates that. If it's using the current file position, oh. What? Updates the current file position by adding the number of bytes written when it completes the right operation. If it is using the current file position maintained by the IO manager. Okay, so if it's not, then it won't. That's my that's my interpretation of that. Alright, so what what did I break here though? RCX is fine. Those syscall, right file. And then we pop off that space. Is there anything dumb I'm doing here? 50. Byte files local size. RSP. How is that not it? How is it not that ad? Oh, it was. Maybe I just didn't save the file when I ran it or something? Make sure that's that's saved. Okay, it, it totally works. So this should write 256 bytes of the stack to the file. So this should be 256 bytes in length. And it is. Perfect. Uh, so by bootloader, are you making part of an OS here? Yes, so I already wrote the OS. The OS is done. Um, right now we're working on making an application that allows us to dump the memory contents of a Windows application such that we can uh, load it up in a hypervisor and continue execution of it so we can uh, observe what it does. So this is basically saving a program to memory, uh, to disk. So that's what we're working on right now. Okay. Now... I want to make room for a memory basic info. Mem inf. Res b this. And now we want to do that. This. We want the jump loop as well. Okay. So that's how we write file. If zero. And if jump loop and I think that's all that we care about. I think that's it. I think. Um two twenty nine right file, yep. Yep, 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 yep. Um, do you need to remove page protection when you're loading it? Uh, when I'm, when I'm loading it, I will have full control of the system. So I don't have to do that. Uh, why don't we use um, so like we're going to load it into a virtual machine where we will create the pages as needed. Uh, why don't we use file open if for create file? Uh, cause I just want to create it uh, and I want it to fail if it already exists. Um, you're, you're saving the entirety of a process state. Yes, exactly. Can debugger save the memory state of a program? It can, but it's in a slightly different format than what I want. And it also doesn't work. Uh, I also don't want to use a debugger because it will change the state of the program under it. So the, the nature of attaching a debugger will change uh, the behavior of the program. And that's what I want to avoid here. Um, wait, is this assembly? This is assembly. 
Uh, so your OS supports a Windows binary? It does not, but it, I mean, it supports anything that runs on x86. Um, does it matter how many of the, how many threads are initiated by the process? Not right now, because we're not worrying about that. Uh, but yes, in theory, we will want to suspend all the other threads, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, but right now, we're only worrying about single-threaded, uh, just to make the problem set a little bit smaller. I don't want to put too much effort into this project, um, because we're eventually just going to run the entirety of Windows in the, in the virtual machine. So this is mainly just to tide us over a little bit so we can see uh, what we can actually do with this hyperva hypervisor-based fuzzer. So, yeah, this is mainly to just kind of tide us over. Um, so it's not really meant to be 100%. Although we probably will add thread support to this. We'll, we'll look into that. Um, okay, so we will start with a base address, starting at 0. We'll make room for these arguments. And let's let's comment this because we're not right now. Uh, that's the process handle. This is the base address. This is the memory information class. Uh, memory information. Memory information length. Return length. Okay. So instead of that, we'll go to 38, and then this will be 28. And this will be 30. Oh, we just barely don't fit in there. Ugh. Yeah, we'll do this then. We'll do this then. Makes me sad. And I think we'll do this. Return length. Okay, there we go. Um... Right, finally, yep, we can't do that. So this is going to invoke NT query virtual memory. We'll do that here. Uh, restore the stack from the call. And technically, we can just have that part of the locals, but this is just so much easier. Make room for the arguments, uh, the syscalls. Arguments on the stack. This is set up the set up the arguments. Um. Okay. Then jump on zero to error. Otherwise, we will. Uh. If there's not an error, we'll update the base, and then we'll load the the memory file, and we'll do this effectively. Um, that's the offset that we want to write to. RSP in this case is the base of the region. So RBP plus locals dot memory info, and we don't call it memory info, we call it meminf. Gotta save those, gotta save those keystrokes, meminf, meminf, uh, plus memory basic information dot. And what do I care about here? I care about the base. Yeah, I care about the base and then the size plus memory basic information dot region size. So we will attempt to write that to the file. If it failed to write, then we will go to loop 
otherwise, uh, wrote, t wrote to file, and we'll just ignore that for now. But that's going to attempt to write the contents of all memory regions. Meminf. Um... What target do you pwn right now? Pretty much anything. Is is there a line limit in assembly? There is not. Meminf on locals. Oh yeah, move, RBP, RSP. This isn't the issue, but this is make room for the locals. RSP, RBP, RBP. Is chocolate milk done or he's still working on it? This is for chocolate milk. So this is all part of the process. Okay. Memory file. And then this is complaining about locals. Undefined. Meminf. Oh, it's not locals anymore. It's SC locals. That would explain that. SC locals, SC locals. So this should write the contents of all the memory to the disk. And we had we hit an illegal instruction, but we should have. Ah, son of a bitch. But why though? But why? Does that, does that mean we never hit this? We'll put an int three here. Let's see what happens. Just realize I have 3,000 of these channel points and here's some funny purple messages. Hell yeah. Um, I mean, how many characters you have can I have per line? Nope, not at all. That's just a personal preference of mine. It's just how I like to format my code, but there's no actual restriction. R15, R8D, meminf, the size of the memory basic information, the return length, and we invoke that, and it's failing with what error? With a page fault, or with an access violation. But, but, but why? Oh, these are RSPs. Those are RSPs. Okay, so we hit the break. So, now this will go through until a failure. There we go. So now, this file should be relatively large because this is all of the memory. All the memory in all the regions that are readable in our own process. So we could actually find ourselves in here, the folk dump. Although it's Unicode, so somewhere in here we would have our Unicode. But this is everything in our process. How cool is that? Pretty fucking neat. Now that's useless because we don't actually know uh, what ranges are actually part of that file. <laughs> So what we need to do now is when we successfully write here, when that write succeeds, and this is attempt to write the memory region, um, attempt to write the memory region um, oh, we need to do something about the zero, but attempt to write the memory region. If the kernel cannot read the memory, uh, this will fail and will go to the next section. But if it succeeds, then we wrote to the file in which point, at which, at which point, we will do this. Here we'll do a uh, jump non-zero to error. And this is write the metadata for this saved region. So now, 
we will attempt to write the raw memory contents. And if that succeeds, then we will write the um, actual memminf structure, the memory info structure, to the memory info file, the info file. So to the info file, we want to write the memminf. Well, LEA will get the address of the memminf. And then we want to write memory basic information size. So I don't think this is going to be appending to the file. It's going to keep writing to the same location. Um, okay. Is this failing? shouldn't be. Let me see if I hit this int 3. I seemingly am not. Which means that this is failing. Uh, I hit this int 3 though. Right? No, I'm not hitting that. What? And it's not because these already exist. What has changed? Well, let's see. Invalid parameter. Oh, that makes... Mm. That means that failed? R15, write file. But we never hit that in three. So what is failing? That would only be, see if we're hitting this. Make sure that we actually can create the files. Okay, files have been created. And then we hit a UD2. And the only place that we can possibly hit that is here. If NT, this query failed. What? Oh, the Gen Z without the test? Yeah, that's, bro that's broken. Definitely broken. Thank you for that. Test racks racks x x if it's non-zero loop. But I don't... I mean, that could be the issue. Let's see if it is. That would mean we never update. Mm. Hmm. Not quite sure, but we'll, we'll see. If it's non-zero, go to error. If it is zero, then it succeeded, in which point we'll come through to here. All right. It's still failing. And we're hitting this. I think we hit that in three. For some reason, the NT query virtual memory is failing. Oh, it didn't that time. Okay. We add that. We then do a write file which 103, I think 103 is fine. Is that pending? I think 103 is pending. Yeah. Um. Write file shouldn't return number of bytes. It returns the status code. Why is that? Why is that pending? I 
Um, okay, let's look at our NT create file. That would basically indicate that we're For some reason, it's a, a non-blocking file. I don't think I need a bit to say it's sync, do I? Um... Is it this? Uh, waits in the system to synchronize IO queuing and completion. It also causes it to maintain the file position. Desired access synchronize, okay. And we have permission to synchronize. What else? Oh, well that, that actually makes it a lot easier because then we don't have to maintain that offset into the file. Um, I was wondering why we weren't getting that. I didn't realize that synchronize was opt in. I thought by default it was sync and then non-blocking was opt in. Um, okay. Subject to premature termination from alerts. Weights in the system are not subject to alerts. Ooh, which one do I want? I think I want non-alert. Let's try it. Let's try it. It's been six hours already? Oof. Yes, it has. We haven't even gotten to what I want to do yet. We're actually pretty close. Okay, synchronous. Non alert. What was that? Value 20. 20. And this is what? Flags? Create options. Hex 20. That's a doozy. Okay. So, non alert, and then that means that the rights no longer actually have to take that offset. Uh, RCX, RDX is going to be the buffer. And then R8 is going to be the length. Okay. Okay. Now, the concept of this byte offset can go away. It's just a zero. I shouldn't have... Oh, well. Um, byte offset goes away. So you pass in the buffer and the length. That's it. Hey, we had a break. We put a lot in here. Let's get rid of a bunch of these. Put an int three, eh, fuck it. Okay, Sigil. And what do we get? Nothing. Hmm. Oh, you know what? I think I do need that field, that byte offset field. 
but it'll get filled in. So the contents, the inbound contents, I don't think matter. In fact, what does this say? Oh, you can pass in a null pointer to byte offset. OK, so um, well, let's see. Oh, we didn't we didn't change the arguments that we passed this function. rdx r8. This can be zero. We'll just test it as zero. And then when we do write file, we change the parameters. We no longer pass this. That explains that. Um, rdx r8. I3. No, this is DWM. Okay, we hit the int three. Stuff was written out, I think, if we get to that point. Uh, oh, we have a lot of int threes. OK. This will actually write the contents out. And we got we were out of 4K. Huh. And that was to what? To the memory file? RDX R8. If it's non zero, go to the loop. That'll run through again. Okay, let's see how many times we hit this int three. Once, twice, just twice. Why only twice? What is, why is that broken? Is there an access synchronize uh, flag must be set? It is set. That being said, it, it is succeeding one, one time through here without using the byte offsets. Because the IO manager does manage that for us. Byte offset. RDX R8. Oh, I probably should have printed the register, so let's run this again. I need to see why that's failing. CE8. Ooh. Invalid user buffer. Two. To this? To query virtual? It's the only thing that it could be. R, G, R, G, R. Um, no, it's something else. This. Yes. Oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> I only changed it in the one spot. All right, fixed. Woof. All right, this should work pretty much universally. Yeah, so this has the this is the memory contents and then this is these are the info. This is the info section uh for um G eight E folk dump info. So these have all of the memory region information fields for the regions that are saved in here. So every time that it succeeds to save every time that we can actually read that memory out, we write out that. Um Okay, so that's is good. So in here, if this 
fails. We will say done. And then done will do a int three. You know what? We'll fucking exit the process. ZW terminate. Anti terminate process. 2C. Uh, move EAX OX 2C. Move. RCX negative one, move RDX, the error code, zero, syscall, and this will uh, exit NT terminate process, get current process, zero. So that's what that's gonna do. So that'll exit cleanly. Uh, we hit an int three. Two C is it not two C? Nope, it's two C. Oh, uh, R ten. All right. So that exits, and if that exits, that means it did everything. So jump non zero to an error. So it attempts to write every region that is mapped into the current address space. If it fails, it just assumes it's because it's not readable and then it skips and goes to the next region. Otherwise, if it succeeds, it makes sure that it also saves the information about that region. And if it fails, this is a hard error. So we wouldn't exit out cleanly like we are now. We then jump to the loop and this is uh, go to the next section. And then at the end, we add the stack local size and then we exit the process cleanly. So this will guarantee that those get flushed out. And yep, so these are all the different regions in the program. And then all the different memory for all the different regions are in here. So this is all, this is the memory contents of the entire application. Beautiful. Yeah, it's got all the DLLs, everything. Everything gets paged in. If there's like a memory map file, the memory map file will be read and that'll be written out. So literally everything in the address space will be written out. So we take, we, we're taking a full memory snapshot of whatever application we're injected into. Um, and we don't use any uh, memory info. Yep, we do that relative, same with that one. So we this code can be moved around to any location. So we can then inject this into an application that would call it, and then we can dump that out. Is there an easy way to view the memory map, like proc ID mmap? Not, in, um, not on Windows. Through an API, it's easy. And with the debugger, you can do it. But there's no, there's no like proc file system on Windows, which I'm happy with. I, I don't like the proc file system. To be honest. All right. So we also want to save the register state. Uh, we don't save that yet. All right. That's looking pretty good. Um, get status. Get. Uh, oh, let's get add. Created a file from a pure syscall. Hell yeah. Get add that shell code make file. Ah. Um saves all memory regions. Get push. Ah, there's no push. There's no git target. Okay, not a big deal. All right. Permission denied. Ooh, now that I have Git, I can't do the whole folder. We'll just fuck it. Makes this easier. <laughs> all right, so that will dump all the inf all of that information. Now we need to get the register state. And also, I want to make sure that I can return up to this. I should be able to. If I don't do the terminate, I should be able to ret 
at this stage. Um, I do want these calling conventions. Hey, we're crashing. Yeah, so we're crashing because I probably clobber some of this register state here. RBP, I need to preserve RBP. Um, what else? I'll just I'll just save everything that needs to be preserved. Fuck it. Um, non volatile RBX, RBP, RDI, RSI, R12, R13, R14, R15. These are all the volatile registers, right? RBX, RBP, RDI, RSI, skip RSP. R12, 13, 14, 15, and then all the X mems. Wish X64 had push AD. Yeah, that would be nice. Uh, save all non volatile uh, X86, 64 MSVC registers. And that way I don't even have to think about it. 15, 14, 13, 12. SI. D I B P B X. So at that point, I know that I've saved and restored everything. So unless my stack gets unaligned, which I think it it has. Oh, I'm pushing. Uh, S push pop G. Okay, so we're fucking something up. Uh, oh, I never deallocate the stack. For these I do. Yeah. This is uh, add. Uh, release the stack locals. Yep, sub. Okay, so that now exits. And if I get rid of this and I just run it naturally, we should see the output from the shell code or from the call C O D. Sweet. So now we're able to return back. So everything is fully contained, uh, which is great. So what I'm going to do is I want to actually save, I want to make a register state structure that will hold all of the register state because uh, that's what we're doing, we're snapshotting. So I want to save the entire register state of the application. Uh, and to do that, I need, um, really this comes down to what I do in chocolate milk. Uh, kernel source VTX. So basically I want to save everything that I have in this structure. So every single thing that I have in here, I want to save. Um, by the way, is assembly portable? What do you mean by portable? Like relocatable? Yes. Portable in terms of can you just run it on whatever system? No, not at all. It's very specific to the system. Um, so that should be seven or 18 registers. It is. Okay. So we need to save all of the 18 GPs. Yeah. And we have to do that right away. So I think we'll do push. Where do I want to put the? I I have to push them. Um, I'll just push them all here then. I'll push all the registers. Fuck it. Fuck it. Push RBX. Push RCX. Push RDX. Push RSP. RBP. Um. Ooh. RSP. I need to do earlier. RBP I want to do first. 
RFP, RBP, RSI, RDI, R8, R9, R10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, push FQ, push the flags. Um... Push RSP and push RSP. What does that do? I think it's prior. Let's see. Uh, pushes the value as it existed before the instruction was executed. Nice. Cool. So that'll save the original RSP all the GPRs, the flags, the original RIP is actually pretty hard to get. Um, we can infer that from the return address, but that depends on how this got invoked. Uh, so I think I will leave that up to the user. Then we'll have FX save. And we want to do an FX save 64. It needs to be 16 byte aligned. So to do that, we're going to um, hmm. we're going to do a move Well, I want to set up my frame now. No. I want to save off the address to this whole big ass stack thing. Right. I'm going to move into R15 RSP, ah, R10 RSP. This will be uh, save the, save the address of the register states. Of the register state into R10. It sounds like you're reading, rewriting mini dump, write dump, pretty much. Basically, the same logic. Hmm. Save the address of the register state. And yeah, now I can align the stack. So do I use R10 anywhere? I do. R11? I do not. R11 is non-volatile. No. R12. Okay, we can use R12. Save the address of the register state there, and that will also be the RSP that will restore at the end. We'll do a and RSP with, uh, so this will be 16 bytes align the stack. Sub RSP 512. Then I can do an FX save 64 to RSP. And then this is allocate room for and save the uh, uh, floating point state. So I'll save FX save 64. Allocate room for and save the floating point state. We're not doing X save right now. X save is kind of hard to port around. All right. So then we make room for the stack locals. We do all this shit. And then uh, we basically just want to do this in reverse order. But I think we'll just put our exit back in at this stage. And that's the end of this process. Process is done. And this should exit. Cool. And it should exit with a 
one, two, three, four is our code. That's going to let us know that it exited in the way that we wanted it to. And it did. So that means it got here. To do that, all of this stuff got saved. So I want to save this information here on the stack. Should be 17 registers. Yeah. So that's 17 registers. That's all registers except for um, RIP. Isn't it better to enumerate and save all other threads and do this thing in a separate one? Uh, what do you mean by this? There, there are no threads in this in this context right now. Um. I don't actually know how I want to inject this in and stop all the other threads. I'll probably just suspend thread them all. That's probably going to be what I do. Although suspend thread is kind of difficult because it doesn't stop them in place. I actually want all the threads register states, which is relatively difficult to get. So I don't, I don't necessarily know how I want to do that yet. So this will be a uh, save off... Uh, Save all GPR register states. Push all those things. Log the state. And then I want to write that information to the file. But yeah, I think once that's done, it's pretty much it's pretty much it. So I think I want to write before uh Yeah. I think I'm just going to write to the info file. So this will uh, write the register state to the info file. And here we're just going to write RSP, or not RSP, that's the, that is the info file. RDX will be R12. And then the size of this, this is the register state, this is... 8 times 17, uh, 17 GPRs, 16 GPRs plus flags. Then write the floating point state, write the floating point state to the info file, and this is at RSP. R13, we don't use that, so we'll do that. Move R13, RSP, and then write this to R13. Okay. So then, up here, this will write R13 for 512 bytes. So that'll have all the floating point states. Write all the GPRs from R12, and R12 should be saved from this, all of those. And then R13 is where we FX save to for 512 bytes. Write file that. Yeah, this works now. And then we exit, which will cause it to get flushed. So now the info file will have the... It'll start with the... 512 bytes, which is the, um, that is the, oh, it has the register state first. Oh, yeah, here's flags, 206. That's clearly our flags. And then all of the fields here, and then we have the XMM state, and then we have all the memory regions. Pretty nifty, eh? Pretty nifty. Okay. My question is, is this the format that I actually want to parse? And it seems pretty solid. Um, this is just a structure definition here. This isn't too bad. We then have the 
Floating point state, that's easy. It's just, just bytes. And then we have the regions, which we can implement with like a, a hash map. Yeah, I think we want to... Hmm. I probably want to store the index into the file where all the regions are found for the mem file. So I can look up a region to its info base. Let's take a look. What do I care about? I care about the permissions. Um, let's take a look. We have... Memory basic information. I don't think I want to save this whole thing. Oops. I only want a small subset of this. I want the base address, the region size, and then... Uh, protect, right? That's it. That's all I care. That's all I care about. I don't care about the type. I care about the protections. Don't care about that. Just the size, the base address. Yeah, I think that's what we're gonna do. And then region size. Oh, I wanna get the iOS B. The iOS B. Um, IO status block. information I think nt write file this iosb information member re receives the number of bytes actually written so when we do a write what I'm going to do is um what I'll do is I want to set an error if that's different than what we requested. So uh, compare quadward RSP plus, uh, I care about the length. That's gonna be in the iOS B plus two. So at RBP of the write file locals iOS B plus eight. Um, Uh, we'll actually subtract from the length. Uh, computes difference between requested. Oh, that R8 is going to get clobbered, that length. Uh, push R8. And then here we can pop R8. Uh, restore requested length compute difference between requested length and actual bytes written and I will write to the iOS B plus zero and this is initialize um, initialize the iOS B here, I'm going to compute the difference between the requested length and the actual bytes written, and then I'll XOR. Uh, hmm. I only want to do this if it were successful. So we're going to do uh, test racks, racks, eeks, eeks. Uh, if it's zero, if it's non-zero, um, failure. Then we'll go to here, failure. And this is, uh, check if we had a failure. If we had a failure. If we did not have a failure, make sure all bytes requested got written. So here we're going to say compare the bytes written with the iOS B result. And if they're not equal, if they're not 100% identical, Jump to failure, or error. So, if it's non-zero, 
then we just return the error code. If it is zero, then it was successful, and we make sure that it was 100% successful. Uh, 128. These are quadrant. So we zero initialize the iOS B. And then if it were successful, ooh, ooh. And is that just due to this? I think it is. It is. So that means that something got partially written. Hmm. So I need to make sure that anything that could get partially written, um, I mean, I want it to get fully written. Did I just try again? Did I just update the pointer and the length, uh, length and try again? Because I I don't want I don't want it to partially write out of region. Obviously, that's a that's a problem. Restore requested length. Um. Just all the arguments. Push RCX. Push RDX. Uh, save all arguments for retries. This is a retry. RCX RDX uh, for partial writes. And this will be partial. So partial write will save RCX, RDX, and R8, which are all we care about. Then here, um, write was successful. Check for a partial write. And here we'll do a sub re uh, restore parameters. Pop RDX, pop RCX. RCX, RDX, R8. So we restore the parameters. Then... Oh, we're popping. We're popping the wrong shit. Oh, it's not... It's probably not failing. It's probably not failing. We just have our frames wrong. Add RSP OX50. Okay. It it's probably it's probably not failing. We 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 were just popping some random shit off the stack, and then of course that didn't match. We didn't have the we didn't have the stacks equal. Will this be a VOD? Yeah, all all my VODs go up on my YouTube. Well, most of them do, unless it's like a stream that just was fully on tangent and we never actually got anything done. Sub RSP local size. Save all of these. Allocate room for the arguments. Then we free the room for the arguments. And then we can pop R8, RDX, RCX. R8, RDX, and RCX. And then... If it's not equal... So this is probably now succeeding. It is. Okay. So... RSP, RSP, RCX, RDX, R8. RD, R8, RDX, RCX. Compare these two. If it's not identical, then we had a problem. And in this case, we had no problems, which means that all the bytes got written out, so these files are 100% correct. This is truly the state of the application. Gotta grab some Zs before I pass out? Hell yeah, dude. Get your Zs. Get your good Zs in. Then I'll put an int3 here. Actually, we'll do an icebp here. Um... And then here, we'll go back to the debugger, and we should hit the ice BP. And we do. Yeah. So we hit the ice BP, and... Or can this really not dis disassemble that? It has no idea what that instruction is. <laughs> it 
<laughs> it doesn't know what that instruction is. Okay, so... That means everything's written out, and... Technically, want to close those files. Now, I want to see uh, threads. How many threads do I have? Just one thread. Okay, perfect. So that means that the entire state of this program has been saved. Um, just woke up. Are we on assembly yet? What do you mean, are we on assembly yet? Oh, are we still on it? If so, I'm going back to bed. We're, we're pretty much just about done with the assembly portion. In fact, we have everything that we need right now, uh, but it's not going to work multi-threaded, and I kind of want to get this working multi-threaded. Um, but I don't know how I want to do this multi-threaded. I mean, this technically would, uh, well, multi-threaded, it wouldn't suspend everything. But for a single-threaded application, this works fine. What can we fuzz that would be single-threaded? So basically, when we want to, and this will take a void. This will work. Yep. Um, so I should be able to inject this code into a process and write it in wherever I want a snapshot. Let's try and use this to snapshot something. It's going to take a little bit of effort to get that to work, but not too much. It should be relatively easy. Um, we just need a single-threaded target. And what the fuck is single-threaded? Basically nothing. I don't know. I could just suspend thread everything in a process. Right, here, I'll say bits. 64. Okay. So let's first try to inject ourselves. So shellcode will no longer be a thing. This will now be built as a binary. So I have shellcode bin, which means we can't link with it, which means we can't just call it trivially as we were doing before this will now fail because that doesn't exist so we now have we now have that shellcode file the shellcode.bin 708 bytes so we just need to allocate 708 bytes somewhere and then jump into it so we can um uh, virtual alloc ex should allow us to virtual alloc ex will allow us to allocate in someone else's process. Yeah. So we'll do a virtual alloc ex get current process. No preferred address. We need enough room. This 4k allocation type. Um, mem commits and mem reserve and permissions uh, page read write execute as execute read write execute read write and this will be a void star so this will remotely map memory into a process that we have opened. Uh, adder is equal to this. Okay, so then we can print a pointer to an, the address. Um, and then 
we'll have this not invoke the debugger just for cleanliness. Okay, so that has allocated memory in the remote process at a given address. And let's just read in our whole file. Uh, void buff is malloc. This is for our shellcode. So we're making a shellcode injector. Uh, if not shellcode, return negative one. Uh, we'll p error that. malloc error. Return negative one. So at that point, we know we've malloced, and we'll fucking calloc. Why not? Doesn't matter. Um, and then we can file fd is equal to fopen shellcode.bin. If we fail to open it, uh, pair fopen error return negative one. Now we can f read uh, s size t bytes read is equal to a read into the buffer for up to 32k from the fd. If bread is less than or equal to zero, pair f read error. Okay, and then we can f close fd. Technically, we can do it here. Let's do it unconditionally here. So I'll close the file and this will say um, print f shell code is percent zu bytes, technically zd bytes here. Bread, so that's the number of bytes that we read. Uh, Fopen, too few arguments. Yeah, this is a uh, read binary. S size T. Um, S size T. That is. It's not link. No, it's not. Um, fuck. I just forget what that is in. Standard def. Really? Maybe it's something else that's fucked up. Let's restylize this a bit. Uh, 22. Oh, it's, it's POSIX? Okay. I don't know what F read returns in this case then. Uh, int pointer. T. <laughs> Problem solved. Um. Buff. Yeah, this is shell code. Okay, shell code is seven hundred eight bytes. That is correct. We're gonna allocate room for bytes red. Um, and then we will uh, write process memory. Oh, and what does that return? I think, uh, oh, it returned null. Surprise. If, oh, I guess, yeah, Windows does that. Um, fprintf standard error virtual alloc ex error percent d where d is get last error return negative one i don't i don't even care about cleaning this shit up um virtual alloc ex error okay and then we'll do a write process memory so like all game hacking effectively it's like, oh, how do I inject memory into a process? I I remember spending fucking days trying to do this when I was a kid. 
And now it's just like, not that big of a deal. He's just writing some shit in. Buffer is shell code. Sizes for bread. Bytes written. Null. Yeah, I care. I think it's a D word. No, it's a size T. Britain is equal to zero. Um, if this fails, if that fails, or be written is not equal to bread. Grab this shit. Write process memory. Can't wait to see how you jump to it. Like how I, um, oh, how I actually uh, jump to this to take the snapshot. Uh, get current process. Adder shellcode bread be written. Okay, so that succeeded. That means I wrote that in there. I mean, in this case, right, I, I should be able to jump to this if I do, um, uh, I guess I'll cast adder, because it's in my current process, because I'm injecting it into myself. But uh, when we inject it into something else, it'll be a little bit more complex. So this will be the address will be cast into something that returns nothing. Uh, I fuck up a friend. This whole thing. I might need to say void here. I don't think I need that void. Um, fuck. It's not this, is it? I don't think so. God damn it. Fucking pointer syntax, man. Um, I definitely not, don't need the prints on adder. See function pointer syntax? Yeah, it fucking blows. This. Yeah. All right. So that. Yep, that hit the ice BP. I think CO1D is the ice BP. No. Oh, is that the first thing in here? Oh yeah 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 yeah. Um, we gotta we gotta put we gotta put the shell code at the top. It's the first thing. We want this to be right at the tippy top. Otherwise, it's gonna start executing fucking whatever it was before, the UD2 directly. This should now work, one, two, three, four. So that means that dumped it. So, when in doubt, fucking function pointers com. Okay, that's pretty dope. <laughs> I normally can get it within two tries. It used to, I used to have to always reference it. Um, okay. So now. Now we have to actually inject this into something. But this works, right? That fucking worked. God damn. So now we need to, we need to find a victim. And... So there, there are kind of two, two, there are kind of two different ways we can do this. Um, let me, let me show you, one, one of the, one of the ways that we can do this, which is pretty fucking cool. Um, we're gonna open a Notepad, and Notepad's gonna be our victim. And 
Uh, four one five six. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so we got Notepad here, and what we want to do? Let's check out where all the threads are. Um, what's a what's a good one? What's a good one? I kind of I kind of want to get one of these deep somewhere. I don't know a good spot. Where they where they would be doing deep shit. I don't know. We can just pick an arbitrary spot. It doesn't really matter. Uh, so we'll put a breakpoint on the return from that get message, and just hovering over that should trigger that. Uh, then we can we'll step like five thousand. Uh, we'll just step to some random point, and we'll keep going. There we go. This looks, this looks good. This is where we're going to snapshot. So to snapshot, um, we have to allocate. I think there's a way to allocate. Um, can we? Um, DV alloc. There we go. DV alloc. So we're going to allocate some shit. In here, DV alloc enough to hold our payload. We'll say 4,096. So that allocated. Oh, that was that was uh <laughs> that was in hex. Doesn't matter. Who who gives a shit? So now we have this, and we can do a write mem. Um, I guess is that is that read mem? Because write mem writes mem to a file. Is there a way to read mem? There has to be reads raw from a file and copies it into the memory. So we're going to read mem from SQL and slash users pleb sausage factory shellcode.bin to here. Users pleb Sausage factory shellcode that bin. Did I typo something? This. Reading for that. Oh, is it? Uh, what do you get it? Oh, the range. Uh, L one thousand. Reading that. Okay, I think. If it's incomplete, it's, oh. Doesn't read it at all. So if I did 10, that's fine. Okay, so do I have to know the size of the file? Kind of sucks. ON704. 705 should fail, 704 should succeed. So we wrote in those bytes, this is our shell code, right? All of our shell code, that's 2,000 a bit much. So now, yep, that looks good. Now what we can do to snapshot this program at this location, we can, uh, let's make sure these files don't exist. We'll delete these. It's actually required. Uh, let's just set rip to this. <laughs> And I think this process is exiting currently. Yep, process is gone. There it is. <laughs> so there's the snapshot at that specific instruction. <laughs> so your shellcode dumps the process? Yeah, that's exactly what it does. So yeah, that's the state. That's all possible, all of the memory and the register state for that thread. And we probably should have like noted what the register state was for that. Um, let's see if there's, if read mem. Okay. Copies 10 bytes. Well, I mean, we used a debugger there, so that was like cheating, right? Um, 
but effectively, here let's uh, let's do it. Let's do it without cheating. You want to see the non-cheat way? We're gonna abuse the fact that ASLR uh, doesn't really do anything on Windows uh, between boots. What about all the open handles? I don't I don't care about those because I can't emulate the sys the system. Have you considered using mini dumps? Mini dumps require having a debugger attached. And they're much more complex of a file format. Okay, let's take a look at somewhere in here. Uh, we'll do the same thing we did before, where we'll put a breakpoint here. Uh, trace 5,000. I just want it to be at some, like, random spot. Ish. Ish. Okay. Yes, this is exactly where I want to take my snapshot. That is a very critical attack surface to me. It's that location right there. Um, okay, so what we'll do is our injector, instead of get current process, this will be handle proc is equal to, this will be the proc, one line, one line, one line, one line, not quite, we'll have the process here, so we're going to inject into a remote process, we have to open a process, Open process. I always forget. I think it's not too bad. It's like PID. Yeah, desired access. Uh, we basically want... We want the ability to... Write virtual memory. And... What is uh, virtual alloc ex? What permissions does this require? VM operation. And then write process memory is, must have these two. Okay, so we only need those two permissions. Inherit handle, don't give a shit. Uh, false in caps. And then the process ID, and this will just be the PID, which we don't know yet. And then we'll say if, I think it returns invalid handle on failure, I would guess. Nope, no. If not proc. Okay, so now this will try to open and inject it into another thing. Super easy. Open process, make. Obviously, that PID doesn't exist. I mean, if it does, sucks to be that PID. Uh, open process error 77. Yeah, okay. So let's open another notepad. And then we'll get the PID for the notepad. 6448. 6448. This is just going to inject. And it does, so that has added that into Notepad. So Notepad, we injected the shellcode into. Obviously, it's not hit it yet. Uh, and I didn't save that address of the a very critical thing that I wanted to debug. So we'll, we'll get a new address. Take a look. Same thing as before. We'll just put a breakpoint on this. Do some stuff. T 523. A little bit more than that. A little bit more than that. I, I want it to be in some meaty meat area. Oh, this looks great. No paint right here. So what we can do is 7 FFE. C three C seven eight AFCF. 
right? 7FFE, 3C, 7, 8, AFCF. All right. And what we're going to do is we're going to inject some instructions. And the instructions are going to be really, really easy. <laughs> um, we're going to inject. Um, and I'm just going to write it here just so I can test it. We're going to inject a push racks, move racks, two, three, four, jump racks. That's what we're going to inject. Okay. And then we want our shell code to be aware of that. And this is like, um, We might need to set the permissions on those pages as well. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to pop racks. So this is uh, get the original RAX. So we get racks back because we pushed it. So. That basically undoes everything that we did. Push, move, and jump. Don't use flags. So we'll push, or uh, we'll pop racks, get the original racks. Um, okay, and then we'll just make this. Any reason to overwrite code instead of suspend thread set thread contacts to set rip remotely. It's very difficult to set rip remotely uh, on a specific location. We want to set rip on a specific instruction. Um, okay, get the original racks. Uh, we can build this locally. Nasm f bin shellcode.asm and this asm b64 shellcode.shellcode. Shellcode. This is literally shellcode. So this is this. Um, so when you say you can, you'll be able to run this dump in a hypervisor, you only mean the part of the code without syscalls. Yes. Okay, so, uh, so that's what we want to inject. And so this is the, uh, uh, inject is equal to, yeah, we'll write this this way. Inject is 50, 48, B8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, FF, EO. And then inject uh, uint pointer T found at inject plus 0, 1, 2, 3 is equal to the address, right? Unit pointer T, uh, create the jump to shell code 
pad, and this is a push racks, move racks, uh, M64, and then jump racks. What is he doing? We're writing something right now that allows us to dump a process in its entire state such that we can move that into a VM to resume execution of it. Uh, mainly for fuzzing and security research, so we can run it in a VM where we can inject stuff into it. Um, oops. We're going to be able to inject stuff into it quickly in the hopes of finding bugs in whatever we're uh, looking at. Okay, then, if not write process memory, be written. And in this case, this shell code, this is going to be the inject. This will be size of inject. Inject. This is not equal to size of inject. And that write process memory is likely going to fail. Oh yeah, let's see, you can't shadow. Thoughts on QBDI? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, did that, did that work? Um, six, four, four, eight, this process. Okay, right process memory. I thought I would have had to set the permissions on that. Uh, print injected. Really? Um, it might behave strangely with that debugger attached, so let's get notepad going. 7384. Oh, we're right into the wrong shit. About to say, uh, 7 FFE 3C7 8 AFCF. It's about to say, that made no sense. I, I do expect that this will fail to write in, because that memory is not marked as writable. Okay, and now, if I hover over the notepad window, it should exit, and those files will get created. So I'm just gonna mouse over it, I'll glance it with the mouse, that'll cause an event to go to it. Here we go. And there it went. So that took a snapshot specifically at the location that we wanted to. And that is the full state of the thread that hit that, um, where we in, uh, added that injection trampoline. <laughs> Hell yeah. So that's exactly what we wanted. So we took a snapshot at that specific location. Now obviously this has threads, and the threads might fuck off and do things we don't want it to do, and it might be, the threads might be changing memory while we're um, while we're taking the dump. So doing this on a threaded thing right now is not necessarily stable, but the logic checks out. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty fucking cool, to be honest. And then, yeah, maybe I will change this to open if, or I want this to overwrite the file. I want it to truncate the file. I want it to just straight up overwrite it. Uh, I, I don't know. I kind of kind of like it not overwriting. All right. So then we can just do that on whatever we want. Is Notepad multi-threaded? Yeah, it is. Pretty much everything with a GUI is multi-threaded. I think that's relatively safe to say. Pretty much anything with a GUI is multi-threaded. On Windows, everything is pretty much. 
pretty much only like a user, like a, a terminal based application would be single threaded. Um, I don't know. Do we enable a kernel debugger and try and go for a, try and smack a, a larger process? Like I'd I'd love to go after a, a like system service like take down a service host something that's typically hard to uh, get into. Um, yeah, what's this SSH SSHG, uh, twenty nine twenty eight. I would need to set the permission so I can open a system process, but I could inject from a kernel debugger. Actually, I don't know if kernel debuggers can create memory in the way that we did. Let me see. From the debugger, can we add memory? We can always code cave something out. Um, what is it? I already forgot what it was. I don't know how I got so lucky in that. I think I was looking at allocate. And it was nearby. I just like saw it. I forget what it is. One of these dot commands. I probably scrolled past it because I'm not reading this fast enough. DV alloc. Thank you. Um, user mode only. So we can't do it from a kernel debugger, which makes sense. That's a pretty complex thing to ask for. Um, will you put this on YouTube? Uh, yeah, I will put this on YouTube. Does this mean any program can write to another program's memory? Isn't it bad security-wise? You would have to have the permissions to do that. So, and that comes down to whatever permissions your application has. Um, and I don't think... Hmm. Huh. Yeah, I don't think there's really going to be a trick that I can use. I know from a from a kernel debugger, I can use uh, read mem. Right. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure I've done that before. Yeah. So kernel mode, you can write memory into it. So we could write the shell code in. Uh, so basically, from a kernel debugger, we could put a breakpoint on what we want a snapshot, and that could be a system service. And then we would have to just have some memory where we can put some shit. So we just need some memory somewhere in the address space that we can jam some shit in, um, which is relatively easy to find. We could just find some like dead space somewhere. Because um, I don't think we can... I don't think we can inject into a system service directly. Yeah, I don't think uh, write process memory system process. So, there's probably not much on this, to be honest. I think, yeah. Um, I don't think you can create remote thread, but write process memory might be just based on permissions. Maybe. Um, let's see. Um, so I should be able to, uh, let's open an admin shell. I just want to see, I don't think I have a password set. I don't. And then who am I? So I'm admin. I want to become system. 
Uh, if I got PS exec. I feel like that's probably one of the easiest ways to get a system prompt, isn't it? Let's grab this quick. Okay, open. Do, 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 do. Nice. Um, oh, I already, already made a bunch of these. Uh, I guess I'm just going to put these directly into Windows. Yes, auth. Okay, so I should have PS exec S I C M C M D. Who am I? Okay, so now I'm system. Um, task list. So let's let's turn this into a, a fucking parameter here. So this will be the PID, and this will be the snapshot address. So you have PID and snapshot address. So um, int argc char argv if argc is not equal to three, return uh, f printf standard error usage uh, test whatever whatever this is. Uh, well, I can tell you what it is, and then this is the PID, and this is the address to snapshots uh, upon exec and then argv0 uh, return technically this crashes if you have yeah technically this crashes if argc is zero so we can say uh, argc RV0 else uh, program.exe. Say if argc, then argv program.exe. Uh, okay, then in this situation, we will do. Mm, mm, uh, stir to ul. I think that takes the radix and I can give it zero. Yes. So this will take RV1 end pointer and then zero, and that will automatically figure it out. And this is the PID. And what does open process take for a PID? It's a D word, I think. So you got a PID, and then we have. Um, sets in the next character after that. Uh, zeros returned on invalid conversion. Yeah, we'll just we'll just do that then. Uh, you int pointer t address whatever we called it snapshot adder. Snapshot adder is equal to stir tool argv2 null zero if pid is zero or snapshot adder is zero uh, printf standard error invalid uh, digit in pid or uh, snapshot address. That's good enough. That's some high quality code right there. Okay. So now, from this context, users 
uh, user pleb. And I am system, right? Okay, uh, from here I can go into sausage factory, test.exe, that'll take a PID and then an address. So I need to know like where I want a snapshot in one of these things. Um, that I could get from a kernel debugger. A kernel debugger would tell me that information. Or I would know the offset. Actually, I can um, task list this. I can get the modules that are loaded in each process. And then from the modules, I can I get the base addresses of those? I think I can. Um, I think I can. Right? Let me actually just see if I can debug one of these system processes. <laughs> Sausage Factory, you always have the best project name. It was suggested by chat. All right, so this is as system. Um, what's, a, what's a good one? What's a good one? Search indexer? Let's try that, because that's not like super critical if we fuck it up, I don't think. CDB process 4392. Oh, uh, program files, Windows kits, 10 debuggers, x64, CDB, 4392, uh, dash P. Uh, how, do, how do we detach? Isn't it? Yeah. Oh, detach. Okay. Okay, so I can attach that. So this is search indexer. What's some good shit here? What does this do? Let's put a breakpoint on uh, NT read file. Let's just see where this reads files. I'm guessing if I just call some activity on the system, some search indexing will probably happen. Maybe if I like, maybe if I do a search here. ASDF. I have no idea what search indexer actually does. So I don't know how to actually cause it to do things. I'm just assuming that like it probably can read from a file <laughs> at some point. So I'm just I'm just looking to hit this breakpoint so I can see like a juicy stack. So open notepad. Oh, oh, searching. Okay, sweet. So we are in T query, some sir stream. This looks great. This is exactly the sort of shit of where user controlled strings might be being used, right? Um, let's look at the handle for RCX. This is a file handle. I can't really get more information than that out of it, but whatever it is, it's about to read some shit from a file that maybe is controlled by a user, right? So like, Theoretically, this is the mindset of fuzzing, of like, oh, there's a, this takes in, this is reading something that's usually controlled, it's a system level service, we randomly do shit on the system, it then picks up random files to do searches and queries and then maybe parses some shit out of these files, right? Who cares? So I would typically find where the read file is, where the user controlled data is, I would then find the juicy address, in which case it's this. Um, I'm gonna detach, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my test to inject into that process, which is at uh, 4392, and then this is the address that I want to take my snapshot at, and then let's make sure my snapshot folder is clear. Um, users, pleb. Okay, so the files don't exist, and these things are empty. So here we inject that. Ooh, 998. Interesting. I think that's a partial write. Um... Nine 
998. I think 998 is a partial write. No access. Maybe I have to set the perms on it. Or maybe I need to give myself SE debug privileges, which is possible. Can you get the file name that it tries to open? I don't think there's a convenient way to do that. It's like a relatively hard problem. I think with like third party tools, I think we can get that. Um. Huh. Yeah, I probably have to give myself SE debug. But it was able to. It was able to inject the memory that I wanted. Can I do this on any process? Let's find another system process. Here, 444. Oh, I can't even open that. 536. Oh yeah, those are protected system services. Can I debug those? I don't think so. Cannot, cannot do that, even as system, which makes sense because those are crit services. Um, all right, so let's see in this search indexer, 4392, and we wanted to inject to where? This, db this, I'm gonna edit these. I'm gonna put a CC there. Okay, so I can I can do that. So that's just a matter of not having SE debug. Yeah, that process will now die. At at some point, it's gonna hit that breakpoint. We'll just ki we'll just kill it. <laughs> But yeah, I guess you can't debug uh, critical system services, which makes sense. Um, I think there's a way to, like sending some flags in the registry in the right spots. Same with Defender, I think you can't debug Defender. Let's try it. Three, seven, five, two, yeah. So those you typically go at from a kernel debugger. But that means I have no good way to inject the memory. I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Um, okay, what's something that we want to snapshot? We should be able to snapshot literally anything on the system. Um, trying to think what would be good here. I mean, maybe I should just do a known good thing. So, like I should write my own program that does something that I want to snapshot. just so we can do a test and just get this shipped over into the VM. I think that's what we'll do. Calc. I don't, I don't think there's anything that gets parsed in calc. Pretty much everything in calc is just syscalls. So we need something that doesn't do syscalls. I'm trying to think what would be good here. Um, OneDrive is bound to do overcomp. I'm sure OneDrive is full of bugs. <clears throat> what does that even run as? It runs as your user. Paint, that's all syscalls too. I don't know, what could I... Trying to think if there's anything that's, I don't know. I, I think the best thing to do is probably to write a contrived application and then just have a test and make sure that we actually can resume execution. 
So I think that's what we're going to do. This is going to be like target. Oh, fuck. I can't do that. All right. We'll, we'll write it over here. Target dot C. And this is basically a, a target program that's just going to do shit on Windows. Yoink paste. I don't know. It's going to like... Um, we'll f read some shit and then we'll parse it incorrectly. That sounds pretty good to me. Uh, what do I want? We'll parse some file and then... Ah, uh, you know what? Maybe I should just pull in like an image parsing library or some shit. Let's see, like... Um... Windows image parsing library. Let's try and find some... Let's try and find some shitty image parsing library. Oh, SourceForge is probably a great place to start. We've got an exif tag parsing library. All right, what language is this written in? Oh, they fixed an, a heap out of bounds. Okay, so they do have bugs. This looks fantastic. Oh, this is lib exif. Isn't this, isn't this like a real thing? Um, files. I want like pre built binaries. Oh, that looks that looks like pre built binaries, maybe. I don't want to have to, I don't want to have to build this code. Is 7-zip single-threaded? Ooh, WinRAR! <laughs> let's, let's get WinRAR! <laughs> let's get WinRAR! <laughs> this is a perfect example, because it's not open source, is it? Right? WinRAR is not open source. Correct? I'm pretty sure WinRAR is not open source. So we can get WinRAR 64-bit. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. Oh, give me all that WinRAR. <laughs> oh my god, I haven't installed this in so long. Oh, everything. Everything. Every give me all the options. I want everything out of WinRAR. <laughs> oh man, I haven't used WinRAR in so long. Oh, just to see those icons is so fucking weird. All right, is WinRAR single threaded? Do you think? Don't forget to pay after your free trial. <laughs> I will. I will. I've. I've. I think I've paid for WinRAR. I've paid for MIRC. I've paid for like a lot of things that I definitely did not pay for as a kid. It has multi-threaded compression. Well, I don't want compression. I mean, I guess I don't really care. Um, well, decompression's good. Let's find. Let's try and find a WinRAR bug. This is sick. I'm guessing the RAR is probably single-threaded. Um, CDB, oh, see that totally does not break on B, even though it says it should, 
Anyway, CDB. Control B should kill, but it doesn't. I think it's dash. Dash P? No, that's for PID. Name in the process to attach to. Um, dash I. Uh, RAR? What? Is it not dash I? Something else. Hold on. Uh, Z is crash dumps. Do, 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 do. What is it? What is it? <laughs> what the fuck? I thought it was dash I. Ah, eh, fuck it. We'll just use windbag, I guess. For for that ease of use. Run C program files. WinRAR. RAR. Alright, thoughts? Any threads here? Break on main. Uh main CRT startup. So that didn't create any threads, which is a good sign. Um, so we actually have to figure out kind of what what WinRAR does. So let's give it, what do you think the best format is for WinRAR? Yeah, we'll just, we'll just RAR up, uh, there we go, that's perfect. Add to RAR. Okay, so we have an archive here, and let's check out the format. Yep, that looks like a, a RAR. So, we're gonna try and figure out what WinRAR does. Let me open WinBag from here. And then, I will run. RAR in the current directory and I'll pass it install sshd.rar and I'm guessing it's dash x is probably extract that's what it always is oh that's exclude no x extracts with full path okay so that should extract it I'm going to put a breakpoint on read file. Technically, I want a breakpoint on open file. Oh, that's... It's already in RAR. So now we have to kind of find where the archive is being parsed. Okay, this looks good. This looks like this could be where it is. Um, we know that the buffer for read file is where? The buffer is, so this is at um, 20, 28, 30. So at RSP plus 30. So this is the buffer. Let's see what it read. It read the RAR header. Dope. That's 100% what it's doing. So this is reading the RAR. Um, noise. Noise.
Winrar's extract functionality is open source, I think. It's how all the Unrar packages work. Yeah, I think that is the case. I think it might handle some files differently. I'm not I'm not 100% sure. So that's just the RAR header. And I'm guessing that's the RAR and then this is the version. And it's just reading, it's just reading a kiss of the header. Um, so this is still gonna do a lot of syscalls. Took me like an hour to find decompression routines as we're first engineering a custom format. Yeah, it sounds like the sounds like the life. When doing bootloaders, that's always a pain in the ass, is finding the um finding the um bootloader uh decompression routines. Sucks when there are no symbols. Really does. So that's where we're gonna return up to. Um, hmm. I feel like this is going to have some syscall problems. How do I cause this to not syscall? I can't. Unless I could find the size of its caching, if it's doing caching. But if it's not doing caching, I can't I can't just change the caching size. So I'd kind of just be fucked there. I don't know. I guess I guess we're just going to snapshot um And we just when we hit this So this first one Yeah, I guess we'll, uh, is it dialic? DValloc. DValloc. We're just going to take a snapshot here. Uh, dump ma sql and slash users pleb test snap dot dump. I'm going to save a mini dump so that I can compare. Compare and contrast with um, what we get in our VM. Because we know this is going to do a non-zero amount of things based on this data. Honestly, we could maybe go one more read file into it. This one's probably going to read a lot more. Let's uh, RSP. This one is reading... Is it, it's, it's, reading it's really reading one byte. Seven bytes, nine bytes, seven bytes, three C. Okay, that's that's some data right there. That's a that's a big read. How big is our input? Nine K. I'm just gonna go until I see something larger. Oh, there we go. That's it right there. Right. How big is that? 8.4k. That's basically the whole input file. Fuck yeah. Dump ma sql and slash users pleb pre read dot dump. So it'll probably do a lot of parsing on this 8k um, prior to actually doing a syscall. So we'll probably be able to actually do some coverage and see what this is doing. See what uh, WinRAR is up to. So we made a mini dump. We got that saved out. This is prior to the read so that we have that buffer information. Then we're going to return up from this function. And now we can see what it read. I can guarantee you that that exists in the file. So let's take a look. Here's the file. And we're looking for uh, C3EED. There it is. So it's clearly this is just like the the payload of the RAR file, right? And it's 8K, so it's a lot of shit it's going to parse in here. So we take a mini dump. Uh, we're going to take a mini dump at the location. And this is like the snap, snap lock. 
So then we're gonna um, DV Alec 1000. I think we already did. I don't give a shit. Uh, then we're going to read mem from sequel slash users pleb uh, sausage fact sausage factory shell code bin and I think it was 700 and oh and 705 should be Sausage under users pleb shellcode.bin. What? What? But why? But why? And I need to make sure. Okay, that is if zeroed out. Um, oh, we don't want that pop either. That would cause issues. Okay, so that has rebuilt it. What's the problem here? Oh, it was the quotes, wasn't it? We had that last time. 705, it's 704, I think. Yes, it's exactly 704. So then, make fall error. That that's fine because it's trying to run the command. It's not a big deal. Um, so this is the register state of the snapshot. We're gonna do our rip is equal to this, and we're gonna make sure that these files don't exist. They don't, and this is gonna this is gonna take the snapshot. Oh, uh, there are threads, but there, um, those other threads are doing nothing, so I don't care. Go. Go. Okay. That'll quit on behalf of the process. Quit. So these are, this is, this is the good stuff right here. This is, this is the good stuff. Um, so this is the old one. We don't want that. Test snap goes away. And then these we're going to save and hold on to for our dear life. We do not want to, we want all of these. We never want to lose these. So this is like test snap. Does that mean rip is lost? No, because I know where, because I know where rip was, because I know where I took the snapshot. <laughs> That's the trick. <laughs> It is in the mini dump, but I also like just know where I took the snapshot as well. Okay. So I have all of that shit, and now I think we're ready to try out our file format. See if we can load it into a VM. <laughs> Thoughts? Uh Right. Uh, let's see. Let's try and get the shit working. Uh, so we're gonna scoop these out. We're gonna do. We're gonna scoop out from the sausage factory. Uh, one two one six eight one twenty two twenty one. I think is where it was. Sausage factory. Test snap to here. Noise. Now we got them saved. We can never lose these. We're good. We're good forever now. And yep, I'm glad that the sizes seem to line up. Because <laughs> if the sizes didn't line up, that'd be a little spoopy. Uh, so the sizes look good. All right. So I guess we load these into our kernel. <laughs> I think that's what we do. We have the info file. The info file is not necessarily in the best shape. It's not necessarily the most optimized design. Um, we also will have to parse some metadata to determine where to look things up. 
to page them in. Um, I mean, we can we can do it. These are solvable problems. I the file formats just kind of suck, but you know what? We're not really gonna get a choice here. Okay. Nice. That's pretty sweet. And we can inject that from a kernel debugger, which is awesome. Okay. So, we're going to go into our kernel dev stuff. And we'll get all this environment set up. PyPixie. OS dev. Send this over to here. This is going to be code. Kernel source chocolate. Uh, kernel source main. Okay. This is going to go into chocolate milk. Cargo run. Here we're going to have text console. This should work. We should be able to reboot. Reset, kernel download complete. And we don't have the server running. So you gotta run that server. Cargo run release. Done. This should now work. And it does. God damn, we're good. Fuck yeah. Core ID, only single core for now. We'll start single core. Do you use Ida on Linux? I do not. I only use it on Windows. Okay. So that resets memory. We will want that. And we're just going to play around with this here. Even though this looks like shit. We're going to get rid of all these stats. Those don't matter. This VM base doesn't matter. Because we're, we're actually making some stuff now. Um, create a new virtual machine, set rip to VM base. Yeah, so we'll just comment that out for now. Save off the original register state. Time to print that. Start time, too dirty. All of these stats tracking things can all go away. This is all just for benchmarking, all the benchmarking shit we were doing, all the bucketing stuff for benchmarking. All benchmarking stuff. Fuzz cases. Okay, so this is probably pretty close. VM base. All right, so this will reset memory. That'll figure out what it needs to be reset to. Um, and what's going to be the best way to do that? I don't necessarily know where the memory is because it's sparse now. Well, effectively, here I'm going to need to have a panic, which is like, uh, panic, don't know what to reset. Okay, print status messages on an interval. We'll move this up to the top. Reset the guest state. Reset the memory state. Then we're going to enter the VM. If it's an exception, we're going to determine if we can handle that. And if we can, then we'll map it in. Otherwise, yeah, that's it. Pretty simple logic here. So, um, I guess we're going to have two mappings. So that's the network map file to execute from. So this is going to be a, uh, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how I want to parse these, how I want to handle the fact that these are sparse. I might need to have like a hash table that tells me 
where the pages are in the file. So, anyways, we'll we'll get we'll just start we'll just start writing the code. Um, so we have an info file and a memory file, and we'll pull those in here. So we'll go into files, and we'll copy from Sausage Factory the test snap folk dump star to here. So now I have those folk dumps. Now I can run the server, and we have folk dump memory. So this is not the mapping. This is the the memory. So this is the raw memory contents of the snapshot, and then we're gonna have the um. This is the uh, state file for the snapshot. And this will be state. And we'll basically just do this twice. So we'll have mapping and then we'll have state. Um, state, state. Anywhere that we have mapping, basically we'll change to state. I did call it state, didn't I? Dot info. All right, we'll call it the info file. And we'll make this info. Info. If it already exists, then clone it. Otherwise, we will map it as read only. Not rec map the info file. Info. Info, info. All right, I think it's probably going to be easier for us to just do this. State. Uh, replace info with memory. This is the memory. And this is memory. This is the info. Okay. And then... Basically, we're going to comment out everything for now. Just want to make sure it builds. This should build. And it should run. Uh, print info file this many bytes and the memory file this many bytes. Info.len, memory.len. And if this works, we'll, we'll end up, you know, soliding our, solidifying our file type and kind of the way that we do all these things. But that is good. That's a 57 meg info fi uh, memory file and a 11K info file. So we're going to parse the info file. Um, and I think I might just parse that info file directly, like right away in the, in the thread that locks it. Uh, what's in there? We have a register state, and then all the regions, which we can parse out. So let's let's do that. Uh, we'll have a struct uh, snapshot info, and then this will have the regs, which is a register state, which we get off VTX. So we'll have a register state, and that's everything that we need for the VM. So this is a register state for the snapshot. And then we'll have the um, memory region info. Um, and this, maybe, maybe I could do a hash map here, where for every page, I would say the offset into the memory file. How expensive would that be to look up? I don't think it'd be too bad. I think we'll do that. This is going to be... Um, we'll pull in alloc collections b tree map. And this is going to be a 
memory B tree map. That's going to have a virtual address and it's going to be an offset into the, uh, there'll be an offset into the memory file. Maybe I want to do a ref on that too, where I can literally ref the memory file. Where this will be a reference to the bytes corresponding to that page. I don't know if that will cause the memory to get pulled in. I don't think it will, because we're just making a ref. That'll just basically bounds check it. Okay. So I have an info file. Um, oh, can I do a ref like that? Because I need to have a lifetime and it's in a static. And I don't think I can really do that. Yeah, we'll just, it'll just be the offset. It'll be a U size. Okay, and then info will be a snapshot info. And then we'll convert the snapshot info into a register state manually. Uh, source, kernel source VTX. So everything that's in register states, we need to restore from our snapshot, but that shouldn't be too difficult. Um, here's the register state and this in reverse order. So I'm just gonna paste this in here for reference and then we'll write a parser for this and let's give it a shot. So we will load the info then here we're gonna network map that file. And then we're gonna parse that file. Um, let mute. And I think I have default on register state. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Reg state is equal to register state default. Uh, create a new register state. And then I will return a snapshot info. Probably regs is probably what I called it. And memory. Hell yeah. Register and memory. And this is a B tree map new. And so that'll establish that. And this is an arc. So we can share it between the threads. And then return ms.clone. Um, okay. All right, so we can't print length for that. No problem. That was just for debugging. This should build. It's not doing it, doing anything, but this will just we can print this register state. Uh, pretty print as hex. So this will have all the register state information. Obviously we haven't parsed anything, so it's empty. Awesome. So now what we can do is we just load these things. That's it, in, re in reverse order of that. So we'll do um, reg state dot uh, we'll just call it regs. Regs dot R flags is equal to um, info. I don't know info to eight. How do how do I want to parse this easily? I'm probably gonna make like a read. So I can read these things out of here. Otherwise, I'm gonna have to do. Ah. Uh, so we can do this. Try into unwrap. And this is a U64 from Le bytes. Of this, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna implement. Oh, yeah, we're going to do this. Let mute pointer is equal to regs 
And then we'll do macro rules consume. This is going to take a, a pointer. And it's going to take a type. And then this will return the type and update the pointer. So we'll do um, uh, let val, which is a type, is equal to type from le bytes of pointer to size of type. And then we can try into unwrap. This returns val, and then we'll do uh, pointer is equal to ref pointer size of type. Something like that. And then here we can do consume. Oh, we don't need that pointer. We can just say pointer because it's in scope. And then we'll consume a U64, and we should be able to do that. Can't index. Oh, that's not regs. This is info. And then try into. We got to pull that in. Uh, use core convert try into. 173 regs. Okay, so that'll just consume a U64, and we'll just go down the line. But this should now print our flag. Should have a valid field, uh, and it doesn't, our flags, val, really, that's saying that our flags is zero, which is definitely not the case, let's take a look at the state file, xxd, i, folk dump, oh, it failed to build, Oh, it totally did. Size of. Yep, thank you guys. I was about to say, that makes no sense. Core mem size of. 167. Yeah, this is what I was expecting. Uh, dot bot. Type. Oh, yep. Hey, it built. <laughs> All right, now this should have our flags will be filled in 250, uh, 246, which is a valid our flags value. So now we go down the list, um, or more up the list. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. So this is 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. You find a UAC bypass? Yeah, I think so. DISIBPDX CXBXAXSP. DISIBPDX CXBXAXSP. It's not really a UAC bypass if it is relying on a third party tool, though, in my opinion. Um. And that's 17, right? R flags, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, DISI, BPDX, CXBX, AX, SP. All right, so this should now have the register state of our snapshot. So let's see how this compares to... So this is what we loaded from our snapshot, and then we'll take, this is at the location of the snapshot. Here's the register state. Racks is zero, RBX is FBC, RCX is 134, RDX 250 in RSI, RSP is C30, RIP we don't set up yet, R8 is C28, R9, 21, 23, 0, 246, 7, 40, it's the same for those, R14 is 0, R flags is 246, 
Uh, E flags. Uh, it's two forty four. It's well, it's actually two forty six, which is cool because we saved the real the real one, not the um, not what the debugger sees. Um, this is actually not an. This is not a valid E flags value. It's required that you have uh, bit number four set or bit number one set, which is the the two bit. Or that it it's two. <laughs> Anyways, now FX save. We don't have any of that stuff loaded yet, but that's the next thing in this snapshot. If I'm not mistaken, if we look at the uh, code that we wrote, it will write that out. And then the next thing in line is, it is the, um, yeah, directly after it is the 512 bytes that is the, whatever we call that state, FX save state. So let's, uh, we'll just pull that in. FX save. And we're going to have to use unsafe here. Regs dot, um, Regs dot fx save is equal to, and I'll pull an fx save here. Um, fx save. We're gonna do fx. Hmm. Pointer. For 5.12, as pointer, as const fx save, core pointer read unaligned of this. And then we'll do pointer is equal to pointer 5.12 dot dot. Okay, so now we'll have the FX save state. Um, wow, are all the XMM zero? How do I do all in this? I forget. Uh, it's like RFF. Or RMF. Wow, they they all are zero. <laughs> I I thought I fucked up. FPCW twenty two seven F. We can just look at a couple of these two seven F on the FCW. And what do we initialize that to? We initialize it to forty. MXCSR is one F eighty. And then the mask. Yeah, it changes that mask, doesn't it? Oh, this doesn't print it. R. Um. I think we can do RM negative one. Um, and this is all the registers that it can print. Anyways, we we're definitely restoring that. And then this is just uninitialized shit on the stack because it's reserved. And so FX save doesn't actually write over it. It's just whatever happened to be on the stack <laughs> at the time, but it doesn't matter because it's part of that reserved area. And that lines up. That means that FX save wrote all this and we, we pulled this shit out. All right, so now what we want to do is we want to figure out memory. So directly after this, we have um, mod these. We just have these, these memory basic informations. And how big is that? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six times eight, 
48. Which is, uh, whatever that is in a hex. We'll just use the decimal, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, so we have um, assert that pointer len mod 48 is zero. Uh, invalid shape for um, uh, info file, right? And that should pass. Fuck, yeah, it does. For chunk in regs.chunks48. NT right file is async. Everything in Windows is async. <laughs> Isn't that fucking cool? It's opt in sync. The NT kernel is actually really good. How do you wait for completion on the event handle that you give it? Second argument, I think. You just give it an object, and then you, uh, you wait for a single object, or wait for multiple objects on that object. Windows, uh, the NT kernel is actually really well designed. I, I love the NT kernel. I think it's, the NT kernel is one of the best kernels out there right now. It's pretty fucking awesome. Base is equal to U64 from LE bytes chunk early NT. Yeah, NT is amazing, man. It's really good. Uh, is that eight? Is that ten? Is that eighteen? Okay, this is base, we have the size. So now we can start printing the regions. What about mock? Mock's a fucking mess. Chunks. Ah, not regs. Why do I keep typing regs? Pointer. Um. Try into unwrap. Really needs to be a shorter syntax for try into. It should be sugar. Yeah, morning meta. All right, these are all the regions that were saved. Hell yeah. So these are all the things that we need to support. So, we're going to have let me an offset is equal to zero. So, this is the offset into the memory dump file. And this will tell us the um, this will tell us the offset into that file where we can find these fields. Now the question is, how am I going to store this information? I could do a, I could do a, I can either do a hash map for every page, which is potentially a lot of metadata, or I can use a vector of ranges, and then as long as they're sorted, I could do a binary search to then find... Um, I'm trying to think. So I want to be able to convert an arbitrary virtual address into the offset into where it's handled. And I, I might just do this for every page. So I'm going to assert size is greater than zero and base and OXFFF is zero and, uh, Size and OXFFF is zero. It's just sanity checks, making sure everything's page aligned because it should be. 
And this will allow me to do this, which will be um, for page in base to base plus size. And we'll just do a uh, checked add size minus one dot dot equals. Should never really fail. I mean, it's untrusted data, but whatever. So this will go through each page and this will print the page address. Um, oh, fuck. <laughs> Whoops. There we go. We're back. All right, so this is printing, ooh. And then here, step by 4096. So this will print every single page, every virtual address that is valid in this program. Every page that is, that is valid in this program. And then what I can do is, I can offset plus equals 4096. And now this will be able to print the offset into the memory file of where I can find that. And then at the end, I can assert that offset is equal to the memory file length. It should be exactly equal. And memory. I pull that in next. So we get that memory file, which has the memory contents. We have the info file, which has the register state and then like information about the process. Okay, all those offsets and let's see if that assertion passes. And I suspect it will, and it looks like it did. So that means all of our logic checks out. So now we know where to find, for a given virtual address, we know where to find that memory. So this is going to be, um, we're gonna say, uh, 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 file contains a dynamic amount of memory basic information structures until the end of file. Okay, so then let mute mem is equal to btree map new. Btree map is maybe not ideal here. There's gonna be a lot of metadata for having these like it would be nice to kind of use these ranges, but let's let's just try it. We'll just do mem dot uh, insert, and I know this code looks like shit, but we're we're trying this. Once it works, we'll we'll figure out if there's something we want different about it, and then we'll start working on polishing it. But for the time being, this is mainly just for, um, mainly just for testing stuff out. Okay, uh, insert page and then the offsets. And now this will have mem. Uh, and this is creates a mapping from the each page in the virtual address space of the dumped process into the offset to the uh, offsets into the offset into the memory backing uh, for the snapshot. And I'll start with the zero. So page to zero and then mem is a vert adder. Might need to, okay, that is U64, perfect. So this should work. None of the assertions should fail. And then we wrap it up in an arc, and then all of them will share this. Now what this means is, wow, uh, we gotta set up RIP. What is RIP supposed to be? We're just gonna hard code RIP. Hard coded RIP alert 
regs.rip is equal to... <laughs> Do you like my alert message? <laughs> Hardcoded RIP. OX 7 FFE 3 E 825187. Remember how I asked about RIP? That's why we took the mini dump. <laughs> we could have all we could have derived it and figured out where it was. So I knew I didn't have to like write it down. But yeah, I mini dump often to to verify things like this. 7 FFE 3 E 82 5187. Holy shit, guys. I like this might actually just work really fucking fast. Which is bizarre. I, I can't I can't believe this shit. I actually can't. Um here's what we're gonna do. If um let uh mem offset is equal to and we're not honoring permissions yet. Everything's gonna get fucking RWX. I don't give a shit. <laughs> Everything's RWX. Uh, we have the permission information there. Mem range bound, unbounded, bound included, address. What is, what is that? What is mem.range doing? Wait, find B tree map entry that is less than or equal to address. Is that only for B tree maps? That would make sense. Uh, we'll go to our documentation. I've never used range. Double ended iterator over a sub range of elements in the map. Can I just use uh can I just use like dot dot equals for that? Yeah, it, it's just the same as dot dot equals address, right? The what you have in your tuple. Okay. Um Panics if start is greater than end. Panic shift range stars equal to end, and they're both excluded. So I, I fuck with that. We'll get this working, and then we'll upgrade it. <laughs> Mem offset is equal to uh, just because I, I know that I can get this right. I don't. I don't want to take a risk right now. Memory dot, um, and this is like a line adder is equal to adder dot zero and not OXFFF vert adder. Memory dot or info memory get ref align adder. This is a uh, Align a page, align the address, and this is uh, gets the offset into the memory buffer where this virtual address is present. If the virtual address is not valid, this will contain, uh, this will return none. All right. So in here we'll say if right and if. Let sum false, uh, if right is false, ah, uh, fuck. If let false sum adder is equal to 
right and mem offset. Uh, this is mem offset. And then here, this is the memory. Mem offset, me offset, mem offset. Okay. Then mapping. This is memory. I guess we'll just say offset. Okay, and then that translates it. Uh, holy shit, really? If it was inbounds and it was not a write, then we alias it. Otherwise, if it was a write and it was in our bounds, then this is memory. Memory. Three forty four mem base compute the offset into the map file. We don't care. Get a physical, get a slice to the physical. Two copies always four thousand ninety six. We translate it. It might already be mapped. I guess offset we ref here. Yeah, I think we ref on that area. Two copy, 347. That's for 4096. It's the whole thing. Copy the bytes into the page to initialize it. 301. Oh, mem offset. Ref that. Holy shit. Um, okay, we got some null issues. Okay, let's see. I want to just see what some of the early page faults are. Page fault, hmm, enter zero, that's unhandled. Read that volatile. Offset that. Okay, why is it? Oh, oh, because we set up the regs, but we never actually copy in the regs. The original regs. This is just, um, gosh, you guys got to remind me this shit. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> Info.regs. So grab the register state that we parsed out of the info file. Yeah, it turns out it turns out if you just leave all the register state as nulls, that happens. Okay, so we should see a bunch of things get pulled in. Don't know what to reset. Yeah, and here we go. We got a bunch of stuff getting pulled in, and then eventually we have, I guess, an unhandled page fault, which is kind of interesting. Not sure why. Ooh. But we are executing things. <laughs> you forgot to copy the thing you forehead. <laughs> hey, Supercuber, how are you doing today? Good to see you back. Um... Um, don't know what to reset, but I think I do now, don't I? I know what to reset. It is I need 
This is memory. Get unchecked at offset. Let offset, that's this logic. This. Offset is equal to this. Uh huh. Uh huh. This is the address. So for the virtual address, we'll get the offset into the thing. And then this will allow us to reset. And we should have the same. Okay, we eventually get GPs. Why do we get different results the second time through? That's a little spoopy. Um, that's really spoopy. This should not be doing anything different. The first run, so this ends due to a 30. And then we should get the same thing again, but we don't. We get new page faults. That ends in a 30. Hidden invalid opcode. Yikes. 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 Okay, well, let's figure out what we fucked up. It, it could be our snapshot, it could be our code, we could be loading it incorrectly, our snapshot could not be coherent. But I'm giving that a pretty strong yikes out of 10. Um, got some page faults. We handle, we handle a lot of these page faults. And then this one. User is true. And then we should reset. Guest regs is equal to this. And this is a print reset. Um, that's the offset into the memory. Yeah, I think that's right. Okay, let's try this. Well, let's... Th this is relatively easy to figure out then because we can just see like these are immutable so those can't change the only thing that would be broken here is I mean register state should be fine it would the only thing that could change would be memory state Unless something's being cached in the VM and the VM doesn't like the fact that we're modifying its memory and it's not seeing that new memory state. General protection fault. I mean, that's after everything's been mapped in. but they should all end in the same way. Now they kind of are, but we get a reset on some of the early ones on a, due to an axis of 30 hex. Let's see what we got. Pause. So here we have a reset and then we get, it should, it should never behave differently after a reset. And the only thing that I could think of is that either the memory's not actually getting reset somehow, the dirty stuff is not tracking all the dirtied memory, which is unlikely. So we didn't have issues with that yesterday.
Or there's some other state we're not resetting. I wonder if this is a syscall. I wonder if we're hitting a syscall and then um, some processor state's kind of in limbo. Previous test program was not really checking the page contents. That's true. That's true. It was checking the number of dirty pages and the pages that were marked as dirty. Um, destination is PSL is pointer. This is get unchecked offset. Um, these things offset memory. Those are all getting translated just fine. Page flatten dot zero. Map that in. There we promote. Whoa. No, that'll copy into there. Um, uh, it's broken on promotions. I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. I'm going to grab some food as well. Um, I, I, I see a bug here.
All right, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not a bug. I don't think it is. Um, if it's already mapped, we're doing cow. Yeah, because it's not writable until this stage. Okay, so. Hmm. How do I want to debug this? This is actually going to be kind of a pain to debug. So I have to figure out how I want to debug it. Um... Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what... I don't know what could be causing this. Um. Oh my god. Unless I'm, like, not restoring the memory or something. But I doubt that. Well, it should crash the same way every time. So I think that's step one, is I need to figure that out. Is there some, like state that's getting fucked up inside of the VM. So I think the first question is, is this a memory bug where memory is not being, where like the memory is not being maintained or reset? Or is this a VM bug where the registers are not being uh, restored? Hey, Quantum. Good to see you back. How you doing? Um... Yeah, how are we gonna get this to work? Add GPs. And I... I just... I don't... I don't really know how. Reset, pause, and yeah, those are, oh, what is this bug? What could it be? It's going to be, it's going to be something stupid. Okay. I fell asleep. You just started writing some assembly to and checking to a program. We finished all that. That's all done. Printing rip during page faults. Yeah, I, I think I agree with that. I like that. I fuck with that. Um, we'll do vm.regs.rip. I think rip might be getting fucked. Um, uh, guest regs. I think it might be getting fucked due to... I don't know. But, like It shouldn't be crashing on that 30. I, I don't think. Let's take a look at what we have here. And I want... I want this mini dump up so I can debug it. I don't need to see that... This will move over here, and then we'll do uh, CDBZ on the snap location. 
Broken files. Oh. Um, SSH 192.168.122.21. CDB Z snap location dot dump. Okay, so this will, now we can kind of compare some apples to apples. So the first page fault that we get is at this location. Oh, yep, we can't copy out of there. And where is this? Oh, we got a page fault right away, which makes sense. Um, because we're trying to execute that instruction. Then we got a page fault at 1A6. And that looks good. Uh, 1A6 is a deer for the stack. So we pull in the stack. And if we filled in that page, I feel like our, our pulling in memory is working. Because clearly, clearly that worked, right? I, I executed to a reasonable amount. If I'm completely mapping things in wrong, we wouldn't have made it to that stage. And then we have another fault on RBX. And this chugs and chugs and chugs until we get to here. I see. That's accessing, that's accessing GS. That's accurate. That's real. That is actually a fault. Because I don't set up the GS base. It's weird that the first page fault after reset is not at PC. It is. Right? They're equal. The faulting axis is at the location of PC. Um. Oh, after the first reset? Well, after the first reset... After the first reset, uh, or the, what, whatever you want to call it, I understand what you're saying. Um, that page fault won't happen again, right? Because that memory is mapped in now permanently into the guest. So, the question is... Why would this ever do anything else? And there are a couple ways that could happen. A, registers are desynced somehow. Somehow the VM registers are different. Maybe do that page fault. Maybe I need to clear something. Maybe I can't just re-enter the VM. Um... I feel like I should be able to. I don't think I have to clear like a pending exception bit or something, but that could be one thing. Another thing could be that the VM has like set some other state that we don't reset, which I think is unlikely. I mean, we, we reset all the registers. We start it at that point. Um, But like, we can print entering. Just just as a crazy sanity check. But we literally set this above, but this will print the RIP of the, after a reset, it should be the RIP of what we want. So we'll do a reset, pause. So we start at 187, we then re-enter 187, we come out 186. Entering. Oh, that must have been an. We got an interrupt, an external interrupt. And then here. And how long did we execute for? Not too long. Basically, no time at all. Um.
Okay. So then we're at 25187, right? Yep. So RIP got set again to the correct location. So I feel like the only thing that would make sense is that we're not restoring this memory correctly. So I'm going to make a database of let mute dirtied is equal to btree map new uh, btree set. And then I'm going to do this. Um, when I dirty, eh, we can do a btree map. Because when I dirty memory, which is only here, I will do, because we're going to up, we're going to upgrade to a page. So I will say, um, dirtied insert the virtual address and not OFFFF. And then what got dirtied was a, uh, the new entry is the page. So that's the physical address. So this will tell me that this is dirty and this is the physical address of the new replacement. So basically, now up here, I'm going to assert, assert that dirtied address is equal to page. So I'm going to make sure that the dirtied memory is identical to the, uh, the page. Sweet. Now that's a good sign. That means that something is just fucked. <laughs> TLDR, something is just fucked. <laughs> so we have dirtied address. We have the page. And let's print the address. This is good. This is good. I, I like this because this, this looks like progress. It feels like progress. Is it actually progress? Probably not. But does it feel like it? Yes. Yes, it does. You cannot infer type parameter for that. Uh, dirtied. There's going to be tree map of a vert adder to the fizz adder. All right, on a scale of one to this being like an actual bug or two being that we just did something stupid, which one do you think it's going to be? <laughs> like a bug would be like, oh shit, that's pretty tricky. And a something stupid is the like, oh, maybe we should do X. Where X is like literally reset the memory or like map correctly. Okay. So this is basically saying that the address because that updates the page. The question is, is my test wrong here, or am I wrong? That's going to fill in the PTE. If it's already mapped, we're promoting a page. Otherwise, we're mapping in the page. Regardless, we're using the page as the backing for that virtual memory. So dirtied is going to tell us, basically, the physical addresses for pages that are mapped. So by having this assertion fail means that the code which is responsible for calling for each dirty page is giving us a different page than what's actually there. And this code was tough. This code was really tough. Um...
So the question is, do we compute the virtual address incorrectly? So let me add a print here when I when I dirty something or when I'm. Um, here's what I'm gonna do: print dirtied x, which maps to page adder dot zero page dot zero, and this is going to be. We're going to say this is alias, alias an address to the page. So now we can see all of the mappings that end up occurring. OK, so we end up aliasing that, aliasing dirty this. And let's see, what caused that dirtying? Let's make sure it's actually a write. And I would suspect it is. It's probably right into the stack. It's right into RBX. So we have dirtied, and RBX is probably still that value. It is. E6CF0. So I think it's safe to say that we're mapping things incorrectly, because it's the code, the values in registers, and the code that's executing lines up like the the odds that we're doing something catastrophically wrong when we're mapping things in is basically zero so i think we're not resetting memory correctly um and let's see what it thinks it is it thinks uh which one's the correct one <laughs> the correct one is this one D75, and let's take a look. That first dirtying, D75, correct. So we end up creating a page and we map it in at this location. And clearly we fucked that up. Clearly we fucked that up. And we return a D8. And let's see if we do D8 D8 is what we actually return before then. E6. Oh, that's a promotion. Okay. So it was D8. And then that same page got upgraded. It was D8, and then that page got promoted. It got upgraded. to D75, right? FBC 98E6CF0, it's on the same page. So basically we're saying that it's the old location and we are restoring how would that have the old one unless this right was getting optimized out, which it's not. It's, it's not. Uh, okay, I'll print this. Print promo. We'll print the old value. This is actually, I think this is gonna be relatively easy to debug. I think we're pretty close. PTE page dot zero. Oh, and we got to read the old one. MM read fizz as a U64. So I'll read the PTE. Yeah, we do have to DRF that. Good. Page dot zero dot zero. Um, oh, that's already a fizz adder. Um, missed the answer about Rust. I did not answer it, uh, but effectively, uh, it is easier to write in in terms of time to development. It's less risk in terms of security. 
It has high level features like iterators. Um, I like the syntax quite a bit in it. Uh, and it has the same performance properties of C and C++ while being secure and safe and easier to write in and faster to write in. So those are the main reasons. So you get a promotion. And here we promote, oh, oh my fucking God. All right, someone in chat, you have to identify the bug. You have to figure out what the bug is. <laughs> it's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> it's a good one. It's not page table flags. <laughs> I can't fucking believe it, man. I can't believe it. It's not an off by one. You don't have to understand systems to know this bug. Zero, zero is close, but that's not the actual issue. But you're in the right ballpark. It's not a copy pasta bug. This is a bug that wouldn't compile in C. If this were C code, it would be impossible to do what we just did. I'll slowly add more hints while I eat. Yeah, think about it. Hey, <laughs> flaming rush. Oh, herders close. Herders getting there. Herder. <laughs> I love that fucking name every time I read it. <laughs> I'm just eating food while you guys figure this one out. <laughs> what if I actually didn't know what the bug was and I was just trying to use chat to figure it out? by feigning this confidence. <laughs> it's like, I have, I have no idea. Just fucking fix it. I'm eating. <laughs> All right. Here's the bug. Here's the logic. If you don't understand the logic of what we're doing here, it is aliasing. Um, so we have a page fault. The guest had a page fault. And we're trying to figure out if this is a page that is mapped in the snapshot. If it's mapped in the snapshot, then we're going to map it in. And we have two logic paths here. The first path is if this were an access of... If this were a read-only access then we actually will figure out the backing of the network, the, the original snapshot, and we'll just map that in. And that means that all of the VMs, as long as all the VMs are accessing the same memory and they're only reads, they'll all use the same physical page. Don't say the bug, give us five minutes. I mean, I, I, I literally could if you want. I can explain the logic behind this function. I can talk through it. So here, if we're reading something, we know that it's not going to get modified, and thus we can actually give the VM direct access to the snapshot copy of that page, which is what we do. We go into here. Uh, first of all, we make sure that the snapshot is paged in because the snapshot could be paged out. So we make sure that the snapshot is paged in we then determine the physical address of the page where that snapshot resides. So this is our, our snapshot that's network-backed memory. We then translate that to get the physical address of that table entry. And then we map that into the virtual machine's space, and it's, it's read-only. And that means that the guest can't modify this, and then it's safe. Thus, it's safe to have a 1,000 VMs sharing the same memory, 
and thus reducing the memory use and reducing the amount of cache duplicates, it's basically just for performance and memory savings, and it's a huge, huge advantage. And then if that's handled, we continue and re-enter the VM. However, if the access is a write, then we need to give this VM an exclusive copy of that page because this VM just made a modification of it and not all the VMs made the same change. So we allocate a new page. We then get access to that page. Since this is a physical address, this is how we get access to physical memory. So PSL references this page's memory. We then copy the original memory values into that physical address. So we just created a new page and we copy in the original contents of memory into that page such that it's identical, but this is now a new unique copy. This is called copy on write, right? That's what we implemented here. Then we translate that page. This basically lets us know if it's already mapped or not, because it's possible um, it's possible that that page was already mapped. And if that page is already mapped, then we want to change the, the mapping. If the page hasn't, and that would happen basically if someone reads a page and then comes back and then writes a page, we'll hit this promotion path where we're promoting a page. It's also, poss um, it's also possible that we end up hitting a write on the first access. So the first access to a page happens to be a write. In that case, we, we create a new mapping for that page uh, going to this page. Uh, reading the page table entry and inserting the same address. That is what is happening. But the question is, why is that happening? Why are we inserting the same page table entry and it, it, it's basically a NOP, right? What it's doing is basically a NOP. It, technically, it's actually setting the right bit, so it's, it's breaking it. But what here would cause us to map the exact same thing <laughs> right back in? <laughs> Herders got it. Herders got it. <laughs> See, if we wrote this in C, we wouldn't have this bug. Maybe we should rewrite this all in C. Clearly, clearly Rust is, is not a good language. <laughs> it's a pretty big oof, though. Yes, it is a pretty big oof. Luckily, it's an easy bug. It's a high confidence bug. I'm pretty sure this is the issue. I'm I love high confidence bugs, ones that you know are truly the problem. Well, here's the issue. We shadow page. So we basically, the page that we want to map in, we actually rebind. And we have a new binding of page. And that means we literally just write in the old mapping. Because that's what we did. We translated it. <laughs> I got it first. <laughs> hey, we were trying to give chat some time to figure it out. Um, all right. So now we can now we can do all this shit and then page. Um, I'm guessing that's old page. Do I even need that old page? I don't think I need the old page at all. I just care that it's mapped, but I don't care what it is. <sighs> Papa nada. We'll still keep that dirtied thing in there just for the assertion. 
but this is now going to always crash with the uh, null deref at 30 hex. Yes, it's doing the same thing every time. We did it, guys. We did it. We fixed trivial bugs. <laughs> All right, here we go. So let me show you what happens effectively. Uh, reset, and then we'll pause really fast. There we go. We paused really fast, I think. So we boot up. We then map in that we start launching a VM. And immediately, we start launching a VM that has nothing mapped in. And then that VM will immediately fault when it's executing the first instruction, and then when it accesses the stack. And we slowly fault in everything that's used by the VM over the network. And then eventually we get to the point where it's resetting, and then we just get the same thing over and over and over again. But it's still running. It's still starting from the start. It's not, it's not stuck in a loop here. It is resetting the VM fully and then coming back around. Uh, and hitting the same fault again. So what that means is we can now actually see the performance if uh, false. We can see kind of what this performance is. I don't know how many instructions this is running. Who fucking knows? Um, we could add some perf counter stuff for that. Um, I think I have stats. So this is in, in a VM in nested vert, which is not fair. So this is running until the first fault, which is accessing the GS30. We need to set up GS base. T TLDR, we need to set up GS base. Uh, actually, not that one. This one. People who watch me code always see how rarely I use fucking constants. And they're like, just make a goddamn constant. I get that all the time when I'm when I'm uh, when people are watching over my shoulder. Okay, now we're gonna check this on hardware, right? Because we want to see the we want to see the big boy perf. We don't care we don't care about the perf in the VM because the VM perf sucks. We know that. So we want to open up a stream term, and we're gonna check out our performance. This is running WinRAR <laughs> in a VM. And then on the first crash, it's resetting, which is probably only literally like a couple hundred instructions in. But it's doing non-zero things. It's doing non-zero things. Um, let's see. Nice. And we're getting two million fuzz cases per second. That's not too bad. <laughs> Isn't it kind of sketch to find uh, trying to fuzz around WinRAR? In this case, we're 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 literally like we don't even have a way of printing when we get a crash. So so if we found a bug, we wouldn't even note it know it right now. So I'm not I'm not too worried about it. Um, okay, so the problem is we're hitting a fault when we try to access. Uh, so we'll go back to this. We're hitting a fault when we try to access GS. This project is called Chocolate Milk, right? Yep, it is. The chocolatest. The cho the chocolatest? Oh, thank you so much, Anonymous Gift Subs! Huge gifts! Five gift subbies! Thank you so much! Whoever's out there watching. Glad you're enjoying it. It'll go right into the server fund. We'll, we'll use this to buy some servers. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Quantum got a sub. Fuck yeah. Perfect.exe. Flexors. Slash life. Crazy shark. Hell yeah. Congratulations to all the peeps with the gifty subbies. And thank you so much, anonymous gifter. That's going to keep the lights on. That's going to keep the cores hot. 
Good content, good viewers. Absolutely. fucking <laughs> All right. So, I, I love this. I love this hard-coded rip alert. Wee woo 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 woo. Hard-coded rip alert. <laughs> all right, all right. So what? What? What was I gonna do? And that number is climbing. It's getting faster over time. I guess that would make sense, wouldn't it? Wait, would that? Oh yeah, yeah. It does make sense because we paused the VM. We we paused the VM. We paused the VM, so it was just off. Um. Okay, so now we have to find GS base, and that's kind of a hard problem. What thread are we on? Oh fuck, I did I did not want to back on that. Uh, what? I don't know, man. I don't know what happened. <laughs> I don't really care. CC <laughs> snap location. <laughs> so we should be able to find the GS base. Um, oh, it's the Teb, right? GS points to the Teb. Yes. That's literally our GS base. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, it's technically this. This is the running thread. Uh, if we look at this. This shows the running thread. That's the GS base. <laughs> okay. So now what we're going to do is we will... I guess we'll set GS base. Yeah. Now that doesn't exist. And you might be wondering, why doesn't that exist? Well, it's because we haven't added it yet. <laughs> so we're going to add that. Uh, register state. And this is the GS base. This is something that you commonly need to set. So GS base. I'm pretty sure GS base is, is that, right? Because if we do uh, DPS on this, it should be self-referential. Okay, it's not. I, I do think it points to the tab. Right? DT tab on this. Um, GS base definitely points to that. So then, I want to set GS base, and I need to figure out uh, G, uh, guest GS base. All right. All right. So we're going to write the guest GS base as self.guestregs.gs base. And then at the end, even though it can't really get written to, uh, self.guestregs.gs base is equal to this VM read. It technically can't change uh, in this context, in this user land thing, but... Who fucking cares? So we're gonna set the base. Oh, this might just work now. Um, because we set it to the correct value. I kind of want to set it to an incorrect value and make sure that it's incorrectly incorrect, or correctly incorrect, more specifically. So we're gonna set the GS base to leet leet leet, and we're gonna see if that's where we're faulting now. We should be faulting at leet 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 six seven. So it should end in a 6-7, because it's 30 plus that base. Uh, we got some assertion failures. 851. Ooh. Good thing we put that assertion in there. Good thing that we put... <laughs> wow. Wow. That's why we do that shit. That's why we put assertions heavily in our code. Because it has zero runtime cost when it's correct. But when it's incorrect, it saves our ass. Hey, leet leet six seven. Perfect. So now we're going to fill in the correct address. And this is now the tab. And we're going to get different 
Okay, we're getting invalid op codes. What is this? I'm guessing a, a syscall. I'm gonna guess this is a syscall. Um, copy, paste, disassemble, syscall! Woo! <laughs> we did it. We did it. I'm slightly confused. What are you fuzzing exactly? Don't you need some kind of input to the program you're fuzzing? Uh, in this case, we're not actually modifying the input yet. We will be, but we're not right now. Um, so you run it and fuzz the file it's accessing just before it does. Yes, exactly. Yep. So basically, we have the state, and that's fucking gorgeous. Oh, we're hitting the syscall. And I don't know how deep that is, but let's uh, we'll figure that out. Um, looks like we're getting here. It's hard to say how much I how much processing this did. Um, console call server generic. Okay, no idea what that's doing. Oh, it's it's printing shit. Ah, it's printing a message. Oh. -ho! Okay. It's writing something to the to the console. So what's the message that it writes to the console at that stage? If I do a rar a rarks uh program files winrar rar x what's our input file? Oh, we want to save our input file too. That's it's really important when you take a snapshot like this to save your input file. Um, so we'll put that into Sausage Factory test snap here, just so we don't lose that or have it get updated or modified in any way, shape, or form. So we do this. Can we have the message, please? It's it's a non-zero level of difficulty to get that. Um. Am I in the wrong directory? Rar X. Rar X D. Hell yeah. <laughs> um. So the question is. What did that parse out of it? Oh my god, that bird's beautiful. Aww. It's got like a bright orange belly. Oh, that bird's going ham. It's like, it's like dancing. It's actually just like, I don't know if it's trying to, if it's trying to get some, get some action going. <laughs> I, I don't know. That's a that's a good looking bird. It's it's just chilling. It's like what the fuck? <laughs> just hanging out. It's just hanging out, dancing, cleaning itself. That's that's a fucking bright ass colored bird for here. All right, um, wow, we got to assist call, guys. All right, how many instructions do you think we executed? We're only running for about a millisecond. That's about the time it takes to print. So here's what we can do. This calls right console dubski. Um, well, we can, maybe we should just add code coverage. You guys want code coverage? Um, uh, how do I want to do coverage on this one? How do you do code coverage in a hypervisor? There are like 10, 20 different mechanisms that you can use for uh, code coverage. Um, I don't know which one I'm going to use in this case. I'm probably going to use random sampling with, uh, Single stepping, um, so I'm I'm trying to think that through right now. 
Um. So, do you have a link to the 10 or 20 methods? Let me find it. Uh. Um, uh, uh, do, 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 do. There you go. Uh, not necessarily 11 seconds. Anyways. <laughs> there you go. There's the link. Uh, Dude, that bird is still chilling there. <laughs> Alright, I need to... Let's see. I, don't, I, I need to get a. I need to get a photo of this cute ass bird. Oh yeah. You know. Just chilling there, man. Get most of the hair. Yo, oh, man. Long time ago. Back in the old days. Back in the old days. <laughs> it's only seven months old? It's not. That's uh that's like four years old. I think, when was that? Uh, yeah, I don't remember when it was, but it was, it was like probably four or five years ago. Okay. Um, so we got that mapped, which is great. Super cool. Oh, we were going to add coverage. Uh, let's just do single stepping for now. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to, um, I'm just going to set the single step flag. Um, and then we're just going to track everything. Uh, just for now, it's a high level. Gets us, gets us something. So we'll set the, um... Set the trap flag. Single step, uh, bit eight. I should, I should have that memorized. Uh, so we'll do VM guest regs, R flags, or equals one shift eight. And this is single step. And put a little smiley face there. And we don't, we don't need that. So uh, this is going to spew a bunch of interrupts. Basically, we're always going to get a single step exception. Uh, I guess we're getting debug exceptions here. Uh, debug exceptions, are those three? Oh, no, those are int ones. Yeah, those are single step. Okay, perfect. So what we should be able to do now is if it is a debug exception, uh, continue. So we should be able to execute in this state. Um, if it's a debug exception, 
If it's a debug exception, then fuck on right out of there. And yeah, we're hitting our invalid opcodes. Now, it's a lot slower. Why is it a lot slower? Because we're single stepping. But what that means is we can actually record RIP on all of these and we have coverage. T to some definition of coverage, we have coverage. <laughs> it's not fast, but we have it and it's free. That is the beauty of hypervisors. We can do shit like that. So we'll do let mute uh, static coverage lock cell B tree set U sixty uh, vert adders uh, lock cell new B tree set new zero uh, B tree set new. And then this has to be a lock interrupts. And this is the uh, coverage database. We did it. We added code coverage. <laughs> 130. All right. We got to pull in B tree set. Free pog? Pog? It's free? Is, is B tree set not const FN? Is that really not const FN? Leave some bugs for the rest of us? I don't, I don't find bugs. I just write tools. Why is that not const FN? Is there a reason for that? That's annoying. Maybe I'll use my AHT. Maybe it's time to pull that in. Mount storage. Uh, uh, TKFS Franzia shared HT source this. What's the code quality on this right now? Looks pretty good. How much on safe we got? Pretty little. Um, <laughs> I'm scared of, one day you're gonna write a fuzzer so good you'll get rid of all the Chrome bugs and I'll never have a chance to find a Chrome bug. Nah, Chrome changes too much too fast. They add bugs about as fast as they remove them. They get harder and harder each time, but they they add them about as fast as they remove them. There's it, there's basically a limitless supply of Chrome bugs. <laughs> no one's no one's no one's got Chrome bug shortages. That's for damn sure. Um, yeah, I think it's time to bring in AHT. Um, and I think I have, I have get, and that gets an entry based on the index. I have a contig table. Entries load. Um, list of all pointers to entries in the hash table. We store it, that index, the entry. It starts out as zero in the contig table. It does. And then we pull it, I think. If it's zero, we return none. Okay, perfect. Fuck yeah. Okay, this is 
I think this is ready to rock. Uh, let's grab this code. Um, yoink. Uh, shared. Cargo new lib ht vim ht source lib paste. This is uh, atomic hash table. Uh, allows threads safe atomic uh, hash table insertions without needing locks. Lockless. Lockless has hash table. Isn't that some nice shit right there? Kernel, cargo, toml. One of my favorite data structures. I use it for effectively everything. It is literally designed. It's literally designed for code coverage. <laughs> um... All right, so we'll make an AHT in here. We'll pull one in. And then this, and I think we con stuff in that because I feel like that would be something I would do. Oh, I guess I don't. Guess I don't. You fucking serious? Oh yeah, because I have to do allocations. All right. So we'll have to do AHT. HT is a lock cell option arc atomic hash table. Uh, and that holds a. We got a key and a value. Okay. Key is a U64. And I guess we don't care about the value right now. That gets by an index. Key hash. That returns a hash entry. Okay, so we gotta do this, unfortunately. HT is equal to this. Same shit that we do here. I really need to do like a knit once. I probably should make that. Um, oh well. AHT is equal to AHT or arc new HT new and entries has to be a power of two. Can hold a million entries. And then AHT dot. Uh, that's not memory lock. This is AHT, atomic hash table. Or, this is not HT, this is coverage. 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 C cov. Coverage. Cov. MS is some coverage. And then we can do this shit. Uh, dot clone. Coverage. All right. So that should that should give us access to the coverage table. Uh, I found duplicate. Oh. Um. No standard. Oh, we don't have a bunch of these things. Uh, use alloc vec vec. Use alloc box box. And I think we have to extra and create alloc. Hey! We don't need a B tree set anymore. Okay, coverage, 134. All right, so now I can do coverage and let, uh, 
let rip is equal to vm dot guest regs dot rip coverage dot and let me see I forget how my API works here uh, fetch or insert I can honestly use a closure um if let error and is equal to fetcher insert. Yeah, I probably could use a closure here. I couldn't use closures in C. And since I couldn't use closures in C, I kind of designed the API with this in mind. But since I can do an FN once in Rust, I probably should switch this to use closures. Um, fetcher insert, the key is going to be rip. The hash is going to be rip as U128. It's a really good hash. Um, and then the entry is just going to be equal to that. Oh, we got to do int.set, I think. That's ah, not set. What is it? Hash table entry. H hash entry. Insert. Box new. Has to be boxed. Um, use alloc box box. All right, so now we have coverage in a cheap way. So when I print this, I can print the coverage. Uh, coverage dot len. So number of entries in the coverage database. So this will give us a ballpark of how much we're actually hitting. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, gross. That should fix that. Yeah, that what, at a mill? Right? HT, not that much. What's going on here? Print made cov db. I haven't, I haven't tried this on no, no standard. I don't think there's anything. Okay, made coverage DB. Which means it's getting stuck on fetch or insert then. Is it just making those boxes? Oh, yeah, because. Yeah. Allocating. Allocating these boxes uses so much memory in my uh, in my setup here. Yeah. Because I think that has to make an allocation. Damn. And that needs to be box because it needs to be a pointer. Yeah. Yeah, it needs a pointer. <laughs> and it's just because I have a page allocator in my OS. So it's just, th these allocations are like, each one is a, a virtual memory map every time we hit coverage. It's time to make a custom allocator. Yeah, it might, I mean, it might be time to add a, a slab. Can you make it a cow? I don't think so. 
Not in this case. Forget allocation for a zero size data type. Hell yeah. All right, we'll, we'll use a B tree set for the time being. Not that big of a deal. It means that it's hitting a lot of stuff though. Moxville, uh, arc. B tree set U64. Sad day. Sad day. We'll, we'll get to use that once we make a fancy allocator. Coverage. This is a... Uh, if... Uh, uh, mute cov is equal to coverage dot lock. If cov is none, cov is some... B tree set new. Okay, uh, two ninety one. We'll just do coverage lock insert rip. Two ninety. Oh, as mutes. All right. Uh, VM dot guest regs dot rip. All right, we did it. One thirty five coverage, and then um, let cov is equal to coverage lock. As ref unwrap len cuff. So this will give how many PCs we have of coverage, how many unique addresses we've seen in our program. Fifteen thirty four. Okay, so it's not getting too far. 1534 is is kind of getting close to when we might see a, our first bug. Um, I'd say typically by 5,000 unique PCs, you normally have a bug. Um... What data do you collect in your coverage database? Right now, I only I only collect uh, whether something was covered or not. So what we need to do is we need to figure out where they're getting stuck. And we can... I might want to ship this up to the server. Um... Here's what I can do. I can actually print if this print woo. Okay, so print new coverage at x, and this is vm.guestregs.rip. So this will print a message when I hit coverage for the first time. And it'll be spewy. But the last few things, this is where we stop, right? This is the last thing we executed was this. Um, yeah, and that's the syscall. It's trying to syscall. Of course, that's failing. So now we can actually kind of go up. We can kind of see what it was trying to do. You can see it was trying to do a console call. And... Basically, I'm going to go to each uh, function level, get standard handle. Um, 
So that's RAR. Oh, this is RAR doing stuff. Okay. This is... RAR is calling... Uh, oops, DPS, this. It's calling get standard handle. So that's trying to get the console handle, and we never get back to execution there, right? Oh, we do. We get back, so we are able to get the handle, and then it goes to call. Uh, in this case, it's going to call. This is going to be like write console. Yeah, write console. Um, so due to the calling convention here, Uh, there's no risk of memory corruption. There's a false statement. I mean, it's, it's, it's not though. <laughs> Um, hmm, what is this doing? Um, so this is going to call more raw stuff, and this is, let's, let's look behind here. RCX RDI. I want to see what message it's printing. What is write console? Uh, it takes in RDX is the buffer. RDX. Came from RDI. Kind of would expect that to be constant. Here we go. This is the string. Bunch of spaces. It's printing, it's printing what it's extracting before it extracts it. You can easily delete a pointer out of a list or even a slice of data out of a list and then access it later. How? Is that just something that Rust devs don't care about and it's not, not something they view as something they're going to fix? Um, what can we do here? Um, hmm. You need a formally verified language to do that? I mean, if you can find a repro case, I'm pretty sure, uh, pretty sure Rust devs would love to have that fixed. 
unless you're just talking something that you theoretically think Russ can't handle and you actually don't know. I don't see Rust being able to ever do that. Well, Rust doesn't allow you to do that. <laughs> All right, what do I want to do? Printing a bunch of spaces. I think I'm gonna just knock out the right console. Now I don't know if I wanna have right console just ret, and I think I do. So at this stage, <clears throat> um, device aisle control file. I don't wanna hook there. That one's kinda risky. This one's probably good. Remove an element from an array at second index. Access this right after. You, you can't do that in Rust, man. Like, you, you, you can't access something you deleted in Rust. Um, all right, so I need a way to write into the memory and the guest. And I can kind of hack this in. When I do the mapping, well, I need to promote it to a write. Yeah, I think I might have copy on write stuff. Hmm. So basically, I think I need to have like read write guest memory functions, like something that allows me to read and write the memory of the guest. And to do that, I need to page things in uh, and set the dirty bits correctly on them. Um... Hmm. I guess I I guess I just have to do it. I I have to I have to put in the labor. I think that's I think that's where we are. I don't know how I I need to give ownership of pages. Yeah, I need to make sure ownership of pages goes into the VM. Um, how do I want to structure that? Do I want to make the snapshot thing just fundamental to the VMs where they always use the same snapshot? Because I need to have the, the VMs need to own the underlying memory. And I could potentially do that. Uh, is that going to be messy, though? I'm just going to hack this in and see how far this executes. We're just we're just going to see what happens here. Uh, um, I think I can. Can I mutably bind right? 
should be able to because it, it should be able to make a copy of it. Nice. So we'll say if if the align address is equal to this is like really hacky and we'll come up with better solutions but I just want to get past this blockade. Uh, if the line address is equal to this then it will will always promote to right um to be honest uh, okay so we will do this and we're guaranteed to hit this in this situation, in which case we can actually patch the memory. It's some shit, man. PSL copy from slice and offset OX this 8F0 to 8F1, ah, just 8F0 is equal to OXC3. We're basically replacing that instruction with the ret. That's all we're doing. We're replacing this with the ret so that we can get past this right console. Did we do it though? Where are we getting stuck now? Set thread execution state. Oh, is it done? Did it? Did it un? Did it unrar it? Was it just printing the message anyways? Does it not matter? Okay. Oops. You this. So I think RAR's going to sleep. I think it's done. I think it parsed our shit. So maybe we don't need this. I think it's literally printing the message saying that it's been parsed. Um, that seems relatively fair. Let's do this. Uh, how does that crash? Colonel, that's not, that's not corruption. There's no memory corruption there. You're just accessing something out of bounds. Doesn't have to be mute. Um, okay, insters, then we'll do insters. Insters plus equals one. Prints. Insters. So this is going to print how many instructions executed during the case. And this will tell us roughly like how much work uh, it did. And I'm guessing it's a, a decent lot. Uh, okay, we clearly don't update that. Oh, yeah, um, we just want to do it here. D colon. 
2,181 instructions? Hmm. Okay. I don't think it's actually processing stuff yet. Yeah, you you literally posted the exact same link. You didn't you didn't send anything. I don't know. <laughs> it's literally the same link. Um You just hit like the share button, I think. If you hit share, it'll generate a link for you. Um, let's see, that's only 2,100 instructions. I, I still don't see what the issue is here. You you remove something, and then you just print an element from the array. Like I don't I don't. I don't see what's wrong with this. It'll just it'll just crash with a panic saying you accessed out of bounds. I guess I, I don't I don't really see what the issue is here. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm surprised it's only 2,100 instructions. I feel like it's not doing more. Why? Maybe it's not actually parsing the file yet, but it's, it's setting that. What was the other call that it was hitting? Let's go back to this. Let's throw this in here. See what it's getting stuck on. Okay, here we go. Yes, that's out of bounds. Oh, that... That one, that one's inbounds. Yeah, that one's fine. It's still not a valid program, but that's inbounds. I'll just print. What if, what if that was, but you're not, you're re-accessing the list. You're not accessing a pointer to an element in the list. This is safe, Chrono. You're not referencing anything here. You're you're literally re-accessing the list. And you're getting the you're getting element number two in the list. Chrono, you're just like here, let's let's talk about it. So other people can understand it. What you're doing is you're literally just accessing the list again. So let's let's write this in a way that it actually works, right? We'll make fn main let remove 
is equal to 5, right? So whatever you want it to be. This prints 2. It prints this element. Let's say we remove 0. Well, it turns out that you remove the first element. Um, and then you'll, let's see, in this case, oh, you're truncating to that size. OK. Well, in this case, we truncate it to 0. And then we can't access that element because it's out of bounds. <laughs> like, Rust absolutely has bugs. There are absolutely things that you can do in Rust in safe code that can cause corruption. Remove a reference to a function stored in a list, then access that function. See, here, here's the problem, Colonel. <clears throat> the things that you're proposing are flaws in Rust are so far away from the things that Rust actually hasn't solved. There are things that Rust does have bugs in, but these are like, on day number one, Rust solved these problems. These are, these are not things that stress the language at all. But it is safe. Everything you've proposed so far will not cause any corruption in the language. Like, I, I just don't know a better way to describe it other than you are very, very far from challenging what Rust can do. The, the things you are proposing are, are things that Rust trivially solved a decade ago. There are definitely things that, that can cause Rust to crash right now, and they exist, and you can go look. Um, More like seven years ago, but yes, yeah. So you can go to issues, and then you can find, um, I think, anything unsound. So these are like things that you can do in Rust that are unsafe, but you can do in safe code. This is about the level of complexity that you need to stress the language to to run into these issues. Stuff like this is, n is not even close to stressing the language's weaknesses. You need to do shit like this, where you have like dangling pointers to things that are phantom datas with lifetime constraints with statics that then get converted into other things through traits using like that with dynamic dispatch. Like this is what you need to basically cause bugs in Rust right now. This is about the complexity of the bugs in the language as is. And they exist. They exist. There, there are weird, unsound things. And some of them haven't been figured out yet. VecDQ has a, has a bug. But once again, relatively complex setup. And these are things that are being tracked, and they're things that are being fixed being able to remove something from an array and then access that array again and getting a panic is not unsafe. And there's no way to make that unsafe. Like, if there's something that you want to propose that you think is an issue with Rust, they will gladly accept it. They will gladly accept it. But I can guarantee you that having a reference to something in an array and then removing something from that array is not possible in Rust. You can't make a reference to an array thing and then remove anything from the array because Rust doesn't let you modify something if there's an active reference to it. 
I realize to a lot of a lot of other languages that's foreign. But Rust doesn't allow that, and that's what makes Rust so amazing. Like, at compile time, it literally won't let you do that. So if we wanted to do that, if we said foop, and we made a reference to the element number one in the list, and then we did list.remove1, and then we printed foop right here so we get a reference to something in the array and we remove it, Rust will say at compile time, you cannot fucking do this because you have a reference to this. This is impossible to represent in Rust. And I think this is what you're trying to say, is that if you have a reference to something in a list and you remove it, that you can't access it. And that's true. Rust doesn't let you access that at compile time. It's not even a runtime panic. It's a compile time. What the fuck are you doing? This is impossible. Th this, is, this is not even a challenge to Rust. I think you I think you should seriously read up on the language before you start trying to like find flaws in the language based on things that are if if you read the first 3 pages of the Rust book and spent 15 minutes and didn't just ignore it because you you hate the language for some reason you would realize that these things are not problems It, it's just it's just frustrating because clearly you want to find a massive flaw in the language, but you're unwilling to put in the effort. So basically, you have this grudge against the language. There's something you don't like about it for some reason. Maybe it's not strict enough. Maybe it's not verified enough. And then you bring up a point that it solves. It it just it. It just seems like a very strong, but unfounded opinion. I guess it's not necessarily a grudge, but a very strong, but unfounded opinion. If you want to talk about theoreticals in Rust, where things can possibly break with ex extraordinary circumstances, I agree with that. But I really don't like when it's when you're basically saying Rust doesn't prove these things, and you're basically calling out my statements as wrong, and your proof that it's wrong is not even close to a bug in Rust. It's not even close to unsafeness. It's not even close to corruption. Rust, com Rust prevents it at compile time, let alone at panic time. At runtime. And if you don't intend any of that, which may be the case, and you didn't intend for it to be taken this way, then you probably should really think about the way you're phrasing things. Because I don't think that I'm, I'm the only person who viewed it the same way. All right, let's see here. Okay, so this is getting stuck on... Oops. You disassembled this, and it's setting the thread execution state. And I'm curious if this is like setting a lower priority before it goes to extract. Which I think is possible. I think it's possible that RAR is like trying to decrease the... I mean, where it's like maybe trying to set it to a lower priority. Oops. Clearly that's not right. Set thread execution state. Perhaps Microsoft guys should rewrite Windows and Rust. That would be fucking amazing. I 
think that Russ is just what C++ wants to be personally? I mean, it, pretty much. So what is this doing? Away mode. I've never seen this used before. That's interesting. Enables an application to form the system that it's in use, thereby preventing the system from entering sleep or turning off the display when it's running. Huh. Never seen that before. Um, okay. So, what do we do with that one? I think we just uh, zap that one out of existence, too. Um, we got to do the same thing. Ugh. These patches are, are really skeezy. <laughs> These are real sketch. These are real fucking sketchy, but I just want to get further in execution and I don't want to write the code. If a line adder is equal to this, Did I zero out the bottom parts? One, two, three, one, two, three. Page align those. Uh, maybe you should write a generic thing to stub out any syscall and just return something in racks. Yeah. I probably gotta be pretty easy. Um Yeah, I think you're right, Sergeant Carnival. You're totally right. And thank you for that. I, I just I just wasn't in the right mindset. Um, you're totally right. Let's do that. Um, so we're going to hit... What are we going to hit? We're going to hit undefined op... What's weird is I've done this like so many fucking times. And for some reason this time, I tried to get a little bit more creative. So what I'll be able to do is... When I hit a syscall, so we'll say if this is an exception due to a invalid opcode, I'm going to print um, syscall x vm guest regs dot rip. I don't necessarily know it's a syscall. It could actually be an invalid opcode, but I'm just going to assume that right now it's an invalid opcode. And we're just going to use that to print RAX, which is the system call number. So we'll see we're getting a syscall 7. And if we look in our handy dandy table, we're going to take a quick look here. Look for syscall 9. Um, there we go. Is that actually? Oh, it's 7. Sorry. Can't see. Don't worry. I can't see shit either. Device IO control file. Okay. So the problem is, is this going to tear things down if I just start rem if I start returning errors? But I know that a syscall is two bytes, right? Um, if we take a look at one of those addresses, one of the last ones we got, we'll reset the VM just so you can see. So here's one of the last addresses. And it's a syscall, it's an OF05. So what we can do is we can say if... Uh, match vm .guest regs racks. If it's a seven, this is nt device io control file. What res is my monitor? It's just a 1080p. And yeah, I think we'll just. 
We'll return an error. Uh, invalid parameter is what we probably should do. NT status codes. Which Windows app is getting tested right now? This is uh, WinRAR. We're not actually really doing anything. COD. And then we can do vm.guestregs.rip plus equals two, continue vm loop. And then we can say everything else, print unhandled syscall this uh, vm.guestregs.racks. More specifically, we can say x, and this is x at this. So now, we will just return an error from IL control file, and hopefully that's not a problem. Now, we'll, now we're hitting a 1A7. OX01A7. And this is a... Oh, this one changes a lot. On the latest version, set thread execution state. Okay, so for this one, Um, as long as it doesn't return anything back. Uh, we can just return null here. Set thread execution state. Right, what was it? NT set thread execution state. We'll just do this. And what does that do? I don't care about the set execution state. I want the NT one. I'm guessing it returns a status code, so I will just give it a give it a status code. All right, now we'll see where this gets us. And I'm hoping that this is where we start going. Oh yeah. Oh, we got coverage. Oh, it's doing stuff. Oh, it's spending a lot of time in there. It's totally decompressing. Oh, yeah, buddy. And there we go. Unhandled syscall 8. NT write file. That's probably right. Um, that's probably writing the output file. That's probably writing the decompressed output. I'm guessing it already opened the file because we took a snapshot after it parsed the header. But yeah, I'm guessing that's what happened. 100%. 100%. So we can actually see now how many instructions it actually executes. Let me inst is zero. And then here we'll say insters plus equals one. And then we'll say... Um, Print insters this, and this should be a big number. This should be the this is the number of instructions that were executed during that fuzz case. And we'll see what we get. But yeah, everything's getting mapped in, everything's getting reset, it fails in the same way every time. You know so much about the internal stuff of Windows, but you know the game hacking communities? Well, I work at Microsoft. Uh yeah. 984,000 instructions getting executed. And when we run it again, let's see, it should be the exact same number because it's deterministic. Yep, it's the exact same number because every single time we run the exact same number of instructions. Because <laughs> it's deterministic. So now we have WinRAR extracting some shit. Working for myself using Linux. Hey, I, I know what I like. <laughs> Alright, so that's fucking awesome. Now the problem is our coverage is slow as shit. <laughs> our coverage is incredibly slow. So what we need to do is we need to randomly have coverage, do coverage things. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to set up 
uh, what we call a VM preemption timer. And the VM preemption timer is what can be used to interrupt the VM on a timer. And I need to figure out where I want to put these windows. There we go. Ah, fuck. This goes there. And then we want to look at uh, system. So we're going to look at the system developer manual. And we're going to find where VMX mentions uh, we care about how we enable the preemption timer. And there's probably a hyphen in that. I just noticed what OS is this? Like, what's what are you looking at as my host OS, or what OS am I developing on, or developing? <laughs> this is just Debian that I'm actually using, that I'm like browsing in, and then this. When you see this here, this is my own operating system. Okay, so for coverage, I'm gonna show you uh, one of my coverage mechanisms that I use, and it's my go-to because it's uh, basically zero risk. Um, and to do this, we have to figure out the controls. And we want activate preemption timer. If this control is one, the VMX preemption timer counts down in VMX non-root operation. A VM exit occurs when the timer counts down to zero. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna set the preemption timer next to our NMI exiting. Um, preemption timer or one shift, I think it was six, it is. So now we'll activate the preemption timer, and then we have to program it with some value. And I think that's pretty much all we have to do, to be honest. We're gonna get like an unknown VM exit. We might get that right now, let's try it. And hopefully this supports preemption timer. Yep, unhandled VM exit code 52. And if we look at VM exit codes, we'll find that 52 is Preemption timer counted down to zero. It expired. Okay, easy. So the preemption timer is a technique that allows you to get control back from the VM in case the VM just goes to an infinite loop or something. So it allows you to guarantee that you can get access back on some regular interval. So what we're gonna do is for VM exit, for a VM exit enum, we're gonna put a preemption timer. And then at VM, VM exit, we'll put 52 is a VM exit preemption timer. Um, and now that means that we can ignore it. Hopefully, this might cause it to do nothing, but let's see what happens. Preemption timer. Uh, continue VM loop. So we're basically saying we handle that. Technically, we're getting to the point where we probably should use a match statement, but... Uh, we're hacking still. Okay, so it looks like this is doing nothing. I think we have to program this timer with a value, otherwise it literally is just staying stuck at zero, which is no problem. We just have to find the preemption timer field, which I think is a natural with field for the guest state. No, 64-bit field for the guest state? Okay, we're okay, we're just guessing now. Natural with control. Preemption, preemption, preemption. Uh I doubt it's 32 bit. Maybe it is. Ah VMX preemption timer value. 482E. All right, so then we're gonna expose these to a user such that a user can set these. So we'll have, um, this is the preemption timer is equal to OX 482E. And this is the uh, preemption, um, preemption timer. And then in the VM state, we will have pub preemption timer uh, option U32. And this is the preemption timer to use. OK, 
Okay. So, um, so then we want to turn that feature on and off when we do the VMCS right. So, we want to make sure that we can use the preemption timer, but then we'll set the pin base controls. here so when we enter the vm we'll say if self dot preemption preemption timer is none i'll try to catch up on chat in a minute here i'm just getting this grind out quick uh if it's none eh, if let some timer is equal to this then we will make sure Uh, I probably want to cache the, this pin based setup here. Yeah. So this will be, this will not be public, but this will be a uh, pin, pin based controls. And this is the uh, current setting for the pin based controls. Okay. And then when we create a VM, Pin base controls is zero. And then at this stage, when we write them, we will then set self.pin base controls is equal to pin based minimum or pin on. So now we kind of cache that information, 853. So now here we can do uh, self.pin, uh, self.pin based control. I can't remember if I said control or controls. Probably control. 856, missing preemption timer. So no preemption timer is established. Um, we won't set that preemption timer. Okay, and we did say controls with an S. I knew it. I mean, I didn't know it. <laughs> We're gonna or equals uh, one shift six. Enable the preemption timer. Ooh, if self up pin based controls and one shift six is equal to zero, then we'll enable it. And then similarly, in this case, if it's not equal to zero, then we'll disable it by flipping that bit. So disable the preemption timer. Okay, so that will dynamically turn the timer on and off. Oh, that just finally made some progress there. And now I can do VM write VMCS preemption, preemption timer, timer. So then we program the timer value. So if we have a timer specified, then we will set that timer and make sure preemption is enabled. Oh, we should always reprogram the timer. Um, otherwise, if it's enabled, then we'll disable it, and then that limits the amount of VM rights we do there. So now this should be back to normal because the preemption timer will not be in use. And now what we can do is instead of always single stepping, which is very slow, uh, we will do a, we will record coverage and we won't have instruction counts anymore, but not a big deal. Okay, so we know that our perfect cover coverage number is uh, three, three, four, four. I'm just making a note of it there. So what we're going to implement is imperfect coverage. So it'll basically take time for us to converge to the true value. But on the preemption timer, we're going to record coverage. We're no longer going to single step. So now coverage should drop to zero because now no one's going to set. Um, OK, we're always hitting this unhandled syscall. I'm just going to get rid of this print because it's just a bit verbose for my tastes. OK. 
So now we have zero coverage, 4,000 fuzz cases a second. That's not bad. Okay, now we want to set the preemption timer to a random-ish value. VM.preemption timer is some... I think, let's just try five. I think it is like the TSC. I probably should read what it actually is. Okay, so it looks like we're going very slow because that's too frequent. So we'll do RDTSC mod RDTSC and OXFFFF. It's just basically a random value. It's not. It's not random at all, but uh, it's a little bit of jitter on there. And then we'll end that with FFF, F. Okay, so now we're getting coverage events, but it's not really hurting our performance, right? The coverage is slowly increasing. So let's take a look. Uh, what was our, if we don't record coverage at all, so we'll turn this off entirely. We wanna know what our performance is, right? That's what we're trying to figure out. We want, we want coverage that doesn't affect performance. So in this case, uh, we're running 4,600 a second maybe climbing to 4,700. We'll keep an eye on this for a second. Let this warm up. I, I think it's safe to say 4,700 FCPS, no coverage, right? So we know roughly the performance with no coverage. So what we wanna do is we want to get coverage information, but we want the cost of it to be low. So, here we have this random timer that we throw in there. And now we're getting coverage, and we pay basically nothing for it, right? But this coverage is not perfect. This coverage misses stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to implement some logic called um, single step. And this is going to be equal to zero. And we're going to say if, if single step is greater than zero, then we're going to single step, and then we'll decrement single step by one. And then when I get new coverage, only if it's new coverage, I'll set single step to 500. Same down here. So every time that I get new coverage, I will enable single stepping. And now, Let's see, uh, I wanna get rid of these prints. Doesn't matter too much. Okay, reset. Um, single step will be zero, we'll go into here. If it's greater than zero, then we'll set the single step flag. Uh, otherwise, we'll clear that flag. I think we're always single stepping right now. Correct, we are. If single stepping is not greater than zero, then we will set it to, um, we will clear that flag. We'll clear single stepping. So now, here we go. <clears throat> We've got almost all the coverage, 3344, four, almost there, almost there, and the perf is about the same. And it's just, it just needs to find that last sliver here, this, three, this last 3344. Four. And we could bump this up maybe a bit, go to 1,000 here. And then we could maybe increase our preemption timer frequency. And give this a shot. And here we go. It's expensive at the start. And here it is, 333. It's very close to the 3344, which is the perfect number. And the performance cost is quite minimal. And eventually it will find that last bit, that last little, little tiny amount. It's just gotta find three more, three more in there. All right. 3345, okay, somehow we got something new. Interesting.
Um, I guess there's something that we couldn't observe with single stepping, but we could observe with this. Um, move SS's potentially. Um, there's probably just like one more state where we can see that. But we pay a pretty small cost for that, and we can also put a minimum to this. We can put a minimum of like OX100 as a base. Let's see, does that mean we'll always miss the start? And I think it does. I think we'll always miss the start of the program, so we don't want that. Okay, so we also don't want this RDTSC, because RDTSC is very expensive. Um, I guess compared to the VM exit, it doesn't matter too much, to be honest. Um, let's see what we got here. Three, two hundred. All right, so let's see how this behaves on real hardware. Exact same code, real hardware, 6,000 plus cases a second. Pretty solid. Initialize single step to something non-zero for the first run. Um, yeah, I could, I could actually, that's actually probably a good idea. Maybe I'll just single step right away off the start. I wonder how much this hurts perf. Oh, a lot. All right. So, um, four fuzz case in zero U64. If fuzz case is zero, 100, else zero. And we'll do like 5,000. Who cares? Um, actually, there's no point to set it higher than these because it'll get reset, so it doesn't matter. But yeah, there is code coverage at relatively low costs with very little... It's not perfect. It's not perfect. We'll miss some things, but it's good enough in most situations. It doesn't matter if you miss a couple coverage events. It just it just doesn't. It's not that big of a deal. You can contrive a situation where it matters, but it typically will not matter. Okay, so on a hardware, and then let's pull all the threads online. Let's pull some threads online, and we'll see how many fuzz cases a second. Oops, it's this one. It's just going to be that times, like, six. But we'll see. Maybe there's some surprising gains here. 34,000 per second. I would say that's pretty good for a quad core. <laughs> and how many instructions was that doing? It was, like, 900,000, like, 950,000. So 950,000, this is a 37 gigahertz processor. So that means it takes about uh, 0.25 milliseconds per fuzz case. Uh, best case scenario, which would be um, what would that be? That would be 3,894 per second. So, yeah, we're, we're running literally at the theoretical rate that this application can run at. We're, we're, we're literally blocking on the processor doing stuff. Like, the processor is literally at 100% CPU. It's not us. We're not getting in the way. We're not causing overhead. We're not causing things to be slowed down. We are literally just running it, resetting it, 
And we have no problem. We have no problem resetting it um, that frequently. I mean, we're resetting it literally 34,000 times a second. No big deal. Real target. Real target doing real stuff. All right. So what we want to do now is we want to mutate some things. And mutating stuff is relatively difficult because we need a way of writing to that guest memory. And I currently don't have a way to do that. Uh, I'm going to hit the head and we'll start polishing some of this stuff. Be right back. Damn, I remember when this is a 20 viewer stream. Isn't that fucking crazy, man? Isn't that fucking crazy? I'd like to say a thanks to all y'all for hanging out, enjoying the programming, sitting back. Bunch of people here, a lot of names I always recognize every time I come in. I've, I find it mind-boggling that I can come in here and there's like a community. It's fucking weird, man. Like, I show up here, and I see the same names, and I see people who have the same suggestions, and, and, like, I feel like I start to get to know people here. Because I feel like, you know, like, Desu's always helping with Rust things. And I'm always seeing, like, the same names doing similar things. I'm just, I'm, like, learning these people. It's fucking weird, man. It's crazy. <laughs> We're just hanging out doing programming shit. I find it I find it absolutely fascinating. I find it so cool that y'all enjoy this shit. So I, I love this stuff. I mean, I hope I do. That's why I do it. <laughs> but it's it's fucking amazing. <laughs> it's crazy. Uh, let's see. But hell yeah. I know nothing about systems engineering, but I love this stream. What, what kind of engineering do you do? Or is this completely new to you? Your content is just awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I do go on rants. I do get angry. I get tilted. <laughs> but I'm a human. <laughs> it's been such a good time. Well, we're going to make it even better because we're going we're gonna to start fuzzing. We're actually going to start injecting things into this VM. Uh, we're going to wrap all of this up in a nice pretty bow, and we're going to provide a method. Or we're going to provide two different methods, read memory and write memory. And basically, we're going to make all of this go kind of behind the scenes and give a nice user interface such that a user can just basically read and write memory through whatever APIs they want, and we'll be able to use this to inject things and modify things. Of course, 
This API is not even close to final. We'll figure out what we actually want to do. The way that we're doing snapshottings today, uh, snapshots today, I think is maybe a little bit too high of a barrier of entry for a lot of people. Um, I think the OS actually isn't that high of a barrier of entry for people to use, given that we have Rust vectors and hash maps and, and stuff that you can use. Uh, so I'm hoping that people can actually use this environment to program things. Um, however, I still want to make some aspects easier than, than they already are. Just love the enthusiasm when you reach gold, or find bugs. Yeah, man. I don't know. I, I get fucking hyped. <laughs> Programming is hype. All right, so let's, uh, let's wrap this shit up in a pretty little bow. So we're going to make a struct. And I think instead of actually putting this inside a VM, we're probably going to make, um, we'll maybe make something that wraps a VM and then provides these abstractions for you. Um, like a snapshot fuzzer or something like that. I love how enthusiastic you are about programming. The tangents and rants are fun too. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm known to rant. <laughs> I, I, like whenever I go into the office, I pretty much just rant all day long, which is pretty fucking funny. <laughs> like I think all of my coworkers can vouch for that. That I, I literally just go in and I just, I just fucking rant. <laughs> I, I like, I will go in at you know, 2 p.m., because that's, like, a, a reasonable time for me to go into work. And then I'll start a conversation with someone, and I'll be talking super loud. So then my, like, next-door office neighbor will come by, and we'll start talking, and then I'm ranting even more. And then we kind of cultivate a mass, and lo and behold, it's 7 o'clock, and I haven't done anything that day. <laughs> and then we go get drinks. <laughs> Is that why you work from home? I, I love it. I, I, have, I have no problem with it. I realize it affects other people, and I, I try. I try. I try to keep it to a minimum. But I also think uh, communication is a really important thing, to be honest. Like, just getting that excitement out and having people enjoy their work and having conversations. Like... To be honest, if I can have a conversation with coworkers for five hours about some technical thing, that's pretty fucking awesome. Even if it's not directly related to work, it's still relevant. <laughs> it might not be actually writing code or actually doing something, uh, but it's likely very closely related, and it likely will get thoughts going, and it'll likely build up a background of, of what we know as coworkers so that it helps build a web of knowledge of like who to contact for what. Because if you have if you have frequent technical conversations with your with your peers, you'll end up in a situation where you kind of know who knows what, who likes what, and you can kind of figure out, oh I have this problem. Oh, I should ask this person because I know that last time that we talked they were working on something very similar or they seemed very excited about this maybe I should loop them in because this is an opportunity maybe they would like so there's a there's a lot of stuff like that that I think is important why is there no rust job out there um there are rust jobs out there they're relatively rare they're typically at like smaller startups right now uh, like, Microsoft is just starting to hire some Rust developers, which is pretty big. We put out a job rec for uh, a lead for one of the tools that we're writing. So that's, like, a pretty high, pretty pretty senior Rust development job. It's, like, managing a Rust project. Um, so it it's definitely becoming a thing, which is pretty fucking cool if you ask me. But yes, I do recognize that rust jobs are relatively rare. They're they're not trivial to get. I should apply. I'm fucking spooked, man. That's my code base. I'm scared whoever runs that. <laughs> Cuz like, I don't know. I put a lot of time and effort into that that uh that code, and I'll be curious to see what someone else does with it. Cuz my coding styles are much different than a lot of people's. Like, a lot of people, I mean, the biggest coding style thing that I have that is unique to me is I don't use third-party libraries or crates. <laughs> Pretty much ever. 
I'm pretty strongly against it. Armar off the project? I got no problem with that. That's fine. <laughs> I got no problem with that. I'm okay with deleting the project. The scary part is when they change it for the worse. <laughs> it will go through cargo format and cargo clippy. No! I hate cargo format. I hate formatters, to be honest. Cargo format is actually pretty, pretty safe. Even Core is a third party library. Why do you think we tried to write it? <laughs> um, recently, do you work in Hyper-V related features at Microsoft uh, as well directly or indirectly? I do not. Um, I do know uh, some people over there though. Uh, they've been doing a lot of stuff based off it in security space. Yeah, so um, I guess we have people on the team doing stuff on Hyper-V, um, on like adding some of the new like isolation stuff, uh, which is all pretty crazy, to be honest. I, I don't even understand all the stuff that we offer now because we have so many different mitigations and uh, like sandboxing, enclave, different ways of isolating and securing systems. Uh, it's actually pretty awesome. <laughs> D colon. What's the D colon in reference to? Is that me not using libraries or is that me not liking cargo format or formatters? I can't remember what thing I, I said that might be offensive. <laughs> um, okay, so we want to make a, a structure which will hold a VM and then also a snapshot name, I think. And we'll basically move everything that we have here. Almost all of this is going to fly up into here. Such that we'll be able to kind of manage this in a, a better way. Aren't en enclaves related to SDX? Yes, they are. Uh, AMD has similar technologies. I forget what they call their like encrypted memory stuff. Um, but kind of every architecture is starting to have something like SDX. So, yeah. But yeah, they are, they are related to SGX. There's a lot of investment into SGX right now. I think that's kind of the, a lot of people view that as the solution to a lot of the problems that we have in security and isolation. I think that's dangerous. Um, but hey, I don't know. SGX is relatively good. I think SGX raises the bar a, a pretty significant amount. Still has a lot of flaws but it raises the bar a significant amount, which I think is awesome. So this is going to be a like VM fuzzer, snapshot fuzzer, uh, maybe like snapshotted application, maybe. Maybe just start writing it, we rename it later when we figure out what the fuck we want it to be. Uh, we're gonna make new. This is gonna take the name of the snapshot. Um. Creates a new snap, new snapshotted application based on the snapshot name. Uh, this snapshot currently must be in the, what do we call it? What do we call this? Tool sausage factory format? <laughs> God, what a fucking great name. <laughs> the sausage fa factory uh, file format. Um, the name should be the base name of the files such that name dot info and memory and name dot memory are valid file names on the file server. What's up, Nick? How's it going? I knew a guy obsessed with sausages. I went to sleep in your stream. <laughs> Nikito, that's that's on you, man. It's on you. Maybe you should have slept more. <laughs> maybe maybe you should have slept more. <laughs> and I don't know why I'm doing that. Uh, Impulse snap shotted app. Sometimes it's hard to program and read chat at the same time. <laughs> Mustard is what mutations do. 
So this is the um, parsed snapshot information file. And we're just we're just gonna tear all this shit down. So this is handling the paging stuff. Uh this Yep. Oh my god. Oh, this is where all the code breaks for for the next like 30 minutes. We will not have usable code. Always scary shit. All right. We're going to implement um fn translate. This is going to be used to translate guest virtual memory. We're going to comment out all of this stuff. Um, can I just do like some bullshit config so it doesn't get built? Cannot break outside a loop. Yeah, it's not happy about this. I just want this to not compile, but I, I want to see the syntax highlighting. Nice. Okay, perfect. And then we're going to do, we're going to move this all into kernel source snapshotted app. I guess that's what we're calling it for now. This is a um, fuzzable snapshotted application uh, backed by a, an Intel VTX VM. Okay, so now we're gonna have a really fancy API. So we'll do snap, snapshotted app new. Let me, uh, we'll call that snap. And then we'll pull that in, so we'll do pubmod snapshotted app. Use snapshotted app, snapshotted app. Pretty straightforward shit there. Make this pub, make new pub. Uh, all this stuff will slowly get public over time. And we'll pull in vert adder. Let's just get this building quick. Uh, use alloc collections, B tree map. And what is that on? Oh, yeah, we do need that. And then register state, use crate VTX register state. And then we'll pull in, I think we need page table. Uh, Alec will put above, this is the order I, I've been using. Page table, um, vert adder. Nice, and then this takes an argument and we'll just give it the fault dump. Which is the name of that file. Okay. All right, we're building. Ginger Train with the Twitch Prime! Hell yeah! Good fucking name. Gingers represent. Even though I'm balding. <laughs> My beard's ginger. <laughs> oh. Choo choo still counts. Hell yeah. All right, what we got here? We got a snapshot application. We're gonna new that. And get rid of this shit. Beautiful. Now, what we wanna do is we wanna start setting this stuff up. So we want to, um, I think what I wanna do is, maybe I'll have like dot fork or something on this. I need to figure out how I want, this is gonna return a self, but how are multiple cores gonna like share the same snapshotted app? I think snapshotted app will maybe be, maybe I'll have a reference. Maybe this will create a snapshotted app and then you'll, um, 
like make an instance or check in to work for it. I'm trying to figure out how I want that to work. I don't know if I want to pass in like a shared state uh, where all VMs or all cores pass in the same shared state such that they can synchronize using those databases. Um, or if I want this to actually have the shared state. Um, I think snapshotted app will be the shared thing. And then I'll probably have like a dot instance. And then that will create a new VM for you. I think that's how I'm going to do this design. Let's try it. Subnet with the gifted, gifted subs. Holy shit. Bunch of names in there too. A lot of those names I've seen talking in here. Hell yeah. So fucking sweet. Thank you so much. God damn. Fucking crazy. We're at, we're at 73 subscribers. And we just write fucking code, man. We just write code. We're just developers. I'm just doing work. Y'all are watching me literally just do work. Hell yeah, thank you so much. Thank y'all so much. Um, this is actually work stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm positioning myself to, to be able to qualify this as work. Because <laughs> if I don't say, <laughs> I'm just doing work. It's the best part. Never ever have I enjoyed some <laughs> watching someone do work as much as this. Oh my god, thank you so much, Mello. Both good commentating, reading chat. Yeah, I sometimes fall behind on chat, but I, I, I try. I try. It's hard to, it's hard to like. I feel like I struggle to read chat while I'm on the grind. This is the new office. <laughs> I mean, hey. I, I actually don't think my boss would care as long as I'm productive and as long as I'm not like sharing secrets or bugs that aren't public yet, I'm pretty sure he wouldn't give a shit. <laughs> it's like, there's no way he would care. It's like if he just sees me coding, he's like, yeah, it makes it easier for me because I don't have to check in. <laughs> I feel like it's hard to read chat while programming because you don't want to break your focus if you're on a roll. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely get on a roll, but let's see. We're, we're probably about to hop up on a roll here in a second. So this is going to be a shared state for a snapshot of an application which is being fuzzed. And then what we'll basically do is we'll actually fork off the snapshot app. I'm... There's a chance that we fuck up this API and we have to redo it, but that's fine. Not a big deal. Um, so we will have the snapshot info. And this will be found... Um, let's see. When I do a reset... Yeah, this is going to be an arc for sure. So we're gonna have an arc of snapshot info, and this is um, a parsed information about the about about ha, about the snapshot. This is the dot info file produced by the sausage factory. This contains information like uh, such as the register states of the target application, as well as what memory, uh, which virtual addresses map to uh, offsets in the memory, in the, in, the, in the memory, in the backing memory. There we go. And then memory, this is an arc of a net mapping. And this is the, uh, raw memory contents which back the original snapshots. These, um, this is a packed format and thus the snapshot info can be used to, can be used 
to take the sparse virtual addresses and convert can convert them into the uh, memory offsets. Clean. So then we are going to network map the memory. Okay. Network map the memory file contents as read only. Pretty straightforward. And then here we'll just, we gotta dynamically format this. It's not that big of a deal to make this allocation here because this, this is not part of the fast reset loop. This is just the initial processing. So this will be the name. And then here, I, yep, I pass in fault dump. That'll construct that name. Now we're gonna parse the information from the info. Same thing here, ref format, and I probably should have an IP field that I pass in instead of a hard-coded IP. That sounds probably like a good idea. So we'll say the IP, a server, and then server is the IP and port, and we'll have, we'll pass that in here. 180.168.101.1, 1911. Okay. We have server, and now some of these things will fit on better lines. Ooh, fill the net map um, memory file for snapshotted app. And then this is fill the net map info file for snapshot app. And, you know, we don't need to arc these yet. And now that fits on one line. Okay, nice. Clean. I like how you explain and say out loud what you're doing rather than face roll on the keyboard. Yeah, I mean, I I don't know. I This feels very natural to me, and I'm not quite sure why, but it does. And I, I love that. I don't know if it's like just kind of how my internal monologue is and I'm just speaking out loud or... Or what? I don't talk to myself when I'm when I'm programming alone. So I don't I don't really know. But it works. It works great. It seems it seems pretty natural to just hop on here, hang out, write some code. Uh, we got FX save. We got to pull in size that we got to pull in. Um. Yep. Just mainly size of right now. So we'll pull in size of, and then what else we need? FX save that we can get from here, and the register states, net mapping. Um, that is use create net net mapping, net mapping. Okay. Expected lifetime parameter for net mapping. Really? Really? Use alloc sync arc rubber duck programming. Oh yeah, for sure. The amount of things that y'all catch and save my ass for. Oh, that's so good. Okay, why does net mapping have a lifetime? I kind of forgot. Uh, kernel source net net mapping. Net mapping, and this has a reference to the raw contents of the mapping. Okay, that's fair. Backseat programming, <laughs> sentient rubber duck. Let me just A on that. I think we should be fine on these lifetimes because it's in an arc. All right, we need try into. Use core convert try into uh, and that's it now we just have to return a snapshot at app which is just these things arced up snapshot info and memory oh the bird's back god that bird's so fucking cute uh, snapshotted app we will have the um, let's split this so I can see we have the regs no, that's snapshot. Snapshot info. 
and that should be equal to the... I think we got to make it. Yeah, we haven't made it yet. So this will be a snap arc new snapshot info. Then we have a memory, which is a... I think that's just the memory. I'm fine with this in this case due to the shape of that. Oh, we got to arc it. Arc new memory. I don't know how stream ended yesterday. It was quite late. Uh, did we boot to Windows? No, we're not We're not planning to boot to Windows. That's not something we're... Well, we will. At, soon. B but not, like, soon, soon. Like, within a month, but probably not, like, within weeks. Um... So this has regs. And then memory... What do I call mem? I call, uh, I'll call it mem. And I'll probably make that less confusing, but this should build, and it does. No surprise there. So let's make sure our comments are good. Create a new register state. Um, get access uh, to the register, uh, to the uh, snapshot info. And this is going to be um, consume a type from the uh, snapshot info and update the pointer. Really simple there. This is uh, parse. This is parse out the register fields from the snapshot info. Hard coded rip alert. Okay. This is going to be. Um, Parse the FX save out of the uh, info. And is this format better here? Not quite. This is going to be vert to offset. Uh, construct the virtual to offset. And this is vert to offset. Uh, construct the virtual to memory offset. Table. We go through, uh, parse out the uh, section base and size. Here we'll say make sure the size is non zero and the and the base and the size are both four kilobyte aligned. This is going to be. Um, Create the, this is the vert to offset. Create the virtual to offset mappings. And this is make sure all of the memory has been accounted for in the snapshot. Okay, then this is vert to offset. And since these are both the same names, we can just do this, and this should build. Oh, fuck yeah. And this is uh, return out the snapshotted application. All right. Now, can I derive clone on this? And I think the answer is yes. And I think that'll clone the arc. So I don't think that's actually going to make a deep clone. Pretty sure. Because it's just going to call clone on those fields. So now... Dude, fuck yeah. This is going to be clean. So we're going to do... A static snapshot. This will be a... Um, lock cell snapshotted app and option. And yeah, we really should make an init once. We are doing this a lock, a, lo a lock, um, is equal to lock cell new none. So this is the, this is basically our program, right? So this is the code that a user of this magnificent API would write. So we'll get uh, let snapshot is equal to this. S 
snapshot dot Yeah, I'm pretty sure we can clone that. So do snapshot dot lock. Let snap is equal to this. This is literally the init once that, that we really should make as a construct. Um, do I just put that in the lock cell stuff? I think I do. I probably should do that. Um, okay. So we will uh, we'll lock that snapshot and then we'll say if snap is none, then mute, then uh, snap is equal to snapshotted, it's this line right here. So I'll basically create it once. So only one of the cores will actually create this and I'll make that. Um, otherwise, and then this will just be snap, snap dot clone is what will return out, uh, as ref unwrap dot clone. So now this will, that'll create one snapshot. Uh, we got to pull in lock interrupts. Use core locals. Lock interrupts. And we don't have lock cell either in here. Okay. Use lock cell, lock cell. No problem. All right. Uh, 94. This needs to be an option, which is easy. So that'll basically create one reference, and then all the cores will get copies of that. So this is uh, creates the master snapshot. Uh, and fork from it for all cores. Okay, so now all cores have immutable access to this snapshot. And through this, I think we'll have them create VMs, because so far we haven't actually made a VM. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we'll make a new user virtual machine. And this will be... So that's the snapshotted app, and then we'll have a pub struct snapshotted fuzzer, or this will be like worker, something something like this. We'll we'll figure this out. Um, so then this will have a that just parses that. Here we can do a pub fn. Um, I don't know, like uh, worker for now. I, I don't know how I want to say this yet, but it's it's gonna be something like this, and then we'll return a worker structure. So let me grab that worker structure. It's kind of it's kind of weird designing all this stuff because you have to think about having multiple workers at a given time. This is gonna have an a ref, and I think this is just gonna reference. Oh, this will just reference the snapshot of the app. We can literally.